Behind the Light of Gola Duin, A Cornish Romance, Book One. Written by Deborah M. Hathaway. Narrated by Vicky Jo Eva. Chapter One Cornwall, 1815. Perched at the edge of two lather cliffs, Gola Duin Lighthouse towered high upon the earth. Wind from the Cornish Sea blasted against the structure, but nothing hindered the tower's light as the evening sun disappeared behind the dark clouds on the horizon. Waves crashed against the jagged rocks at the base of the cliffs, spraying water high into the air. To the south of the lighthouse, the smooth sand of Goladuin Beach thinned in the incoming tide. The ocean swirled, a warning to take shelter from the approaching storm. But Abigail Moore heeded no such warning. Standing between the lighthouse and the cliff's edge, she braced herself against the wind. Her dark red tresses flew out behind her, her hairpins long since removed. She watched the storm with a fixed gaze, blue eyes steady, until a flash of lightning lit the clouds before her. Only then did she turn toward home. With her threadbare shawl tightly around her shoulders, Abigail ran her free hand in a caress along the light brown stone of the lighthouse. Its steady light still shone above her, the one constant in her life now, and she was grateful for it. She rounded the circular building and reached the small house attached to the front, stepping across the threshold as the first raindrops began to fall. Uncle Ellis! She called down the short corridor, securing the door behind her. In here. Abigail hung her shawl on the hook near the door, careful not to snag one of the many holes in the worn brown fabric. She'd needed a new shawl for months now, but their waning funds had simply forbidden it. Brushing aside the thought and subsequent lowering of her spirits, she progressed down the corridor and entered the sitting room with a smile. Uncle Ellis sat on his worn settee, his eyes remaining on the pages of his book. The storm promises to be fierce tonight, she said. Her boots thumped softly against the floor as she moved to the back of the room and opened the window. We have certainly seen worse, though. And will in future, no doubt. Indeed, Uncle Ellis mumbled, his chin doubled as his head dipped toward the book in his lap. Abigail knew better than to wait for more of a response. Her uncle wasn't much of a conversationalist. Not any more, at any rate. They'd once enjoyed hour-long conversations. Now she was fortunate if she managed to coax a mere sentence from his lips. She returned her attention to the view of the darkening ocean, drawing in a deep breath of the cool, salty wind. There was no purpose dwelling on thoughts of the past. Ruminating would not put more food on the table. The hens seem content in their house, she continued. And I've moved the tools indoors. Mm-hmm. Drops of rain speckled the floor's distressed wood near Abigail's feet, but she didn't close the window. The scent of the sea and storm did much for the stale air in the room. The musty scent being caused by the faded rugs, dusty furniture and piles of old books. The rooms had been on her list to clean for what seemed an eternity, but the lamps of Goladuin always made top priority. I also secured the stable doors, she said, only too aware that she conversed with herself. With any luck, they will remain upright through the storm this time. Silence followed. Was he aware of all that she did for them? He had once been, but now. She turned toward him, surprised when his eyes lifted from his book and focused on her. Had he heard her then? What is it? she asked, his gaze fixed on her unpinned hair. A hint of a smile curved his mouth to one side. When I see you in such a state, I am reminded of when you first came to Goladuin. Windblown hair, rosy cheeks, still as reluctant to come inside. Abigail attempted to run her fingers through her wavy locks, but the wind-formed knots prevented her. I would still be out there if the lightning had not started. I assure you. Uncle Ellis's smile grew. 
Abigail had had tangled hair since the very moment she'd first seen Goloduin, when the sea, the cliff sides and the lighthouse were new to her nine-year-old eyes. She had explored the land freely, watching the churned ocean as it stormed, and swam in the depths of the sea in the sunshine. She missed those carefree days, before her work had taken over. But she shouldn't murmur. She was more than content to look after the ships at sea, even if she had little time for anything else. Another flash of lightning lit the clouds. Rumbling thunder followed, prodding her toward her task, as if she needed the reminder. Would you like a cup of tea, before I see to the lamps, uncle? He shook his head, a deep crease stretched down between his greying eyebrows. I wish you would allow me to help you. You know it isn't safe for you, uncle. He stared down at his book, though his eyes did not move across the pages. Months had passed since he'd injured his knees in a fall, and still he could not climb the tower without acute pain. Abigail had assumed nearly all headkeeper responsibilities since then, and uncle, well, his spirits had fallen as swiftly as her duties had risen. She loved Gulladuin and would do anything to keep it aglow. But was it too much to ask for Uncle to realise there were other ways he could help? A word of gratitude? A conversation? A short embrace? She clamped her mouth shut. Speaking of such things wouldn't do any good. They never did. Assuming their conversation was over, she took a step back from the window. But Uncle's next words stopped her. There is a public assembly in St. Just next week. I thought I might attend. A memory sparked in her mind of a time more than five years ago, when she'd first come of age. She'd imagined dancing the night away, before ending it with a fictional proposal from a handsome man who'd fallen in love with her at first glance. Her life had quickly put an end to such silly dreams. She never attended a dance, and she certainly wouldn't be able to now. But Uncle could. That might be just the thing you need to raise your spirits, Uncle, she said. He peered harder at the book in his lap. I would offer to look after the light and suggest you go in my stead. But I believe we both know the answer to that already. Yes, we do. He drummed his fingers along his cane that rested in its usual spot on the settee beside him. You might enjoy yourself, though. Abigail narrowed her eyes. He had never encouraged her to attend before, not even prior to his injury. What was he about? All the same, I would rather not attend, she responded. Her answer was mostly true. She felt far more comfortable in the safety of Goloduin than in the midst of a room filled with strangers. She did not belong with them, like her uncle did. He may be penniless, but he was a gentleman. And Abigail? Abigail was merely a lighthouse keeper's niece. A colder wind blew through the room, splashing rain upon the front of her skirts. It was time. She closed the window and crossed the wooden floor toward Uncle Ellis. I hope you will attend, Uncle. One of us may as well. She placed a kiss atop his greying hair. We may talk more about it on the morrow, if you wish. Good night. He grunted a half-hearted response. Abigail ignored his crestfallen appearance and left the room. She had sympathy for his plight, of course. To feel helpless was a miserable sensation, but she did not have time to commiserate. The waning light beckoned, and if she neglected it, lives would be at risk. She moved through the corridor to where a thin passageway connected the small home to the tower. An iron spiralled staircase stood at the back of a large circular room lined with old cots and a pile of wood. She paused at the bottom of the steps, 117 of them stretching ominously above her. There was a time she had enjoyed the ascent. She would carry a tray of food while her uncle brought up a stack of books. When they reached the top of the tower, she would read aloud to him for hours as they kept watch over the stormy seas until the sun shone again. Now she had no one's company but her own. 
With a weary sigh, she raised her skirts and began her climb. But each step was a battle, as she attempted to convince herself that she was prepared for another lonely night, keeping the lamps of Goladuin Lighthouse burning brightly. Chapter 2 Hold steady, men! Courage! Captain Gavin Kendricks called out as he walked across the main deck of the HMS Valor. We have seen storms of smoke and fire, of enemy cannons and death. We will see through this wind and rain. Shouts of affirmation sounded from the sailors as they worked together to secure the halyards. Gavin's eyes travelled the length of the masts to the yards. The white sails were pulled taut, curved and stretched in the fierce wind. They would not hold for long. He and his men would need to wait out the storm by mooring the ship. His crew was impatient to reach land after months of being at sea, but he would rather keep them safe than risk their lives by pushing through an impassable storm. Gavin tapped a finger on his leg. His fifteen years at sea had taught him to be disciplined, patient, and yet he was even more anxious than the others to reach the port in Penzance. Perhaps those fifteen years had finally caught up to him, causing him to feel restless on this voyage. Or perhaps he knew it was time. Time for a change, for something more fulfilling than a life at sea. Whether retirement from the Navy awaited him, or if he was to simply be reassigned, Gavin would consult with his brother first. Lionel always had an opinion about such matters. Gavin brushed aside his musings, drawing his mind back to the task at hand. He climbed the steps to the quarterdeck, where a helmsman gripped the wheel. St Ives lies behind us, Captain, Mr Clamp said. Excellent. Gavin looked out over the ship. Lightning flashed in the clouds above, his men mere shadows as they moved across the main deck. They were making steady progress. Perhaps they would not have to lower the anchors after all. We are nearing the end of our journey, Mr. Clamp. I should like to see it finish with... His words muffled as a wave crashed against the side of the valor. Water washed over the starboard side, pouring across the upper decks and sweeping sailors from their feet. Gavin reached for a nearby railing, striving to remain upright as the water reached midway up his stockings. Cabin, the quartermaster shouted next to Mr. Clamp. We cannot run before the wind any longer, sir. She veers too greatly. We will be blown straight toward land. Gavin crossed the wooden deck to the port side, straining to see farther into the darkness. His eyes drew to a small glowing light in the distance, and he stiffened. Golladuin Lighthouse. His worries should have been quelled at the sight. After all, the light was meant to ensure that sailors kept away from the dangerous shores but the valor was being pushed closer and closer to those cliffs jutting into the water. The cliffs he knew had taken the lives of many sailors. Still, he would not allow his men to meet with early graves at the very end of their journey. He turned his back on the light and moved to the helm. Stand by to take in the mainsail. The midshipman relayed his message across the main deck, their voices muffled as the valor tossed violently back and forth. Seamen worked to furl the sails, but their advancement toward land continued. Captain, she will not lie too, Mr. Clamp cried out. Gavin's jaw tightened. He shot a glance over his shoulder, the flashing light of Goladuin growing stronger. They could not risk drawing any closer to the coastline, not if they wanted any chance at survival. He stepped down onto the main deck. All hands, bring ship to anchor. A few sailors ran to the starboard side, unfastening the anchor to dangle over the water from the cathead, the thick structure sticking out from the ship to aid in their anchoring. The bosun, Mr. Perry, oversaw the thick cables being brought up from the oarlock below, and the seamen wound the long rope in loops across the deck before securing the anchor to one end. Once fastened, they released the anchor. It sailed through the air then plunged into the murky sea below. The cable fed through a hole near the side of the ship until it tugged securely on the beam, yet still the ship drifted with the waves. 
Gavin's heart thumped uncomfortably against his chest. His eyes flickered to the lighthouse. Was his mind playing tricks on him, or did they approach land faster than before? Lower the second anchor, he shouted. The port side anchor dropped into the water. Gavin moved to the ladder near the quarterdeck, grasping onto a step, his feet planted firmly on the ground. Brace! Brace! As the rope lessened across the deck, the anchor sinking deeper and deeper into the sea, Gavin watched with bated breath until they jerked forward and the anchor caught. The ship moved to one side. The waves battered the bulwark. Even her out, Gavin called. The midshipmen rushed to the edges of the ship, making way for more than a dozen brawny forecastlemen, tearing their way across the valor toward the capstan. Gavin watched as they wrapped their arms around the bars, using the weight of their large bodies to slowly turn the structure, shortening the first cable to position the ship between its two anchors. At last, the valor settled on the water, and cheers erupted from the men. Gavin's mouth parted, a slow breath releasing from his lips. The tension in his shoulders lessened, and he climbed the steps to the quarterdeck. Then another shout rose above the others. Fire! Fire on the gun deck! A flash of lightning lit the valor, and Gavin swung around. Black plumes of smoke rose from the starboard side, a ghostly shape against the rain. He cursed, jumping down and landing on the main deck with a thud. He flew toward the ladder to the lower decks, his mind spinning and anger pulsing through his veins. There could be only one reason a fire had started. One of the men must have had a lantern out during the storm. Whoever it was, that sailor would be sorry once Gavin caught him. Footsteps pounded across the gun deck as dark smoke filled the area, sliding along the ceiling. An assembly line had already formed, men seeing to the flames with buckets of water and wet blankets. Lieutenant Harris! Gavin shouted, spotting his first lieutenant running toward him. How fares the foremost? It weakens, sir, the man said, his face red from the heat of the flames. The fire is already spread below. It will reach the powder magazine if it is not extinguished soon. Gavin released a frustrated growl, heading for the ladder. Find a fool who has put us all at risk, he growled over his shoulder. I'll throw him overboard myself. Lieutenant Harris followed behind him. Sir, I believe we already know the culprit. They reached the main deck, and Gavin whirled around to face the lieutenant as his eyes adjusted to the darkness around them. A fire sparked in his chest. He took a step toward the lieutenant, his voice low. Where is Sanders? He's still shackled below, sir, but he was calm, as if he wasn't aware of what awaited him on land. Every sailor knows what to expect if he assaults his captain. Gavin ran his fingers over the knuckles of his right hand, the fist he'd used more than a week before to lay Sanders flat on the floor before the drunken man could learn the punch of his own. Has his brother been kept away from him? Lieutenant Harris hesitated. We've tried, Captain. Mr. Perry was ensuring the lanterns were extinguished below when he saw Miles near the Orlop. The boy may have spoken to his brother without notice during the chaos. Then he was able to start the fire on the gun deck without notice as well. No doubt under his brother's direction. Gavin wiped the rain from his face. Miles Sanders had dutifully followed Mr. Sanders aboard the Valor their entire voyage. Gavin was sure the boy would do anything for his elder brother. That was what was most worrying. I should have removed them from the ship the moment I saw them. Ensure Miles remains at his post until we reach Penzance. He mustn't be allowed near. A low creaking interrupted his words, the ropes of the anchor cables squeaking as they stretched. Gavin lowered his brow. Such a sound should not be coming from a ship that was moored. He glanced back to Harris, the officer's eyes widening with alarm before a loud crack pierced the air. The ship lurched forward at once, swaying to one side. Harris fell against the bulwark as Gavin stumbled a few paces back. The anchor! Gavin shouted, 
Harris, secure the foremast before it is compromised, and find bearing to flood the magazine. Yes, sir. Before the lieutenant disappeared down the ladder, another snap cracked the air. The second anchor. How did both cables break so quickly? The ship jittered forward again, and Gavin held out his arms to steady himself. The glow from the lighthouse flashed in the corner of his eye. Ready the final anchor, he commanded. Captain. Gavin crossed the main deck to where his second lieutenant crouched down by the cable. What is it, Lieutenant Johnson? The hawser, sir. It was cut deliberately. Gavin hunched down next to the lieutenant, eyeing the thick ropes twisted together, each cord slashed halfway through. This would explain why the other cables did not hold. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Johnson leaned closer, lowering his voice. Do you think it was... Gavin gave a sharp nod. I've no doubt. That must have been why Miles was found near the Orlop. The boy had cut their only link to safety as the storm worsened. Then he lit the fire when the crew lowered the anchors. Gavin's stomach hardened. The plan stunk of the elder Sanders. Of course the man did not care what happened to those aboard the Valor. After all, he was sure to hang once they reached Penzance. But did he not give a single thought for his younger brother? What had he said to convince Miles to go along with it? What are your orders, Captain? Gavin stood up from the cable. He could no longer dwell on the Sanders brothers, not when his ship was filled with more than two hundred good and able men he needed to protect. Lower the final anchor, he said, if only to provide us with a moment longer of safety away from the shores. As the third and final anchor plummeted into the sea, Gavin returned to the quarterdeck. Mr. Clamp grasped the wheel, attempting to maintain control of the ship. What are we to do, sir? Gavin moved at once to help him keep hold of the helm. He tried to focus on where the ship should be heading, but his eyes inevitably trailed east past the smoke and the rain. Goladuin's outline was now clearly visible, even through the darkness. Destruction and death awaited them, should they collide with Julatha Cliffs. That much he knew. But was the death upon the rocks any worse than the powder magazine catching fire? The foremast collapsing into the water and the ship capsizing? No. He knew what needed to be done, and he would have the courage to do it. If only for his men. Do you plan an attempt to beat, sir? Mr. Clamp asked, his voice tense. He had no doubt seen the look of determination on his captain's face. You know those cliffs as well as I, Captain, and the sailors who have perished there before. Yes, Gavin said, but if we stop the valor from reaching the larger rocks, and the bow makes contact with the smaller ones first, then the magazine will fill faster. Not all of them would survive the impact, but at least most of the crew would be saved from being blown apart. Mr. Clamp drew in a deep breath. Yes, sir. When I give the order, release the helm. Gavin planted his feet apart, his muscles straining from the pull of the wheel. They watched, waiting as the ship neared the strengthening light. How had things turned so suddenly? They would have reached Penzance by morning. He should not be fighting for the safety of his men. They should be anticipating the feel of the land beneath their feet. They should be greeting loved ones who desperately awaited their return. Would they see them again? Would Gavin see his brother again? Gavin had spent so long at sea, searching for a purpose to his life. A purpose he had been unable to find. Would his career end that evening? Would his life? The valour was lost already. But how many of his men would fall? How many of his men had he failed? The lighthouse towered before them. Brace! Brace for impact! He nodded to Mr. Clamp, and together they stood back. The helm spun rapidly in the opposite direction, the boat responding with a broad swinging movement toward the rocks. Gavin craned his neck, the lighthouse looming above them, before the snapping sounds of crumpling wood shook the air. He flew back, slamming sideways against the hull as the starboard side near the bow splintered to pieces. 
his hat flew over the edge of the ship, and a sharp stabbing pierced through the back of his upper arm. Growling through clenched teeth, Gavin tried to remain upright, but the searing pain caused his knees to buckle. He fell forward, away from the bulwark, feeling a release of pressure as something slid out from deep within the flesh of his arm. He shot a glance back, a splintered piece of wood sticking upright behind him, his own blood dripping from the tip of it. Cursing under his breath, he pushed himself up from his knees on the quarterdeck, wincing as he moved down the steps. He willed his mind to focus on what occurred around him, rather than the burning in his arm. Ready the boats! See to the wounded! Gavin stared at the chaos around him as the valor settled farther onto the protruding rocks. Waves reached over the hull, water flowed across the deck, smoke billowed from the ship, and Goladuin still shone directly above them. Had the keeper seen them collide with the cliffs? Would the man come to their aid? Or would he and his sailors be fending for themselves? Chapter 3 The words blurred on the pages of the book Abigail read, her head drooping forward and eyes drifting to a close, until the sensation of falling jerked her back awake. She glanced around, realising she still sat at the edge of the cot in the watch room. Light from Goladuin's lamps flickered above her, revealing their constant glow from the trapdoor in the ceiling. At least she hadn't fallen asleep long enough for the lamps to dim. Still, it wasn't worth the risk, sitting on the cot any longer. Wake up, she commanded herself, standing and tossing her book onto the small bed. She patted her cheeks as she crossed the room, approaching the window that overlooked the blackened sea. Rain slid down the glass, hindering any clear sight, so she leaned closer, moving back and forth to see past the droplets. No sign of any ship as far as she could see. Thank goodness. She reached toward the nearby table that held the remnants of her meagre dinner, a slice of bread and a piece of cheese, then chewed through the hardened food as she stifled a yawn. She swallowed, reaching for another piece, when something caught her eye, near the bottom of the window, rising above the cliff's edge. Was that... No. She was imagining things. And yet, as lightning lit the sea, Abigail could not deny the smoke blowing toward the land. Nor could she deny seeing the tips of the masts at the bottom of Dulatha Cliffs. No ship would be that close to land, unless they had... The blood drained from her face. Uncle! She ran to the door, ringing the large bell that hung on the wall nearby. Uncle, there has been a shipwreck! With the sounded bell still reverberating in her ears, she snatched a few hairpins and a boy's cap off the table, pinning up her locks and placing the cap firmly on her head as she flew down the steps. Uncle Ellis! Abigail, is it a shipwreck? Uncle's voice echoed up the tower, and she breathed a sigh of relief. At last, he was awake. Yes, she replied sliding her hand along the railing as she took the steps two at a time. Her head spun with the spiralling staircase. There is smoke coming from the wreckage. I must show the survivors the safest way to shore. No, I forbid it, her uncle said at once. His voice sounded above her boots, clanging against the iron stairs. Abigail, you cannot go out into such a storm. Not again. She reached the bottom of the stairs and soared past him without a glance. We cannot shirk our duty. I will take care, uncle. She reached the front door and pulled on a small jacket, ignoring her uncle's frustrated grumblings as he followed behind her. She knew he cared for her safety and she did not like to disobey him. But they both understood their obligations as keepers. He extended a glowing lantern to her with a grunt. I will return soon, she said, retrieving the light. Watch the lamps from the sitting room while I'm away. She did not await his response before she charged forth across the grass and into the wind and rain, praying Goladuin would remain lit so her uncle would not have to climb the stairs to relight the lamps. 
for she did not know if he could. She heaved open the door to the stables, her blue roan sticking her head over the stall door with a nicker. Abigail hooked the lantern securely on the wall. Come, Glastache, we must ride swiftly tonight. Within moments she tacked up the horse and led her outside, settling in the side saddle with the help of the mounting block and extending the lantern out in front of her. Take care, Abigail. She looked over her shoulder, her uncle's silhouette appearing in the doorway of their home. She raised her lantern in parting, then rode across the dark cliffside. Rain splashed against her face, blurring her vision. So she loosened her hold of the reins, allowing Glastache to find the safest ground as they reached the pathway leading to Goladuan Beach. The horse slid down the steep sandy slope, then raced south along the beach, travelling as far as possible from the lighthouse and Dulatha cliffs. All the while, Abigail moved the lantern in the air from side to side, praying the sailors would follow the light and know it would lead to their safety. When they reached the large boulders bordering the south end of the beach, she reined in Glastache, the mare snorting and stomping her hooves in the sand. Again, Abigail held the lantern aloft, straining her eyes for a sign of any boats in the water. Would they see her? Would they come toward the light? The dark waves came in one after the other, but still no boat appeared. They could still be trying to fill them. Unless, of course, there were no survivors at all. Her fears compelled her eyes to focus on the shipwreck. In an instant, she wished she hadn't. The ship leaned up against the rocks, lit by growing orange flames. The masts and yards teetered back and forth, and the sails whipped wildly in the wind, having no doubt become loosened in the storm. Only six months had passed since the last shipwreck had occurred on Goladuan shores. Over sixty men had perished due to the raging storm, and a captain who chose to sail too closely to the land. Was that the reasoning behind the shipwreck tonight? Or had the seas simply taken control of the vessel? Either way, Goladuan had failed them. Abigail had failed them. So she would do everything in her power to rescue any who survived, just as she had done before. She pulled her attention back to the sea, waiting anxiously for the sight of any survivors. Her arm began to tremble the blood draining from her hand as she continued moving the lantern in the air. A surge of joy cut through her fears as a single boat finally emerged from behind the farthest rocks. So there were survivors. But then, would they perish yet, coasting through the dangerous sea stacks? The boat's light hovered just above the water as it made headway, despite the choppy waves. She waved the lantern higher, standing on the tips of her toes. Her muscles tensed until the boat changed direction, moving farther south and away from the protrusive rocks. She released a constrained breath, relief overcoming her. They had seen her warning. Soon another boat emerged, more survivors. Would these men return to the ship to rescue even more of their shipmates? Or had only a handful of them survived? Anxious to discover the number, she tucked her lantern into a crevice between two large boulders, ensuring it was still visible to the sailors before raining glastache once more across the wet sand. Reaching the north end of the beach, Abigail secured glastache, then moved to the small, two-man boat tied just out of the water's reach. She strained to see in the darkness, swiping the rain from her eyes before reaching for a small bag tucked under a wooden plank. Rummaging past spare fishing line and a few seashells, her hand finally settled on cold metal. There it was. She pulled the nearly rusted telescope out of the bag, peering through the glass with her right eye and focusing on the damaged ship. From her vantage point, she could easily count twenty men on the upper deck. There had to be even more below deck. Working the bilge pumps and flooding the magazine. But then, with that size of ship... There had to be at least 200 men manning it, if not more. Where were the others? A weariness pressed on her heart. That same weariness, that same culpability, she felt with each shipwreck. 
What was the purpose of looking after Gola Duin if she failed to ensure the safety of sailors? She moved the telescope to the south end of the beach, where the boats finally reached the shoreline. Men jumped into the waves, clambering the rest of the way to the beach through the shallow water as the boats made their way back to the others in the sinking ship. She would ride to them and offer what little help she could, just as soon as she made certain no one was left behind. Fixing her telescope once more on the ruins of the ship, her heart grew heavy. Men clung to the halyards and railings to prevent falling into the sea as the waves slammed against the hull. Wood snapped, the sound cracking through the air, and driving fear deeper into Abigail's chest. Even still, she knew what she felt was nothing in comparison to the sailors' apprehension as they awaited their rescue from the ship. Chapter 4 The main deck rumbled beneath Gavin's feet as the valor leaned more heavily against the rocks. They were taking on water too quickly. The boats would need to hasten if the rest of the crew was to survive. Gavin's wounded arm had morphed from a dull ache into a pulsing throb with each movement he made. But he could not keep still, not while his men needed a captain. After ensuring the sailors still worked away at the pumps, hoping to prolong the life of their already sinking ship, Gavin returned to the main deck. He had no idea the number of men he'd lost in the bedlam of the storm and the collision, and he struggled not to dwell on the fact that they might have all been spared if he'd had the foresight to shackle not only Sanders, but his younger brother as well. The only problem was, he had yet to see Miles that evening. In fact, no one had seen the boys since the onslaught of the storm. He could have perished already, for all Gavin knew. But Sanders, he still lived. Gavin turned toward the ladder to the quarterdeck, where Sanders stood in shackles, Lieutenant Johnson diligently watching over him. The manacled seaman's cheekbones were sunken in, and his face held an impassive, uncaring expression, despite the destruction around him. Gavin strode across the deck, maintaining his gaze on him, though the man did not look up at him as he approached. Lieutenant Johnson, Gavin said, ensure Sanders takes the last boat with you, and keep him away from his brother once he is found. Miles will be better off without this sorry excuse for a family in his life. Sanders' eyes slowly rose, and the look within their dark depths would have chilled Gavin to his core had he not been just as angry himself. The man lunged forward with a growl of fury, and Gavin brought up his arm to stop the attack, flinching as his wound shot a stabbing ache through his muscles. Lieutenant Johnson pulled Sanders back before either of them could make contact with the other again. You will face the consequences for what you have done tonight, Sanders. Gavin said through clenched teeth, using every last shred of his power to prevent himself from serving justice to the man, right there aboard the Valor. He pointed his finger in Sanders' face and spoke each word with clarity, as will your brother. Sanders sneered, swearing at the captain before Gavin tossed his head and Lieutenant Johnson pulled the seaman away. Gavin drew in a deep breath. He could not wait for the very moment he would finally be rid of the Sanderses. Both of them. But right now, he needed to focus on the safety of his other, worthier men. As the night wore on, he lost count of the number of times the boats returned and left, each filled to its capacity. He did not know how many men had perished, but the number of wounded sailors told his mind to prepare for the worst. Slowly the crowds of seamen thinned, and he and Harris were the only ones left on board. The smaller boat is full, Captain, the lieutenant said, coming up behind Gavin on the quarterdeck and speaking above the sound of the continuous rushing waves. We will have to wait for the other to return. Gavin released a slow breath, crossing the deck to look over the bulwark at the frothing waves below. His left arm dangled uselessly at his side. I am happy to wait if that ensures the safety of the others. He glanced to the rocks, silently waiting until he caught sight of the small boat, disappearing into the darkness. I'm sure they will return soon, Captain, Lieutenant Harris said, leaning against the bulwark beside him. And when they do, 
I shall find myself a fine Cornish pasty, even if I must go begging for it. Gavin glanced at him sidelong, noting the mischief shining in the lieutenant's eyes. He had seen the look countless times in the five years they'd known each other, both of them starting out as lieutenants in their early twenties. Directly after the many storms and battles they'd experienced at sea, Harris had always cheered up those around him, helping them to forget their troubles by either talking of food or women. Gavin had always welcomed the distraction, and this moment wasn't any different. After all, he could do with forgetting the fact that they both stood on board a ship that could turn over into the rocks at any moment. With the rest of his men safe, avoiding apprehension was rather difficult. I can taste the pasty now, sir, Harris continued, as if he did not notice the waves still battering the ship, nor the flames licking at the bow. Filled with enough beef and potatoes to satisfy me for weeks, like when we were stationed in Falmouth years ago, do you remember? The ship creaked. Gavin clasped the edge with his right hand. There was still no sign of the returning boat. Yes. I recall you eating so much you could hardly fit into your britches the next day, when meeting our new captain. Harris smiled. Well, I had to eat my fill. I knew the quality of food we'd be eating soon and needed to... A wave burst over the ship's edge, pouring over the hull and ending Harris's words as both he and Gavin were swept from their feet. Gavin rolled to his stomach and grasped onto a broken beam just within his reach, holding tightly until the water ran over the starboard side. He coughed, expelling the water from his lungs. Leave it to you to distract us with talks of food, Harris. He wheezed. He glanced over his shoulder with a smile. Harris? He darted his eyes back and forth across the empty deck. The lieutenant was nowhere in sight. Gavin's chest caved in. Harris! He scrambled to his feet his face blanching as he ran to the edge of the ship and peered over the edge. The lifeless figure of his friend floated face down in the water, draped limply across a broken plank of wood. Man overboard! Gavin bellowed, though he knew no one could hear him. His gaze was fixed on the lieutenant, but he could see from the corner of his eye that no boat had yet returned to the valour. Knowing better than to take his eyes off the injured man for a single moment, Gavin frantically moved his hands about him, feeling around for anything that might help. His foot thudded against something solid, and he used the tip of his shoe to raise the object. A rough, thick rope piled beside him into his hands. Ignoring his protesting wound, Gavin tore off his blue captain's jacket and unravelled the rope, visualising the amount he required as Harris's body disappeared within a wave before emerging again on the piece of wood. Once Gavin knew the length of the line he discovered would suffice, he tied one end to the railing and the other around his waist. Then he climbed atop the edge of the bulwark and steadied himself. The waves frothed below, lit by the glowing flames of the ship, and the boat groaned against the waves. He could not waste another moment. Harris needed him. With a deep, settling breath, Gavin jumped from the ship and sailed through the air. The wind tore at his sleeves, and the rain stung his cheeks. Then he plunged into the cold, unforgiving sea. Abigail sucked in a breath. No! She cried out, as if she could stop the man from falling into the sea. She'd been looking for more survivors when he'd plummeted through the air, but now he was nowhere to be seen within the crashing waves. She pulled the telescope toward the southern end of the beach. The larger boat had reached the sand, men dragging the wounded sailors away from the water, while the smaller boat had yet to reach the shore. Were they even aware the man had fallen? But then, even if they had seen the incident, neither boat could reach the sailor before he would inevitably drown. But she had seen him, and she could reach him. If she navigated through the rocks, Rather than around them as the other sailors had, she would arrive at the ship in half the time, allowing the sailor a better chance at survival. The way was dangerous, and the man may have already perished, but she would never forgive herself if she did not attempt a rescue. Besides, 
She did not have any other choice when her own lighthouse had failed to keep them all safe. Without another thought, she untied her small boat and heaved it toward the sea. She glanced over her shoulder at the wreckage, a constant barrage of waves crashing into the rocks, flames illuminating the water nearby. Had they flooded the magazine before abandoning ship? Fear slid its icy fingers around her throat, and she paused in her progression when she reached the first of the waves, water swirling around her boots and seeping into her stockings. Her boat was not powerful, nor was Abigail stronger than the churning waves. Would she even stand a chance with no lantern to guide her, amid such rocks and stormy seas? She gave a quick shake of her head. No, she would not cower, not now, not while a sailor's life was at stake. She jumped into the boat, and with her back to the shipwreck, rowed out against the waves. The oars scraped on stone as the water pushed her closer to the rocks. Her arms burned with exertion, but she pressed on. She glanced over her shoulder at the wreckage with every stroke, desperate for any sighting of the man in the water. But the waves were too great. As she neared the stern, however, a faint shout rose above the waves. She looked toward the sound in time to catch a glimpse of a hand waving above a large trunk floating in the water, and a surge of energy pulsed through her veins. He was alive. Thank heavens, he was alive. I'm nearly there, she called out, pushing through the sea. Rain and seawater stung her eyes, the smell of burning wood permeating the air. Her limbs begged for respite, but she refused to stop. Here, the voice called above the wind and water. We're just here. We? She had only seen a single body disappear into the water. There was another. At last, her boat bumped up against the trunk the man clasped onto with one arm. She secured the oars and looked over her shoulder to see, sure enough, two men floating in the water. Take him the first sailor commanded, holding his unconscious mate above the waves. Careful of his arm. Abigail held on to one side of the boat for leverage as she grasped the unconscious man's shirt, helping to hoist him over the edge. His body fell limply at her feet. She reached to help the other man over, but his head was lowered as he untied the rope around his waist, the line stretching to the ship's railing above. Was this the man she had seen falling? She had not noticed the rope before. Had he dived down to rescue the other? A large wave dropped over them, water splashing across her lap and over the unconscious man's body. She gripped on to both sides of the boat as it rocked dangerously from side to side. Here, shouted the sailor in the water, finally unfastened. Give me your hand, boy. Abigail's fingers froze in midair, but before she could pull back, the man grasped her hand and heaved himself up, landing in the boat with a thud and a grunt as he grasped his upper arm. The moment he was secure, Abigail pulled away, scowling as the three of them swayed unsteadily in the water. The flames lit his face, his dark hair dripping water across his striking features. His gaze travelled the length of her dress, past her jacket, then up to her face. When his eyes widened, Abigail knew he had finally seen her. Chapter 5 Gavin blinked in shock. You are not a... No, I am not! The woman, a woman, spat out her words, clearly agitated by his mistake. Water splashed across their laps, and she raised her voice above the roaring waves. But if my being female is unsettling for you... I would gladly take this sailor to shore and leave you here to be at the mercy of the sea. The locals he'd come across during his previous stops in Cornwall had always boasted strong accents. But this woman spoke as if she was of the upper class. If she was, what was she? She doing in the middle of the sea rescuing stranded sailors. Her angry gaze finally pulled him from his astonishment and he shook his head. No. We will both gratefully accept your assistance. She nodded with a swift jerk of her head, then proceeded to row them away from the wreckage with a finesse and strength 
that rivalled some of his younger crew. Lieutenant Harris moaned from the bottom of the boat, and Gavin tore his gaze from the woman to focus on his ailing friend. He shifted his feet and pressed his palm against Harris's chest, securing his head with his other hand. How is he? the woman asked. His breathing is strong. Gavin looked to the distended bone misshaping Harris's arm, dark blood covering his sleeve. But he is wounded. Are there any other men out here? No, we were the last two on the ship. He was washed over the edge by a rogue wave, so I dove in after him. She didn't respond, surging through the water without hesitation, despite her slight figure. Gavin knew he ought to offer his help, but with his left arm causing him even greater pain after his dive into the salty sea, he would only hinder their progress. Besides, she seemed to be doing very well on her own. He eyed her jacket and cap. Were they her brothers, perhaps? Or her husband's? Harris moaned again, and Gavin set aside his thoughts of the woman's boyish clothing and hunched over his friend. Harris! The lieutenant's eyes flashed open. His brow pursed, then panic took over. He thrashed about the boat and shouted in agony as he moved his arm. Yet still he continued to flail. Gavin grasped Harris's shoulder, struggling to keep him down as waves splashed against the boat and sprayed water across their faces. Stay still, Harris. Stop its moving! The woman shouted. Do not think I am attempting to do that, ma'am. Gavin glanced at her, sidelong, still trying to gain control of his friend's delirious state. With an exasperated sigh, she thrust the oars toward Gavin. He scrambled to get a hold of them, flinching as his arm twinged in pain. With her hands now free, the woman leaned forward and grasped both sides of Harris's face. Sir? she said, her tone soft in contrast to how she had spoken to Gavin. Instantly, Harris stopped his shifting, focusing on the woman above him. I am Abigail Moore. You mustn't worry now. I will keep you safe. Gavin stared at her as much as Harris did, both of them apparently in a trance, as the woman, Miss Moore, or perhaps Mrs. Moore, continued. She rested a hand upon his chest. You have hurt your arm, sir, but you must hold still while I row you to shore, or you will become further injured. I will find you the help you need as soon as I am able to. Do you understand? Harris blinked mutely. His breathing levelled and he closed his eyes. Yes, ma'am. She straightened with a satisfied nod, then took the oars once more. Harris settled back in the bottom of the boat with a pained grimace, remaining motionless as Gavin looked from him to Abigail Moore. Who was this woman? This woman who rowed as determinedly as any man and spoke properly enough to be a lady. This woman who was powerful enough to carry out a daring rescue through blustering waters, yet soft enough to instantly calm a distraught sailor's nerves. Whoever she was, Gavin was more than impressed. He was astonished. A boy? How could that sailor have thought she was a boy? Abigail knew the darkness had played a contributing factor, as well as the glaring fact that her hair had been tucked away beneath a boy's cap. Still, the mistake had stung. Was it so difficult to imagine a female could know the rocks and the sea around Goladuin as well as any man? Or was she more upset about the fact that she had not appeared feminine enough to be seen as the woman she was? She really shouldn't care. After all, she wasn't there to impress the sailors with her beauty and elegance. She was there to rescue them. Regardless, she did not know of any woman who would be happy in the knowledge that someone had mistaken her for a boy. She glanced to the sailor as he leaned forward, keeping his injured mate's head from bouncing against the side of the boat as the relentless waves carried them up and down. His white waistcoat and breeches, the same as his companions, signified their higher ranks. Lieutenants, by the looks of them. They had been the last men aboard the ship. Did that mean the captain hadn't survived? She glanced over her shoulder at the fast-approaching shoreline. Both boats were docked on the shore now, 
and much of the beach was occupied by the survivors. Far more than she could have hoped. A few of the uninjured men ran forward. They must have seen Abigail's approach, with the lightning flashing overhead. When she reached them, she jumped down into the knee-high water, and the men helped her pull the boat securely onto the sand. Fetch your surgeon, she instructed at once. One sailor ran in the direction of the group that had taken shelter near the rocks. The rest of them remained in front of Abigail, staring wide-eyed at her skirts and cap. She pulled in her lips and sighed through her nose. She obviously needed to help the simpletons realise that she was indeed female. She removed her cap and a few curls fell around her face before the rain flattened them upon her temples. Perfect. Now the men would only stare more. I must speak with your captain, she said, before she could concoct another way to make them even more baffled. Did he survive? A few of them exchanged looks. One of them stepped forward. Sir? Abigail balked. Sir, could they not see the dress she wore? Did they not see her long hair pinned up? Surely the light of their lanterns had revealed her sex to them. I am not a... She paused, realising that the sailor's eyes were focused beyond her shoulder instead of at her. She turned to watch a few men lift the wounded officer from the boat and carry him up the beach. Then their attention, her attention, remained on the second man she'd rescued, the man who had mistaken her for a boy. He stood to his full height, his wet shirt clinging to his broad shoulders, his breeches tightly fitted around his calves and thighs. You are the captain, she asked. I am, his voice no longer muted by howling wind and waves, was deep and rich. Captain Gavin Kendricks, of the HMS Valor. The captain himself had been the one to jump from his ship in order to rescue his lieutenant. Abigail attempted a look of indifference. She could not show how impressed she truly was with the man's boldness, not while she was still upset about his mistaking her for a boy. She turned toward the other sailors on the beach. How many of your men have perished? Have we a number, Lieutenant Johnson? The captain asked, coming up to stand behind her. She took a sidestep away from him. Another officer standing nearby answered. We have sixteen men so far unaccounted for, sir. Sixteen? It was a relatively small number compared to how many men must have been aboard the ship. Even still, the number eddied in Abigail's mind. Goladuin could have saved them. So why had it not? Was it her fault, or was it the captain's? She glanced toward him. His shoulders had visibly fallen, the lanterns revealing his gaunt expression. With other shipwrecks, some of the captains she had encountered had not even bothered to feign sorrow at the news of their crew members' deaths. Setting the thoughts aside, she motioned to the cliffs nearby. St. Just lies east of here. You may find lodging there that should satisfy your needs, for shelter for the night. She scanned the sailors farther up the beach, her eyes falling at once upon a man in shackles, sitting down in the sand, guarded by two broad-shouldered men. What had he done to be secured in such a way? She didn't think she wished to find out. Goladuin is small, Captain, she began. But we are more than happy to accommodate the worst of your wounded, until they are well enough to travel themselves. Captain Kendricks turned to face her directly. I must thank you and your husband for your generosity, Mrs. Moore. Oh, I am not... She stopped. What did it matter if she corrected him? She really did not need to speak with him again. You may have your surgeon send the wounded up directly. I will make ready for them. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. She blushed, remaining silent again at the misnomer. Giving a simple nod, she walked away without a glance back, though she felt his eyes on her until the darkness separated them. Abigail reached the lighthouse shortly after, calling out for Uncle Ellis, but he didn't respond. Had he gone to the watch room after all? She attempted to swallow her frustration, ringing the bell at the bottom of the staircase to alert Uncle of her return. He was clearly trying to help, looking after the lamps, but if he injured himself again, 
How could she see to him and the wounded sailors? Setting her annoyances aside, Abigail went to work. Uncle would need help descending the stairs, but she would see to her duty with the sailors first. After changing into a simple, dry work dress, she gathered spare rags, pushed aside the old furniture, and set up spare cots with blankets and clean sheets. Just as she finished seeing to a large fire in the sitting room hearth, a knock sounded at the door. She allowed the men inside, and soon the room was filled with the low murmur of sailors' voices as they tended to their wounded mates. Mr. Lee, the ship's surgeon, accepted Abigail's offer of help. She kept busy, applying bandages and keeping up a steady supply of rags and boiled water. They tended to Lieutenant Harris's wounds first, before moving to a scowling young man, no more than seventeen. I know you're angry, Miles, Mr. Lee said, as he cleaned the large gash on the boy's forehead. But there is no need to be upset with the captain, not after he saved so many of us, including your brother. Abigail's ears perked up at the mention of their commanding officer, but before she could hear the young man's response, a grunt sounded down the corridor. Blast! She'd forgotten to help Uncle. She excused herself from Mr. Lee and ran to her uncle's aid in the circular room. She found him leaning heavily upon the spiral railing, the other hand on his cane. Uncle! She rushed to his side, raising his arm around her shoulders and helping him down the remaining steps. You should not have been up there! Beads of sweat trembled on his brow. We both did what was necessary. You could have watched the light from the sitting room, though, as I said earlier. He spoke between heavy breaths. If the lamps would have gone out, I would never have been able to make it in time to relight them. Not before another ship passed by, at any rate. I'm just glad I was finally able to be of some use. They crossed the room together, and he winced. Well, you will certainly suffer the consequences of the climb come morning she said. But thank you for your help. The storm has lessened some, so you needn't return upstairs. I will refill the lamps when the others have gone. How many are wounded? They reached the sitting room, and Uncle Ellis removed his arm from around her as they stood in the doorway, peering at the sailors within the space. Fifty or so, she replied, but most of them remained on the beach. Only nine of them were bad enough to require shelter here. There were very few casualties as well, compared to what we have seen before. They must have a good captain then. A captain who could not see the difference between a boy and a woman. I suppose, she responded. Three raps sounded against the front door and she moved to open the call. Sit by the fire, uncle. I'll bring you a cup of tea in a moment. Uncle Ellis did as he was told and Abigail moved to open the door. Her stomach did a strange turn when light from behind her poured outside and illuminated the handsome face of the captain himself. He nodded in greeting. Your men are just through here, she said, before he could say a word. She pulled the door open wider, allowing him passage. Thank you, Mrs. Moore. Yes, it was certainly too late to correct him now. Of course, she said. You will find... Abigail? She and the captain faced Uncle Ellis as he joined them in the corridor. Uncle, allow me to introduce Captain Kendricks. Captain, my uncle... Kendricks? Uncle Ellis interrupted. His eyes narrowed and he leaned closer. Gavin Kendricks? Abigail glanced between them. Her look of bewilderment matched the captain's until recognition dawned in his eyes. Ellis Moore? The captain said. Heavens, I never thought I'd see you again. Abigail's surprise grew as the gentleman embraced. With the captain's back turned toward her, she noticed for the first time the dark red blood on the back of his upper left arm as it hung limply at his side. The wound had to be as large and painful as the stain suggested. Why had he not come to Goloduin straight away, with the others who were injured? How have you been, sir? Captain Kendricks asked as the men pulled apart. Abigail had to take a step to the side 
to avoid being tread upon. She crossed her arms with an impatient sigh. Very fine indeed, Uncle Ellis responded, living a life of peace. So it would appear, Captain Kendrick said. Abigail took another step to the side, tapping her boot on the floor. I have seen your name listed with other keepers before, Captain Kendricks continued. I do not know how I've managed to overlook the fact that it was you, especially as I heard you funded your own lighthouse years ago. I never believed that to be true until now. Uncle Ellis chuckled. Yes, it is true enough. As mad an ambition as it was, I've never regretted it. This lighthouse truly is my life. Abigail held in a scoff. How long had it been since she'd heard Uncle speak in such a way? Goladuin wasn't his life as much as it was hers now. And what about you? Uncle Ellis asked, his eyes shining brighter than they had in months. Captain of your own ship? Your parents must be very proud. A moment passed by before the captain responded, his voice softer than before. I thought you would have heard. They both passed away ten years ago. Uncle Ellis's face twisted with grief, and Abigail forgot her irritation at being ignored. No, I had not heard. My dear boy, I am so sorry. I fear I lost touch with your father after I came to Cornwall. They were the best of people, your parents. I'm inclined to agree with you, sir. Silence hung in the air between them, and finally Uncle Ellis's attention fell on Abigail. Oh, forgive me, my dear. He beckoned her closer. You recall me speaking of Mr. Kendricks, my friend from Gloucestershire? This is his son. She recalled Uncle Ellis mentioning the name once or twice. The two gentlemen had gone to school together, and when Mr. Kendricks had grown and married, Uncle Ellis had set forth to explore England. Seeing the son of his old friend had to be the real reason Uncle was happier than he'd been in months. Not because he was so desperately unhappy with Abigail at Goladuin. She sidled past the captain in the narrow corridor to stand next to her uncle as he continued. Captain Kendricks, this is my niece, Miss Abigail Moore. Chapter 6 So, she was Miss Moore then. In the warm candlelight of her home, and with the cap finally removed from her head, Gavin could finally appreciate the woman. Her auburn hair was twisted into a chignon, wavy tendrils, still moist from the rain, framing her face in a disorderly, albeit charming, manner. Now the proper accent she spoke with made sense. She was the niece of a gentleman. No doubt the daughter of a gentleman too. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss Moore, he said with a bow. The woman bobbed a curtsy in silence. She was not still upset about his mistaking her for a boy, was she? Perhaps he ought to do something to make up for it. Gavin glanced to Mr Moore, still reeling at the sight of his father's old friend. Of all the people to discover during a shipwreck, he never thought it would be him. I must tell you, Mr Moore, we are indebted to your niece. Not only did she guide my men safely to shore by her light, but she also rescued me and my first lieutenant from drowning in the sea. Gavin expected her to be flattered by his praise, but instead he was treated with a scowl. What on earth had he said to have earned such a reaction? Then Mr. Moore whirled toward his niece with nostrils flared. Abigail Moore, what were you thinking? Gavin regretted his words in an instant. He'd exposed the woman, that much was clear. The storm had lessened by that point, Uncle, I assure you, she responded. She shot another threatening glance at Gavin, as if to warn him to keep his mouth shut about how perilous the waters truly had been. I merely set forth upon the sea, retrieved the captain and his mate, and returned to shore. Mr. Moore's lips thinned. I've told you before, I do not like you to do this. Suppose the wind had changed, or a wave had driven you straight into the rocks. It didn't, uncle. As I said, I took care. One cannot take care when one is being reckless, he returned. I was not being reckless, I was... 
If I may interject. Both Moors turned toward Gavin. Mr. Moore listened at once, but Miss Moore's scowl only grew. Gavin was well aware of the risk he was taking at the moment, but he had to say something. After all, it was his fault the woman had ventured forth in the first place. Mr. Moore, I fully understand your concern over your niece's decision. However, I must say that I owe her my life. If she had not reacted so selflessly, so courageously, I would not be standing before you now. Mr. Moore scratched his chin. Slowly, his eyes softened, and a half-smile stretched across his lips. I suppose I cannot be too angry, then. Abigail, I trust you will exercise more sense in the future. Miss Moore raised her chin, averting her gaze from Gavin's. Of course, uncle. So long as the next captain exercises more sense than to crash his ship beneath a lighthouse. Abigail, uncle muttered under his breath, be kind. Abigail had regretted her words before uncle even chastised her. She should not be unnecessarily cruel to anyone, let alone a man she'd just met. Never mind that she was upset about Captain Kendrick's mistaking her for a boy and subsequently alerting Uncle of her dangerous choices. He didn't deserve to be treated in such a way when he'd clearly done all he could to help his ship and his men. There was a deeper frustration within her heart, though. Once she had been the one to make Uncle's blue eyes shine with joy. She had been the one to change his mind so readily, to cause him to speak so enthusiastically. Now, this captain, this near stranger, had that effect on Uncle Ellis, and she did not. But then her insecurities were not the captain's issues. Forgive me, Captain, she said, with all the humility she could muster. I see you are hurt. You must allow your surgeon to dress your wound. She didn't wait, sticking her head into the sitting room and waving Mr. Lee toward them. The surgeon joined them in the corridor, examining the back of Captain Kendrick's left arm. I will see to this directly, sir. No, care for the others first, the captain said. Abigail glanced into the sitting room. Only two of the men remained unbandaged. I can do more than gather rags, Mr. Lee. Allow me to clean the wounds of the remaining sailors while you see to the captain. Mr. Lee shook his head. No, miss, this is sordid business. A great deal of blood. I shouldn't like for you to grow faint. Her pride prickled. I am perfectly able to remain upright at the sight of blood, sir, I assure you. It is true enough, Uncle Ellis chimed in. My niece has helped clean wounds on many sailors. She is more than capable. Abigail raised her chin and stared pointedly at Mr. Lee, but the man still looked uncertain. Well, I for one do not need further convincing. All eyes fell upon Captain Kendricks as he took a step forward. Miss Moore may look after my wound until you have finished with the others, Mr. Lee. Abigail opened her mouth to protest. She did not suggest helping the other sailors, only to be shuffled toward the captain and his broad shoulders. Not that she had noticed they were broad, of course. But Mr. Lee spoke first lowering his voice and leaning toward his captain with a wary glance at Abigail. I really think I ought to be the one who tends to your wound, Captain. Abigail pulled a face. She was starting to dislike this surgeon. As I stated, I should like for you to see to the other men first, Captain Kendrick said. Besides, Miss Moore has already saved me once this evening. I trust she will treat me with the utmost care again. Will you not, Miss Moore? The candlelight flickered in his dark brown eyes. To be perfectly honest, she was not entirely certain she could help the captain with his wound. For some reason she could not fathom, her hand seemed to tremble at the mere thought of touching him. But as Mr. Lee regarded her dubiously, she raised her chin. Yes, I will. The surgeon plodded back to the sitting room, and Abigail tried not to appear too smug. Her vanity disappeared, however, when she noticed the captain's eyes still upon her. Why don't you situate yourself in the dining room, captain? She said, motioning to the room across the hall to distract him. 
Yes, there will be more room in there, her uncle agreed. I should like to continue our conversation, Captain, but I think I ought to lie down for a moment. His hand quivered as he leaned his weight on his cane, and Abigail chided her lack of consideration. Allow me to help you, uncle. No, he said. You see to the captain. She watched him walk away as he used both the wall and his cane for support. Then she gestured again for the captain to go to the dining room. As he entered the room, Abigail gathered a few rags and retrieved a thin blade from Mr. Lee, who handed it over with a begrudging look. After she poured a bowl of hot water from the pot heated by the kitchen fire, then she entered the dining room. Captain Kendrick stood near the table, his waistcoat and cravat already draped over the back of a chair as he attempted to remove his shirt, one arm at a time. Abigail set her supplies on the table as he dropped his left arm to his side, a groan of pain and frustration escaping his lips. Would you like me to help you? she offered. I would be grateful, yes. Abigail walked toward him and tugged first at the wet fabric of his right sleeve. He wiggled his arm free after a few stifled grunts. Next, she moved around him, lifting his shirt up and over his head, before holding the fabric away from his wound. As she did so, her fingers grazed his back, and she pulled back with a start. He peered over his shoulder. What is it? Your wound, she lied. It is deeper than I thought it would be. She lowered her hand, wiggling her fingers to remove the tingling sensation his skin had caused. Careful not to touch him again, she raised the fabric past the injury and down his left arm to fully remove his shirt. How did you acquire the wound, Captain? She asked, desperate to distract herself from his bare muscular back. It is as you said. I did not use any sense and led my ship to crash upon the cliffs. Abigail ducked her head, hiding her blush as she stepped around him. I should not have said that before. I only did so because you told my uncle I was out in the boat. That was a half-truth if she'd ever told one. She crossed the room and draped his wet shirt over the back of the chair near the fire. In my defence, he said behind her. I did not know you wished that information to remain undisclosed. She turned to see him rolling out his arm with a wince, the muscles across his chest and arms shifting as he moved. Instantly she turned away. She never should have suggested tending to his wound in here. They would have been fighting for space in the sitting room, but at least she wouldn't be alone in her home with a half-clothed man. What was the matter with her? She had helped plenty of sailors in the same state of undress as she had tended to their wounds. Apart from Captain Kendrick's impressive physique, attractive features and warm brown eyes that always seemed to be studying her, why should he affect her any differently? You may take a seat, she said, waving one hand toward the table, as she focused too intently on her supplies. The wood creaked as he sat down sideways on the chair, his back facing her. Thankfully, the sight of his wound soon distracted her from the muscles working in his back and arms as he shifted. Well, it almost distracted her. She sat behind him in a way to allow the firelight to shine on his wound. The injury was deep, a jagged circle open on the back of his arm. Dark blood caked the surrounding skin, and small pieces of wood lodged far into his flesh. As a young girl, during the first shipwreck Abigail had ever witnessed at Goladuin, the sight of such mutilation had made her nearly faint. But after years of practice, she had grown accustomed to tending to such wounds. She leaned in close to the captain's arm and began her efforts, intent on doing a thorough job so Mr. Lee could find nothing of which to complain. She slid a finger down the side of his wound to see how easily the blood would wash off, ignoring the feeling it produced on her skin again. This was work, after all, and she would treat it as such. Are you cold, sir? she asked, noting the chills across the captain's arm and back. He cleared his throat. No, indeed. 
She eyed the back of his head curiously, before submerging a rag in the hot water. I will do my best to take care, Captain, but this may hurt. Her fingers burned with the heat of the water as she squeezed the rag over his wound. His muscles twitched in protest, but he made no further movement. You are certain you are able to do this? he asked. Water droplets slid down the ridges of his arm, and she used her free hand to press a dry cloth beneath the wound to catch the excess blood and moisture. I have already said that I am, she returned. I only ask because I do not wish to cause you any discomfort. He spoke with his head turned to the window, light from the fireplace dancing on his profile. Most ladies would shy away from the tasks you have taken part of this evening. She wiped away the remaining blood around the wound and dropped the rag in the bowl. I suppose I am not like most ladies, then. She'd always cringed at the word. She did not consider herself a lady any more than she considered herself a boy. She was a female lighthouse keeper, and that was enough for her. Slow footsteps slid across the floor near the doorway, and she looked up as the wounded lieutenant from the boat appeared before them. His arm was in a sling, and his face was void of colour. Harris, Captain Kendrick said, what are you doing walking about? Abigail went straight to his side, holding his good arm and leading him toward the nearest chair. You must sit before you fall over, sir. He settled in the seat she provided. Do I know you, ma'am? Miss Moore is the woman who saved us, Captain Kendricks explained as she resumed her place behind his wound. Miss Moore, this is Lieutenant Harris. Oh, of course, that is why your face was so familiar. We are indebted to you, ma'am. Abigail retrieved the surgeon's knife from the table, giving a simple nod in response. She didn't have time to accept any praise, nor did she wish for it. She would much rather go about her work without any attention at all. With the tip of her knife, she fished out the first splinter near the edge of Captain Kendrick's cut. He flinched with a soft grunt. We truly are fortunate to be alive, he said after a slow release of breath. You made a remarkably selfless choice to have risked your life in such a way, Miss Moore. Abigail focused on a particularly stubborn splinter in his arm. It is simply my duty to help the sailors whom our light has failed. Captain Kendricks glanced over his shoulder. Your light did not fail the valour. If that is true, Captain, then how did you come upon the rocks of Julatha Cliffs? He glanced to Lieutenant Harris, who appeared even paler than before. Because, the captain began, we believe a revolt occurred with a small number aboard the ship tonight. Her chest tightened. A mutiny? Both men darted their eyes to the door before sharing a look of their own. Clearly, they hesitated speaking to her about such matters. She did not blame them, nor would she pry further. If you will give me but a few moments, I will finish cleaning your wound. Then the two of you may speak more freely. She picked at another splinter, but Captain Kendrick's low voice made her pause. No, it's not that, Miss Moore. This delicate matter involves a member of our crew, who was wounded, in the next room. Someone who had attempted a mutiny, who had disrespected their commanding officers and risked hundreds of lives was in her home. Captain Kendricks continued, no doubt sensing her trepidations. I would not have allowed him up here, but we do not want him to know we suspect him, as he might attempt to run. But he is under careful watch, I assure you. Abigail mentally sifted through the sailors she attended to that night, before settling on the angry young man the surgeon had spoken to about Captain Kendricks. She had said she wouldn't pry, and yet, did she not have the right to know, since he was in her home? Was it the boy with the wounded brow? she asked. Mr. Lee said he was angry with you. The captain lowered his voice to a whisper. Miles, yes. His elder brother. Sanders, threatened me while aboard the Valor. Lieutenant Harris piped in with a whisper. We believe the brothers worked together to start a fire below deck. Her blood boiled at the very idea. How could anyone be so selfish as to consider taking so many lives? 
What is to become of them both? She asked, nearly forgetting to wipe away the blood trickling down Captain Kendrick's arm. There will be a court-martial, but... Lieutenant Harris, I told you to remain on the cot. Mr. Lee appeared in the doorway, his eyebrows so thick they were nearly one. The lieutenant raised an innocent brow. The captain wished to speak with me, sir. You know I always obey captain's orders. He sent a teasing wink at Abigail, but his smirk vanished as he stood, swaying from side to side until Mr. Lee steadied him. You see, Mr. Lee said, you cannot have recovered already. He led the man from the room and spoke over his shoulder. Captain, I will return shortly to see how the miss fared. Abigail frowned at the empty doorway. Now is your chance to make quick work, Miss Moore, Captain Kendrick said when they were alone. Prove the man is wrong to doubt you. With his encouragement, Abigail moved faster, if only slightly, for she did not wish to cause the captain more pain than he must have already been feeling. Finally, the last of the splinters were removed, and Mr. Lee returned to scrutinise her work. To her great satisfaction, he appeared rather annoyed. Thank you, miss, he grumbled. She sauntered away with a raised chin, looking back over her shoulder, only long enough to see the captain's look of approval before she left the room. Before long, Mr. Lee finished suturing and bandaging the wounded, and the able-bodied men prepared to leave with their captain. Only the lieutenant and one other sailor would remain overnight in the warmth of the lighthouse, with Mr. Lee to watch over them. The rest would seek shelter in St. Just and other nearby towns. As they filed out of Goladuin, Abigail stood in the doorway, nodding to each sailor who tipped his cap at her in departure. Captain Kendrick stood at the back, adjusting his slightly dried shirt over his bandaged arm. Miles Sanders, the angry young man, simply stomped past her without so much as a glance, but a sailor who appeared close to her age lingered at her side. Ma'am, he began, I never seen a prettier girl than ye. What do you do all night as you watch this lighthouse? I watch the lighthouse, she stated, unimpressed. You must tire of being alone. If ever you yearn for company, might I suggest myself? No, you may not. The man reached for her hand with his bandaged fingers. Come now, miss, I'll show you a fine. Brady. At his captain's reprimand, the young sailor ducked his head and slunk away from Abigail's side. The other sailors chortled as he joined them, and he pushed them aside with embarrassment. I do apologise, Miss Moore, Captain Kendrick said, coming up to stand beside her. I fear the drink he was given for his pain has weakened his good sense. She eyed the men as they made their way through the darkness and falling rain. It has happened before she said, especially when they have the sense to realise that I am, in fact, a woman. She stared at him sidelong, expecting him to squirm at her teasing. Instead, his eyes shone brighter. I assure you, Miss Moore, had I seen your face before your cap, there is no possible way I would have ever mistaken you for a boy. With a knowing smile, he bowed, then walked away to join his men. Abigail stared after him. And despite her best efforts, the corners of her lips tugged upwards until the men vanished in the darkness. Chapter 7 By dawn the storm had passed. The calm waves reflected the soft pink clouds above, and the swallow's shrill chirp sounded once again. Abigail stood near the edge of the cliff, breathing in the earthy smell of the damp grass as she eyed the beach. The sand was littered with debris. A few sailors had returned that morning to filter through the wreckage, no doubt looking for any of their belongings that might be salvageable. She scanned the men, telling herself she was looking for no one in particular. Quite the mess, is it not? Her uncle said, coming up behind her. The ship is clearly beyond saving, but at least most of the men are safe. She tilted her head to one side greeting her uncle with a smile. Why are you awake so early? He leaned both hands on his cane in front of him. 
I couldn't sleep after the last of the sailors left this morning. I stayed awake to update the logbooks. He looked away, muttering, the one thing I am still capable of doing. She ignored his gloomy words, knowing better than to dwell on them and bring him down further. How are your knees after last night? Sorer than usual. She looped her arm through his and rested her head on his shoulder, hoping to provide a little comfort to his downtrodden spirit. Perhaps you might consider walking to Mr. Craig's today for a tincture. You always cheer up after your visits with him. Mr. Craig, the town apothecary, often provided her uncle with pain relief for his knees. The two had become easy friends over the past few months, their visits usually lasting until the early hours of the morning. Abigail knew the friendship helped Uncle Ellis to forget about his current situation. Though she felt at times that her uncle was forgetting her in the process too. She still encouraged their visits to help improve her uncle's mood. Perhaps another day, Uncle Ellis said. He turned to the sailors on the beach below. I thought to invite Captain Kendricks to join us for dinner this evening. Oh? She tried to appear as apathetic as possible. I was going to look for him on the beach this morning, but... He stared down at his cane with clear aversion. Allow me to help then. I will be ready just as soon as I extinguish the lamps. Uncle Ellis expressed his gratitude, but she waved it aside. After all, she could not have passed on the opportunity to ease her uncle's burden, no matter how many chores she was setting aside to do so. And, if she just so happened to see the captain of the HMS Valor again too, then that would be fine as well. Have any more bodies washed ashore, Lieutenant Johnson? Gavin asked. Yes, sir. Two, the second lieutenant replied. Two, and three others found just before dawn. That brought the death toll to twenty-one. Twenty-one men Gavin had failed to protect. He knew the amount was minor compared to other shipwrecks, and to the number of men who had perished due to battles and illnesses aboard the Valor. But those who had died the previous night, they had been so close to home, so close to completing their voyage. Now Gavin would sign twenty-one letters for the families of those brothers and sons, fathers and uncles who had served their country, but would never return home. Continue the search along this beach and others, Lieutenant, Gavin instructed as the knot in his stomach tightened. As far as Tregorwin, if needs be. I need the total number of deaths listed before we make for Penzance tomorrow. Yes, sir. And send Brady to keep watch of Miles, at least until we are certain he won't be charged with his brother. He's not likely to leave until the ship has been paid off, anyway. But I should like to ensure he does nothing else reckless while he's still under my command. Lieutenant Johnson nodded before walking away. Gavin rubbed the back of his neck, returning his attention to the wreckage of his ship. His concern for the fate of the valor had passed the night before, when he'd watched the simmering fire and gusts of wind eventually cause the foremost to fall. Since then, his worries had centred on the men he had lost, and the Sanders brothers, who were the cause of it all. An immovable weight pressed down on his chest, a weight he vowed he would never feel again. Yes, the time had come to request his official retirement from the Navy. The actions of the Sanders brothers had prompted the idea, and the wrecking of the Valor had settled it. All he needed to do now was find something that would bring him more fulfilment than he'd ever experienced as a captain in the Navy. Such a task couldn't be too difficult, could it? Good morning, Captain. Gavin looked over his shoulder. Ellis Moore walked along the beach toward him, his niece at his side in a simple, dark brown dress. She looked to be about three and twenty, though the light freckles spattering her nose and upper cheeks gave her a youthful air. He had already noticed the colour of her hair before in the low light of their home, but in the sunshine her auburn locks glinted a deeper red. Good morning, he greeted, walking up to meet them. Mr. Moore leaned heavily upon his niece, 
and Gavin wondered how she managed to remain upright, being a full head shorter and a great deal thinner than her uncle. How fares your wound, Captain? Mr. Moore asked. Much better, after the careful attention of your niece, sir, Gavin said. The slightest hint of pink crossed Miss Moore's cheeks. And I am in far better shape than most of my men, so for that I am grateful. Rightly so, Mr. Moore said. The ship, I'm sure, has seen better days. Gavin stepped aside to face the wreckage. Indeed, she is beyond repairing. We will salvage what little we can and watch for any belongings to be carried ashore. But any hope of the valour sailing again was washed away in the storm last evening. Shame that, Mr. Moore said. Gavin glanced to Miss Moore, wondering at her silence. Their eyes caught and she swiftly looked away. So, how long do you plan to stay near St. Just, Captain? Mr. Moore asked. I will make for Penzance tomorrow when the ship is paid off, then return to St. Just to oversee the salvaging for a few days. In that case, you must stay with us at Goloduin. Abigail blinked several times to keep her eyes from rounding in surprise. Captain Kendricks, stay with them. What was her uncle thinking? They hardly had room for each other, let alone another man. Thank you, the captain said with a sincere look of gratitude. But I fear I am not able to accept your generous offer. I will need to return to Penzance a time or two in the coming weeks. It is nearly a two-hour ride, so it will be best if I stay there. Abigail's sigh of relief came all too soon as Uncle pressed on. Do reconsider. You'll be far more comfortable staying with us than you would at the Golden Arms or any other inn in Penzance. He motioned to Abigail, and my niece here is a delightful cook, especially compared with what you would eat elsewhere. Her uncle had obviously forgotten that her cooking was dependent on them having funds for food in the first place. What was she to feed him? A crust of bread? A fried egg? That would hardly be sufficient for a man of the captain's stature. You would really be doing me a favour, Uncle Ellis continued. I spend many evenings alone while Abigail tends to the lights. I would love to have a companion to speak with again. Abigail winced from the sting of his words. They both knew their duty, above all else, was to see the lights. It was not as if she was choosing Goladuin over her uncle. And yet, how often had she attempted to engage uncle in conversation when she was not seeing to the lights? Had he truly not noticed her efforts? Or was Captain Kendrick simply better company than Abigail could ever be? An uncomfortable burning sparked in her stomach. Captain Kendrick's already responded, Uncle. You should not press him. She caught the captain's eyes once again. Yes, and I could not impose, he said. But Uncle was adamant. You would be no imposition at all. Tell him, Abigail. Don't you wish for him to stay with us? Abigail's cheeks warmed. How could she answer such a question? For a brief moment she considered speaking the truth, that Captain Kendricks would be an imposition on their income, their space and their time. But after a firm look from her uncle, she bit her tongue. Drawing a deep breath, she forced a positive tone. Your staying with us would be no imposition at all, Captain. We would be delighted to have you. There, you see? Uncle Ellis said. Captain Kendrick shifted his boots in the sand, clearly uncomfortable with the exchange. She couldn't blame him. She was not a very gifted liar, and Uncle had apparently lost his ability to pick up on social cues. I will accept your offer then, thank you, Captain Kendrick said with a strained smile. I expect to return from Penzance in a day or two. Uncle pumped his head up and down in excitement. Excellent. Wonderful, Abigail managed to murmur. The captain's gaze lingered on Abigail for a moment before he took a step back. I do apologise, but I must take my leave now. My men are awaiting my instruction. He bowed, his eyes lingering on Abigail for a moment longer. Then he turned and walked away. 
As Uncle rattled on about his excitement over the man's approaching stay, Abigail watched Captain Kendricks depart. He was a man that deserved respect, to be sure. A true, thoughtful gentleman. His visit would no doubt do Uncle much good. And yet, for some reason, dread weighed heavily on Abigail's heart. Change was coming, that much was true, and she was not sure she was ready to receive it. Chapter 8 Two days after the shipwreck, Gavin sat in the inn in St Just, wondering if the meat on his plate was truly fish, or if the cook had simply replaced it with a slab of something moulded from old bread. His lips pulled down with disgust, and he pushed aside the uneaten food. It was just as well. He would be at the lighthouse soon for dinner. He hadn't eaten all day, but he could wait, especially if that meant not becoming ill by eating whatever had been placed before him. At any rate, he was not at the inn to eat. He leaned forward, resting his arms on the table and ignoring the ache in his wound. The room was dark, lit only by a few small windows to one side of the establishment. Grey smoke from pipes lingered in the air around the occupied tables, and a large fire crackled at the side of the room. Hidden behind the bar counter, Gavin silently watched Miles Sanders across the crowded room. The young man sat with cards in one hand and a drink in the other. His blonde hair was tied at the nape of his neck, though most of it hung in strings around his face. His sunken eyes were framed in a greyish purple. Evidence of sleepless nights and hours spent in the dark room gambling. Gavin had not expected to see the boy again after leaving Penzance. The ship had been paid off and the crew had received pay for their time aboard the Valor. So why had Miles returned to St Just? It was not a port town and the boy's only family was his elder brother, who was still imprisoned, awaiting a court-martial in Penzance. Now that a few days had passed since the shipwreck, Gavin's anger had slowly dissipated toward the boy, replaced instead with pity. Sanders was the one behind the destruction of the valour, Gavin was sure of it. Miles was merely a pawn. But it was too late now. Sanders would soon receive a guilty sentence, and Miles would be left to fend for himself. A strange sense of responsibility had settled on Gavin since the shipwreck. He wished to help the boy. But Gavin knew Miles would not accept help from anyone, least of all the man he blamed for the capture of his only brother. How was Penzance, Captain? Gavin glanced up as Lieutenant Harris approached with a drink in his hand. Are you a free man? It would appear so, Gavin responded. He motioned to the seat across from him, and Harris sat down. I was astonished the Admiralty pardoned me so quickly. This is because you were not at fault for the shipwreck, sir. Fortunately for Gavin, the Admiralty had thought the same. Gavin had met with them to answer for the destruction of the Valor, and with the help of his shipmates and his otherwise untarnished reputation, he'd been proven blameless in the disaster. But then was he truly blameless if he could have done more to prevent the shipwreck? As Harris drank a swig from his glass, Gavin's eyes wandered again to Miles, as the boy ran trembling fingers through his greasy hair. If only Gavin had had the foresight to watch over Miles at sea, perhaps the whole tragedy might have been prevented. Harris must have followed Gavin's gaze, for he swallowed and motioned toward Miles with a toss of his head. A local farmer has hired a few men from the Valor, Miles being one of them. Gavin nodded with sudden understanding. Of course, Miles had come back to St. Just to earn funds. Since he would not be returning to sea without his brother, the boy would need some way to provide himself with a living. Unless, of course, he gambled all of it away first. Shouts echoed throughout the tavern, and two men stood from Miles' table, both accusing the other of cheating. A large man with black hair that stretched across the length of his arms reached for both men and dragged them straight out of the inn by their collars. A few men cheered, but Miles remained seated, silently staring at the cards strewn across the table. 
He will end up in the same place as his brother if he carries on in here, Gavin said as the commotion ended. What is the latest regarding Sanders? Harris asked. Gavin glanced sidelong at the boy as more cards were dealt across the table. The court-martial will take place in a week or two. But I've heard that Sanders will assume full responsibility for tampering with the anchor cables and starting the fire. Harris lowered his drink, even though he could not have done either while shackled. Gavin shrugged a shoulder. I suppose his conscience has finally appeared, and he wishes to protect his brother. His sentence will surely be death, but Miles won't be charged. Can anything be done for the boy? asked Harris, to ensure a better life for him. I'm certain any attempt to help will be used as kindling on an already blazing fire, Gavin responded. More shouting came from across the room, and Miles flew off his chair, knocking it to the ground as he spewed a string of curses at the men seated around him. He threw his cards onto the table, gulped down the last of his drink and tossed the empty cup to the floor before bolting toward the door. Perhaps the boy was past help, or perhaps Gavin would find a way to support him yet. Either way, he would need Heaven's help. With a shake of his head, he turned to his friend. So, Harris, what are you to do while you are on approved leave? Harris touched his sling with his opposite hand. I will stay in St. Just until I am fit for travel, I suppose. Then I'll make for Penzance and remain there until I'm fully healed and ready to join another ship. Not to your mother's, then. Harris scoffed. I hardly think that would be wise, seeing as how she was the one who first pushed me into the Navy. Gavin chuckled. He'd heard many tales of Harris's youth, filled with wild and reckless behaviour. And yet, the lieutenant had proven a most reliable sailor and friend for Gavin over the five years they had served together. What of your own plans, sir? Gavin hesitated. He hadn't told anyone yet. It was so recent, he'd hardly had time to acknowledge it himself. I will be honest with you, Harris. I have submitted my request to retire from the Navy. Harris pulled back with widened eyes. Sir? I had no idea you were even considering retirement. Gavin nodded. I've been thinking about doing so for quite some time. But the shipwreck solidified my desires. I feel that something... Well, that something is missing from my life. Something that cannot be filled by the sea. Harris nodded, his green eyes suddenly shining. I see. So... You are in search of something that is missing, are you? I suppose you will find that something when you return to your brother's home, then. He paused with a feigned frown. Then a knowing smile crossed his face. Oh, no, that's right. You aren't going to stay with him. You're staying at the lighthouse with Mr. Moore and his niece. He accentuated the last word with a raised brow. Gavin rubbed his jaw in an attempt to ignore Harris's teasing. You heard about that then, did you? The whole crew did, sir. I must say, we have all been rather envious that you are to spend more time with the woman of the lighthouse. Auburn hair flashed through Gavin's memories. He couldn't deny the fact that he looked forward to seeing Miss Moore again. After all, she was an intriguing woman. But he wished to see her again out of pure curiosity and nothing more. I assure you, I am staying at Goladuin merely to visit with an old friend of my father's, not to spend more time with Miss Moore. Harris smiled. You may continue to tell yourself that, sir, but we all know the truth. Gavin shook his head in amusement. Even though he was looking forward to his visit with Mr. Moore, he regretted being pushed into accepting the offer. Miss Moore had clearly disapproved no doubt from their lack of space at Goladuin, but Gavin had already determined to do anything he could to earn his keep. Harris emptied the last of his drink and leaned forward to place his glass on the table. Well, visiting Mr. Moore or his niece, I do hope you enjoy your time there. Perhaps you will find what you are in search of, even if that is a bit of rest. Heaven knows you deserve it. 
The word reverberated within Gavin's mind, and his face fell. Rest. He did not want rest, nor did he need it. He enjoyed freedom as much as the next man. But he far preferred a life of good, honest work than leading a tedious existence. Would leaving the Navy force him to do so? Or would he be able to find something far more fulfilling? Lionel would no doubt welcome him home, but the very idea of living with his brother again, of returning to the county where he grew up, and having women clamber after him now that he'd made a name for himself, it was more than unappealing. With his unsettling thoughts continuing, Gavin bade farewell to Harris and quit the inn, setting off for Goladuin astride his newly acquired horse. He needed one now that he was landbound. Landbound. Such an idea should have been more off-putting for Gavin. But as he rode toward the sea, the weight on his shoulders lifted. Being surrounded by this land, by Cornwall and the ocean, was hardly disheartening. It was inspiring. He'd been to the county before, at various port towns, but never for leisure. The green countryside was broken up by wild grass and grey tors. Bees hummed above the yellow gauze near the cliff's edge, and the ocean sparkled behind the flowers in the early evening sunlight. In the distance, Goladuin Lighthouse came into view. The light brown building backed up onto the cliffside behind it, creating a rather quaint sight. The paint was chipped, the roof was in desperate need of repair, and cracks tainted nearly every window of the small home. But Gavin could not deny the charming allure of the structure. Such a sight did not answer his questions about his future, but it certainly eased the discomfort of his uncertainty, at least for a moment. Chapter 9 Abigail tossed another forkful of manure into the wheelbarrow behind her, ignoring the ache in her lower back. Brilliant sunshine seeped through the cracks of the stable's wooden walls, highlighting the particles of hay that floated around her, shimmering in the light. A breeze flowed in through the open doors, bringing with it the sound of the waves below. She could almost imagine she was walking on the beach, the sand soft against her bare feet, the water licking her legs. But as the scent of manure drifted beneath her nose, reality settled in once more. It was just as well. She could not dawdle if she was going to finish cleaning out the extra stall before Captain Kendricks arrived. He'd brought up his trunk to the house, most of the contents remarkably undamaged from the shipwreck, before he'd left for Penzance, promising to return in two days' time with a horse of his own. Abigail had worked continuously since then in preparation for his stay, cleaning the sitting room, purchasing food they could not afford, and moving her uncle's belongings to the study, so Captain Kendricks might have the bigger room as his own. On top of all that, she had still managed to look after the lamps, the animals, the cooking, and the regular cleaning, though the stables and a few of her other chores had been neglected. She placed another pile of soiled hay into the wheelbarrow, just as a horse nickered outside of the stables. Her stomach tossed and she fought the urge to shake her skirts free of the hay clinging to the fabric. She needn't portray herself as more proper than she was. Good evening, Captain, she greeted, as this long shadow appeared down the centre of the stables. She did not pause in her work, nor did she look up at him, but from the corner of her eye, she could see Captain Kendrick stop in the doorway, his horse just behind him. Miss Moore, what are you doing? She scooped up a pile of manure. I should think that rather obvious, sir. He blinked, shaking his head. No, I know what you are doing. I mean, why are you doing it? Because I do not think our horses would appreciate standing in their own filth. He paused. But surely you should not be the one seeing about such a task. She finally stopped, straightening to face him as the throbbing in her lower back eased only slightly. He stood tall and stately in the stable entryway, the golden light from outside shining at the edges of his blue captain's jacket. Unfortunately, unless my uncle's knees heal overnight, or my horse sprouts fingers of her own, 
I am the only one who can do it. She went back to work, only to pause again when Captain Kendricks tied his horse near the entryway and removed his jacket. Well, now you have someone else to help you. Her brow furrowed as he approached. The ridges in his forearm shifted as he rolled up his sleeves. I hardly think my uncle would wish for his guests to take part in such a demeaning task. But he would wish for his niece to do the same? It had not bothered uncle this far, had it? She cleared her throat. Why do you not see yourself into the lighthouse, Captain? My uncle is anxious to see you. He has spoken of little else but your stay. Her words sounded far more bitter than she'd intended, so she lightened them with a smile. Frustration had been smouldering within her chest since Uncle had invited Captain Kendricks to stay. Not only had her workload doubled, again, but Uncle had yet to express his gratitude for her efforts. He was too focused on touting Captain Kendricks' many amiable qualities. I will seek him out in a moment, Captain Kendricks said, heading toward the tools propped up in the corner of the stables. She narrowed her eyes. Why was he so adamant that he help her? I really am capable of accomplishing the task on my own, sir. I've done so countless times before. He joined her with a spade. I have no doubt. Then why do you insist on helping me? She asked. Because my mother taught me to never leave a lady in distress. He bent over his tool, his arms extended. Then his face paled as he favoured his left side. His wound was paining him, no doubt. Out of the both of us, I would say you are the one in distress, she said, motioning to his arm. Her comment produced a half-smile on his lips. You really should not be exerting yourself in such a way, sir. Suppose your wound worsens. I'll see that it doesn't. As if he could promise such a thing. Still, he seemed more than determined to help her. She tossed a forkful of hay into the wheelbarrow, then noted his wincing again. Really, sir, I am quite fine on my own out here. Cleaning horse manure hardly causes me distress. I am quite certain most women would disagree with you, he countered. Well, that was true. Still, Abigail had no great aversion to mucking out a horse's stall, though she hardly counted down the hours to do it. Captain Kendricks continued, despite his wound, working efficiently at the opposite side of the stall. She tilted her head to one side as she watched him. I am surprised a gentleman such as yourself knows how to clean up after a horse. He glanced at her sidelong. Had her words been too harsh? She hadn't meant them to be. I may be a gentleman by birth, Miss Moore, but I am a sailor at heart. A sailor who has worked for everything he has earned in the last decade. His words struck a chord within her. She understood more than he knew, but she did not wish to discuss her past. She never did. She began cleaning her side of the stool once more. How old were you when you enlisted in the Navy? Fifteen. I did so right after my parents' deaths. Abigail eyed him. May I ask how they died? Of course. They were stricken with the same fever and died days apart. Her heart twisted. He must have loved his parents, as most children did. To have them both pass so soon after another would have been unimaginably difficult. However, she had no way of knowing the man's grief, for her own experience was quite different. I'm sorry. He gave her a grateful nod. Thank you. It was difficult at the time but I joined the Navy as a way to escape. Did it work? His lips curved. It did. Abigail nodded, focusing on the nearly cleaned hay. She did not know why, but learning more about this man was fascinating. Besides, the more questions she asked of him, the less questions he would ask about her and her past. Have you any siblings? She asked next. Yes. One elder brother. And did he join the Navy too? No. Lionel married months before our parents' deaths. Even if he had been unattached, though, he would never have joined the Navy. He doesn't see the appeal of living at sea. He straightened, 
rolling out his shoulder as he faced her. He always wanted me to continue my schooling and join the clergy as my parents had wished. For some reason, the image of the captain preaching from the pulpit with his strong jaw and captivating eyes caused Abigail great amusement. She could hardly imagine any woman in his congregation learning much from his sermons. They would be far too distracted. I'm sure I may safely assume that profession did not take. Not in the least, he replied. I knew my family wished it, but the mere thought of sitting indoors all day, poring over scripture, preaching and divining God's will for his people, was enough to scare me away from the occupation for good. Adventures on the high seas sounded far more appealing to my young adventurous mind. Abigail leaned against the pitchfork, her hand curling around the handle as he continued. When the clergy didn't take, he said, Lionel attempted to convince me to seek out a profession in the law, or even take on work at Clowey Hall, our family estate. But in the end, he knew I had my heart set on the Navy. So he signed for me, despite protesting every step of the way. And has he yet accepted your choice? she asked. He tipped his head back and forth, moving to the pile of fresh straw nearby. Quickly she stepped to his side, helping him carry the hay as he favoured his left arm again. I suppose he has, but with two children of his own, a wife and an estate to run, I doubt he has much time to care about my chosen profession. Will you see him again while you are awaiting reassignment? she asked, spreading the straw across the floor. Or have you taken official leave due to your wound? He straightened, resting his right hand on his upper left arm. I'm certain I'll see him at some point, but I... He paused, releasing a little chuckle. I am to retire from the Navy. She pulled back. Captain Kendricks could only be a few years older than she was. She did not know of many men who willingly retired in the height of their career. What will you do then? She asked. I've not yet decided. Seeing my brother is surely on the list, but after that... He shrugged, dropping the straw to the floor and scattering it around with his boot. He continued in a soft tone, as if he was not aware he still spoke aloud. My life at sea was curative. I was able to process my parents' deaths and progress more than I would have in any other profession. Nothing can compare to life aboard a ship. But then, nothing can compare to the loneliness I felt as a sea captain. How many more things could this man say that she understood so deeply? Her own circumstances at Goladuan could certainly keep up with the feelings of seclusion he must have experienced. But this man certainly would not wish to listen to her own hardships. Captain Kendrick swept his eyes across the clean hay. At any rate, I wished for a different life. A better life. He ended with a smile in her direction. With any luck, I will find that life. Their eyes met, and Abigail managed to smile in return, before darting her gaze away. She had been completely engaged in her conversation with him. But why? Typically, she abhorred forced remarks between near strangers. Exchanging trite words with outsiders was practically horrifying. And yet, she hardly knew this captain. What was it about him that put her at such ease that she could listen to him as if they were old friends? Now, Miss Moore, he began, you have heard about my life. Tell me something about yours. She stiffened. Well... That comfort was short-lived. He looked at her expectantly, but Abigail hesitated. Oh, there is certainly nothing of interest that has occurred in my life, I assure you. That cannot be true. You live in a lighthouse, after all. When she said nothing, he continued. May I ask how you came to live here? Her mind raced. What could she say without revealing the past she had worked so hard to forget? My uncle and I are each other's only living relatives, so he brought me here to live with him. So your parents have passed away as well, 
he asked next. She nodded, praying he did not attempt to commiserate with her. From what she understood, his mother and father were very loving, and hers were not. And you have no siblings? No, I do not. She looked at the stall floor, desperately searching for something to distract her thoughts from swirling into her past. Did you live with your uncle elsewhere before coming to Goladuin? He asked. No, I was at a boarding school until I was nine years old. And did you enjoy it there? He pressed. The captain had to know she was uncomfortable. Why did he carry on so? It was overcrowded. That was the nicest thing she could think of to describe the school she had so despised. Memories from her childhood crept through the lock cage she kept them in, and her chest tightened. She needed an escape before he could think of anything else to ask her. Thank you for helping me, Captain, she said, walking outside of the stall. Miss Moore, he called after her. She stopped with her hand on the stall door. I can only imagine the amount of work you must have, and I know my staying here will not make your life easier. So, I should like to offer my services to you. If you need help with anything, please do not hesitate to ask. Abigail did not know how to respond. She could not deny that she needed help at the lighthouse, and that Captain Kendrick's stay had produced more work for her. But how could she accept his help when he was supposed to be their guest? Furthermore, if he did help, how could she go on when he would inevitably depart? leaving her in the same exhausted manner she had grown accustomed to. Rather than accepting his offer or making any decision at all, she simply muttered her gratitude, then excused herself. As she approached the stable doors, however, something within her made her pause. He'd been very kind to help her with the stables, and to offer to help her even more. And though she had no intention of taking them up on his offer, she could be kind in return. She turned, focusing on him from across the stables. Captain? He raised his gaze to meet hers. I must say, I believe that your parents would be proud of the decision you made to join the Navy. You fought to keep others safe, and that is a noble profession. Though I cannot blame you for wishing for more in life. I hope you will find that, whatever it may be. His eyes softened and he smiled with a hint of curiosity. No doubt wondering where the kind words had come from. In fact, she was having trouble knowing the answer to that question herself. Instead of dwelling on it any more, however, she simply nodded her head, then darted from the stables and scurried across the grass to the lighthouse. She had dinner to see to, and kind words wouldn't scrub the potatoes themselves. Chapter 10 Abigail had not seen her uncle smile so often in months. She understood the reasoning behind his high spirits, for who could not be happy when in conversation with Captain Kendricks? Throughout dinner that evening, even she lost track of how often she stared in his direction, listening intently to the stories he shared, his brown eyes bright as he spoke of his love for the sea. You are like your father in that regard, Captain. Uncle Ellis said, sharing his own memories of the departed Mr. Kendricks. Despite listening to every word, Abigail struggled to join the conversation. After all, she did not have extraordinary tales of battles on a ship, nor memories she could share of the captain's father and uncle's friend. At any rate, she was certain uncle would not even hear her if she did attempt to speak up. After the meal, though, Uncle Ellis asked Abigail to join them in the sitting room. In an effort to prove she was just as entertaining and interesting as the captain, she set aside her chores and engaged in the discussion as best she could, though her feelings of inadequacy continued. The topic focused on Captain Kendrick's family before the subject of Goladuin surfaced, and Abigail's mood finally improved, especially when the captain leaned forward in his seat with interest. I admit, he said, I have always been intrigued by the workings of lighthouses. Perhaps it is due to the many times they have kept me from danger while at sea. 
Uncle Ellis propped his hands beneath his chin, his cane lying forgotten on the floor. Have you seen the lamps up close in any of them? No, I have never had the opportunity, the captain responded. Well, I would take you up Goladuin myself, Uncle Ellis said. But after my latest excursion, I fear my knees would not last. His eyes did not reflect the familiar gloom Abigail had become so accustomed to. Instead, they shone with excitement. But you would be more than welcome to join my niece this evening as she lights them. Abigail opened her mouth in surprise, unable to hide her apprehension. She'd been alone with the gentleman before, but going up to the watch room with the captain alone seemed different somehow. Perhaps because there would be an entire set of stairs between them both and uncle, instead of just a room. At any rate, ensuring that the lamps remained lit was their top priority. Had uncle forgotten? Bringing Captain Kendricks up there would surely provide an unwanted distraction. Not that he was a distraction, of course. I wouldn't wish to interfere with your work, the captain said, having clearly seen her hesitance. At least one of the men seated before her had sense. Uncle Ellis waved a dismissive hand. Nonsense. Abigail would be delighted to show you. After all, there is no one who knows the inner workings of Goluduin better than my niece. Abigail nearly fell off her seat. Had her uncle just paid her a compliment? Perhaps taking the captain to see the lamps wouldn't be so very bad after all. I would be happy to show you, Captain. After retrieving a pail of oil from the large vats in the oil hutch outside, they made their way up the spiral staircase. Abigail held the pail in one hand and her skirts in the other, leading the way. The captain's boots thumped against the iron steps as he followed her. After a moment, she paused briefly to switch the oil to the other hand, thick working gloves protecting her fingers. May I hold the oil for you? Captain Kendricks offered as they continued up the steps. Abigail recalled their previous conversation in the stables. He was being a gentleman by offering his help, but she was still uneasy. After all, it had been some time since she had received any help at all around the lighthouse. Momentum was all that kept her going each day, all that prevented her from crumbling under the constant back-breaking work. If she yielded, even for the brief time the captain was their guest, it would only allow her to realise just how tired she was. She may never make pace again. Thank you, she said, but I am accustomed to the task. They reached the first window of the tower as their breathing grew heavy. Sunshine shone forth through the glass, lighting the spire in a hazy orange and yellow. How often are you required to climb these steps? Captain Kendricks asked. Every three to four hours, dependent upon when the lamps are to remain lit. Abigail replied. She did not mind speaking about the workings of the lighthouse with anyone. She could talk for hours on the topic. Besides, doing so now distracted her from the fact that the two of them were becoming more and more alone. Uncle obviously had no qualms with it, so neither would she. At any rate, their walking together was far less intimate than when she had cleaned his wound. At least the captain was clothed this time. She cleared her throat. I must light them a half hour before sunset and extinguish them a half hour after sunrise. When it storms, though, we keep them lit until the weather passes. We also like to remain upstairs during the storms as a precaution to spot ships faster or relight the lamps if one or two of them burn out. She swapped the oil to her other hand. May I ask why you do not bring two pails at a time to save yourself a future jaunt? I do on occasion, usually when I can tie up these cumbersome skirts. She waved her hand, clutching the fabric of her dress. But with two pails it is more difficult to allow one arm a respite. Not to mention it is nearly impossible to receive any rest in the watch room on account of it being far too cold. So, I may as well go downstairs again to sleep for a few hours. He didn't respond. She wondered if he was focusing on his breathing instead, a thought that pleased her far too greatly. 
She would have been terribly upset had the captain been able to make it up the steps his first time, without becoming winded. When they reached the halfway point, Abigail paused on the small landing. Would you appreciate a rest? His broad chest rose and fell with deep breaths. I would, indeed. It is remarkable you make the climb so often. She placed the oil at her feet and rubbed her gloved hands together to remove the creases the pale handle had caused in her skin. Practice certainly helps. I've been uncle's assistant for nearly eight years now, ever since he removed the prior help. When most girls Abigail's age were celebrating their coming out, attending their first seasons in London, 15-year-old Abigail had been watching over a lighthouse by herself. Even still, if she had the chance to go back, she would choose the latter. Why was the previous assistant removed? Captain Kendricks asked. His hands rested on his hips, his breathing growing steadier. He was found sleeping during a storm when he was on duty. Uncle was furious. It was just as well, though, as we couldn't afford to keep him on any longer. We lost our cook, maid, and a stable hand for the same reason. We... She stopped. Had she completely taken leave of her senses, sharing things that did not need sharing? She glanced toward the captain. His watchful eyes were on her as he waited for her to continue. But she couldn't. Captain Kendricks was certainly not interested in their hardships at the lighthouse, nor did she need to open up to him so greatly. Having his listening ear would just make it harder when he left her alone to Uncle Ellis's silence. She retrieved the pail of oil and straightened. Shall we continue? Then she moved up the stairs without waiting his response. Gavin followed behind Miss Moore in silence. She clearly regretted speaking of the financial state of Goladuan, so he allowed their conversation to drop. But questions about the woman still swirled about his mind. Why did she always appear hesitant when speaking of her past? How had they gone from being able to afford servants to what he assumed was barely having enough funds for themselves? And how on earth was she so strong as to march up the steps as quickly as she did, in a dress with a pail of oil in her hands? These questions and more continued as they neared the final steps. Gavin fought the urge to hold his aching side. He had been a hard-working sailor for fifteen years, yet he was veritably gasping for air. Willing his breathing to remain even, he followed Miss Moore into a small room at the top of the tower. The sun shone in through the window facing the sea, and a small set of stairs curled up in the centre of the room, reaching a trapdoor in the ceiling. Nearby, a wooden bowl with a crooked piece of old meat rested on top of a table a table that appeared to be on its last legs as it leaned up against the wall. Miss Moore picked up a broom that was lying on the floor and propped it up against a wall. A pretty blush reddened her cheeks. I did not have time to straighten up. It is no matter, he said. The last thing the woman should have to worry about was keeping up an appearance for his sake. He studied her for a moment the pink on her cheeks only heightening her delicate features. A slightly turned-up nose, high cheekbones and long, dark eyelashes. She certainly was beautiful. There was no denying that. But there was something else, something more than her physical appearance, that pulled Gavin toward her. Was it her strength and resolve to save others, himself included? or her tenacity to prove herself capable of accomplishing any task? Or was it because they were alone, unchaperoned, and Miss Moore did not even seem to bat a single eye in hesitation, focusing instead on her duty to her lighthouse? Before, when she dressed his wound and when he'd helped her clean out the stables, the pain in his arm had been so acute, he'd barely noticed they were alone. But now with the woman standing before him, her auburn hair glinting in the warm glow of the sun, his heart struggled to maintain its steady beating. Her blue eyes flashed in his direction, and he pulled his gaze away, 
focusing instead on a few worn books splayed out across the small cot at the side of the room. Excellent. Something with which to distract himself. So you enjoy reading? he asked. She cleared her throat. I do. Although I have exhausted all of those. Trinity House will be sending more soon, I believe. Trinity House, Gavin repeated. He recognised the name as the governing body for most of the lighthouses in England. They purchase new books for you to read? No, she replied. They lend us prior used copies. It would certainly be more enjoyable to read a novel that did not have missing pages, but we manage fine enough. Their conversation paused as Miss Moore led the way to the smaller set of stairs, and Gavin followed her up the steps, joining her at the top. A large structure housing the lamps was set in the centre of the room, surrounded by glass panels. She placed the oil on the floor by her side and reached forward, filling the lamps one by one from the spout at the end of a small tin cup that she had filled with oil. These are Argand lamps, she said. They shine brighter and last longer than the ones we had prior. It is not difficult to fill them, but with one and twenty it can be tedious, especially when oil spills must be cleaned up. Gavin watched in silence as she filled each lamp, noting the concentration on her brow. He knew better than to speak and interrupt her work. After the lamps were filled, she produced a tinderbox from a small chest at the side of the room and went about lighting each lamp. The wicks must be trimmed often to prevent soot from loosening and dirtying the glass. She waved a finger around the room. And the windows must be cleaned daily, inside and out, by using the gallery. Gavin eyed the small, exposed platform surrounding the outside of the lamp room she motioned to. The landing hardly seemed sturdy, and his stomach tightened at the thought of the platform giving away or a simple misguided step from Miss Moore that could prove deadly. How did her uncle bear the thought of her doing such a task each day? His attention returned to Miss Moore as she stood to remove the coverings of three curved silver pieces positioned behind the lamps. Gavin squinted as the light brightened with each cover that was removed. These are refractors, she explained. As you can see, they reflect the lamps allowing the light to become brighter. They must be covered when not in use to protect the silver coating, thereby allowing the best reflection. Gavin shook his head in awe. It is remarkable. He tilted his head to one side. But how do they rotate? Come, I will show you. She led the way back to the watch room below where a metal structure stuck out from the floor behind the small set of stairs. She placed her hands on the wheel at the top of the metalwork. This must be turned each time we refill the lamps. Below is a weight that slowly pulls down, causing the gears of the clockwork mechanism to rotate. And, in turn, it moves the lamps upstairs. When the weight reaches the bottom, the rotation stops. Is it heavy? he asked. She stepped away and motioned him toward the structure. You may see for yourself if you like. Surprised with her offer, he took a step forward to turn the wheel. It barely moved a finger's width. Oh, it is heavy. He pressed harder before the wound in his arm protested with a sharp pierce. I think I will allow you to finish, otherwise I may need you to see to my wound again. He noticed the slightest curve of her lips as he stepped aside, watching her crank the wheel around. When the work was completed, they stood together in front of the window, staring at the brilliant white sun resting on the horizon between the ocean and clouds. The work you do is simply remarkable, Miss Moore, Gavin said. You must feel deeply satisfied to live in such a place of beauty and with such a purpose. I do. He studied her for a moment. Does your uncle feel the same way? Instantly, a shadow crossed over her features. I believe he did at one time. He spent years researching what county in England was in need of a lighthouse most. He decided on Cornwall for the beauty of the location and the kindness of the people. 
Moving from inn to inn, he spoke with locals and officials until he finally decided upon Julatha Cliffs. Then he used his own living to fund the construction of it. Everyone thought he was mad, yet he surprised them all with how well he took to his duties. But now, her brow furrowed, now he cannot do any of what was once required of him. Gavin hesitated. He'd seen the sheer amount of work Miss Moore did, especially in comparison to her uncle. Did he not help because of some injury? The same injury that caused him to use a cane? May I ask why Mr. Moore uses a cane to walk now? She reached up, rubbing the back of her neck. Her other arm crossed over her stomach. Last September, he fell from the gallery. It was only a short distance, and he was tethered to the top with a rope, but he swung toward the tower and landed against his knees. Gavin winced. So the man was out of commission. How had Miss Moore managed to maintain the lighthouse on her own for nine months? Knowing such a fact only multiplied his desire to help her. Has he improved at all since? He can now walk, when before even that was painful for him, but stairs and inclines are still difficult. She lowered her voice, as if her uncle could hear her words. He does little else but read and sleep while I tend to the lighthouse. Of course, I cannot blame him for having no energy or desire to do much, as his spirits have been brought so very low. But it, it is difficult to maintain the workload. She glanced at him sidelong. I suppose that is why it will be good for us to have you here, to remind us both that there is life beyond his injury. Their eyes met, and a strange vulnerability flashed across her face before she looked away. We had better return to him now. He will be wondering what is keeping us. She gave him a fleeting look before leading the way back down the stairs. And Gavin followed her in silence once again, wondering what it would take to finally get the woman to speak about herself without brushing her feelings aside in the very next moment. Chapter 11 Abigail wasn't sure if it had been the kindness the captain had shown her or his keen interest in the lighthouse that had caused her to share her weaknesses. Either way, she regretted her honesty, for Captain Kendricks had become relentless in his offers of help. No, they were no longer offers. They were actions. Each morning, by the time she returned from seeing to the lamps, she would be greeted with the stables already cleaned, the hen's eggs gathered, and one more thing that needed fixing mended. He also helped with setting the table for meals, maintaining fires and hearths, and cleaning up Uncle's books left in various places around the house. What was even more frustrating than his help was the fact that his help, well, helped. As such, maintaining her workload when he left would be made all the harder. Uncle, of course, could hardly understand her plight. When she spoke to him of Captain Kendrick's unrelenting aid, he would merely smile and say, What a thoughtful gentleman. With such a reaction, Abigail had first suspected that Uncle had brought the captain to Goladuin as a potential suitor for her, but she'd swiftly set aside the ridiculous notion. It was clear, what with the amount of time Uncle Ellis spent with Captain Kendricks, that her uncle clearly wished for a friend for himself, a friend that Abigail could never be. The realisation had caused her bitterness to return. She'd done everything for Uncle for so long and was never acknowledged. Captain Kendricks worked for barely quarter of what she did and he was receiving Uncle's praise and attention. Such insecurity was beneath her, but as the days and nights grew longer and her sleep decreased day by day, logic slowly slipped from her fingers. One morning, after days of attempting to avoid both Uncle and Captain Kendricks, Abigail rode for St. Just the moment she extinguished the lamps. She was relieved to be away from the lighthouse, if only to escape Uncle Ellis's constant fawning over the captain, and Captain Kendricks' constant gaze in her direction, as if he were watching to see what she needed help with next. She knew he was doing so to purely help, but in her angered state, 
she couldn't help but wonder. Was he offering his aid because he did not think she could accomplish the tasks on her own? Or had he another reason? Attempting to set aside her frustrations, she meandered through the streets and visited a few shops, before begrudgingly returning to her horse. The longer she put off her chores, the more she would have to see to later. Unless, of course, Captain Kendricks had already seen everything finished. Good morning, Miss Moore. Abigail recognised the captain's deep voice before she even turned around to face him. What was he doing in town? Had she known he was there, she would have never gone to St. Just. Captain Kendrick strode toward her, leading his dark horse behind him. At his side were the Corsies, a young newly wedded couple Abigail had known since childhood. How are you, Miss Moore? Mrs. Corsey asked first, after curtsies and bows. Her blonde ringlets fluttered against her temples, and her dimples deepened as she beamed on the arm of her husband. The two had been married for nearly a year, and still their glow remained. Fine, thank you, Abigail responded. She glanced between the captain and the couple. I did not know the three of you were acquainted. Oh, yes, Mrs. Corsey responded. But only just. Captain Kendricks was kind enough to help Mr. Corsey and I when our carriage became stuck in the mud a few days ago. Because someone insisted on venturing forth in the middle of a storm, Mr. Corsey said, with a wink in his wife's direction. Please, Mr. Corsey, you were just as anxious as I was to go out of doors. Abigail's lip twitched. She had always liked the both of them. Their carefree nature and kindness made her feel more comfortable than most people in St. Just did. Well, we shall not keep you any longer, Miss Moore, Mrs. Corsey said. Lovely to see you again, Captain Kendricks. The Corseys nodded in departure before ambling down the street, their heads close together, as if carrying on a secret conversation for only their ears to hear. Charming couple, Captain Kendricks said. Abigail turned to face him. Yes, they are. They stood in silence for a moment, and Abigail fidgeted with the reins still in her hands. I did not know you were coming to St. Just today he said. I was merely picking up an item for my uncle. She turned around, stroking her horse's roan neck. And what manner of business brings you to town? Just a friendly visit with Lieutenant Harris. He moved a step closer. We were discussing the latest news concerning the Sanders brothers. Abigail tried for indifference, but her interest was piqued. Have their trials been set yet? Captain Kendricks nodded. Miles will remain free, thanks to his brother's decision to take responsibility. But Sanders' trial will be within a week or two, when enough captains are in Penzance to hold the court-martial. Is Miles still upset with you? she asked next. Of course. He stroked the bridge of his black horse's nose. But I do not blame him for his anger. After all, I am responsible for what is to happen to his brother. Abigail pulled in her chin. Surely he was in jest. Both of them behaved freely, Captain. They knew what they were doing. Guilty men ought to take responsibility for their actions. But guilty, you are not. He studied her for a moment, his expression unreadable. Thank you, Miss Moore. Their eyes met, and she looked away with discomfort. Are you to return to Goluduin now? he asked after a moment. If only she could lie. I am. Might we return together then? Abigail chewed the inside of her lip. If she spent more time with the man, she might grow to like him, even more than she already did. But then how could she deny such a harmless request? Finally, she nodded. He moved to her side at once, lacing his fingers together and leaning forward at the side of her horse. She stared blankly for a moment, before realising he was there to help her mount. She muttered a quick thank you, then gingerly placed her foot in his hands. With minimal effort, he hoisted her up, and she situated herself as he moved around his own horse. A voice called his name from nearby, and Abigail turned, 
to see an approaching open-top carriage approaching nearby. She fought very hard not to outwardly groan. Months had passed since Abigail had had the misfortune of being near Mrs. Steadman and her daughter. If only Abigail had left a moment sooner, then she could have avoided the impending unpleasant conversation altogether. It was always, Oh, Miss Moore, you really ought to look into having that uncle of yours pay for a new gown for yourself. Or, Miss Moore, how desperately you are in need of a bonnet. Those freckles. She'd heard it all from Mrs. Steadman, and she certainly wasn't in the mood to hear it today. And yet, as the carriage pulled to a stop, Mrs. Steadman's eyes did not even reach Abigail's. Instead, they settled most determinedly on Captain Kendrick's. Sir, Miss Steadman greeted, what a pleasure it is to see you again. Again? Captain Kendrick's knew the Steadmans. A strange pressure tightened around Abigail's chest. And you, the captain returned. I trust you are both well? Exceptionally well, sir, Miss Steadman responded with batting lashes. Her slow blinking looked just like the mouth of a fish Abigail had caught the day before. We are surprised to still see you here, Captain, Miss Steadman said. We were certain you would have left for your brothers already. No, ma'am he said. I was fortunate enough to have extended my stay for another week or two. Oh, wonderful. In that case, you must dine with us this evening. Mrs. Steadman leaned forward. You know, after we happened upon you at the Reynolds home, my daughter and I have both been quite anxious to seek after your well-being. Happened. Abigail could have scoffed. Mrs. Steadman never happened to do anything. It was far more likely that Mrs. Reynolds, the most gossip-mongering woman in all of St. Just, learned from her husband, Dr. Reynolds, that a captain had been shipwrecked on Goladuin shores. Always ready to pounce on the freshest man for her daughter, Mrs. Steadman must have swooped in on Captain Kendrick swiftly. That is very kind of you to offer, Mrs. Steadman, Captain Kendrick said, but I have already promised to dine with the Moors this evening. Another time, perhaps. Simultaneously, the Steadman slowly shifted their eyes to Abigail's, their looks of interest shifting to irritation. Oh, Miss Moore, Mrs. Steadman began. I did not see you there. Tell me, how are you and your uncle? More than well, ma'am, Abigail answered stiffly. There was nothing she disliked more than rehearsing pleasantries with people she did not wish to speak to especially the Steadmans. Mrs. Steadman's eyes narrowed a fraction. Then she turned to Captain Kendricks. How do you find your stay at the lighthouse, sir? Very enjoyable, he said, so much so that I quite dread having to leave. Abigail knew he answered politely, but she could not deny the satisfaction that swelled within her at the growing annoyance on Mrs. Steadman's face. Lovely, the woman murmured. Oh, Miss Moore, I have heard that you have still been unable to hire a serving girl. You must be positively exhausted, taking on all that menial labour yourself. Poor girl, you really must allow me to help. I'm certain I could find someone willing to work for what little pay you are able to offer. The indignation swirling within Abigail scorched her insides. She glanced to Captain Kendrick's, who appeared unaware of Mrs. Steadman's veiled slight. For some reason, his ignorance bothered her, more than the woman's words. Thank you, Mrs. Steadman, she said, sweeter than even the woman herself had managed. But as always, we are not in need of your help. Or have you forgotten that my uncle told you the very same thing many years ago? Mrs. Steadman's brown eyes hardened, and Abigail knew a sense of satisfaction. Before Mrs. Steadman could receive the upper hand once again, she typically never stopped until she did, Abigail gave a brief nod of departure, then urged Glastache forward into a trot down the street. If Captain Kendricks remained with the Steadmans, then so be it. She'd rather die than spend another moment with those women. Moments later, however, as she reached the outskirts of town, he caught up with her. I thought we were to ride back to Goladuin together. 
Abigail glanced at him sidelong. He sat tall and sure on his steed. Yes, well, I have things I need to attend to, so I did not wish to delay any longer. He nodded, though he hardly seemed convinced. Are you well, Miss Moore? She forced a smile. Indeed. Why would you think differently? Glastay shook her head, the reins jingling as Captain Kendrick spoke. Because of your abrupt departure from the Steadmans. Did they say something to upset you? No. He eyed her in apparent disbelief once again. Very well. He waited a moment. Mrs. Steadman asked me to extend her dinner invitation to you and your uncle as well. Next week at Privily House. Abigail could think of nothing worse than to spend an evening trapped in that woman's home. How very generous of her. Will you accept the invitation then? He asked. She contemplated hiding her disdain for the woman, but to what end? Perhaps explaining to him her reasoning would satisfy him enough to cease his questions once and for all. No, I will not be attending. A beat of silence passed. May I ask why? He asked next. Because there is a history between our families, she replied. Captain Kendricks waited, curiosity clear in his dark eyes. When the lighthouse was first built, she began, and we were newly arrived in Cornwall, Mrs. Steadman pursued my uncle. His eyebrows raised in surprise. Her husband had died two years prior, and as uncle was wealthy and considered quite handsome when he was younger, naturally he caught her eye. What happened between them? The captain questioned. My uncle humoured her cause for weeks. She often hinted that I needed a mother figure if I had any hope of becoming as beautiful as her own daughter. Fortunately, Uncle told her he had no interest in marrying anyone. She was obviously offended, and her visits ended. Understandably, Captain Kendrick said. Is she trying to make amends, do you think, by inviting you both to dinner? Accepting would certainly be a way to mend the gap between your two families. Abigail stared at him with a raised brow. You think that is what she is doing by extending her invitation? He shrugged. Her kindness could hardly be misconstrued. It would be rather unfeeling of you to deny the invitation. She pulled her horse to a stop, staring at him until he halted as well. Unfeeling of me? He stared at her with an innocent expression. I did not mean to cause you offence. I merely... He trailed off as she shook her head. She knew he was not an unkind man, but to have him speak of something he knew nothing about, to make a snap judgment about the woman and Abigail's relationship, it made Abigail's insides curdle. I will not bore you with the details, Captain, but that woman has taken a marked dislike to me ever since Uncle refused her. The rumours she has spread about the both of us are... She ended with an aggravated sigh. Why should she share more about their past when he would believe the Steadman's words over hers anyway? Of course he would take their side. Those women were far more refined than a lowly lighthouse keeper's niece. Miss Moore, I did not mean to upset you. I only meant to... I know precisely what you meant to do, Captain Kendricks, she said, attempting to shrug off his words. She didn't care about his opinion anyway. Or rather, she shouldn't care. She forced a light tone as she continued. You meant to bring our families together. You meant to help. But might I suggest something? He waved a hand for her to proceed. Meddling in the affairs of others only makes matters worse for all involved. I know you were intending well, but you cannot understand all that has occurred between us. My relationship with the Steadmans will never be healed. And I am more than happy to keep it that way. So. If you would be so kind, sir, I would be grateful if you did not assume to know all that is between us. He stared in stunned silence as she finished, and she swallowed the regret she felt for her harsh words. But she would not take them back. They'd needed to be said. They were true, after all. 
Mrs. Steadman was a spiteful, cruel woman, one Abigail was better off without. And, if Captain Kendricks had any intelligent bone in his body, he would steer clear of the woman as well. Chapter 12 After Abigail's lecture, Captain Kendricks had held his tongue the rest of their ride back to Goladuin, leaving Abigail's spirits to rapidly decline. Her regret swiftly shifted to annoyance and anger, however, when Uncle drew instantly to the captain, pulling him into the sitting room and asking him advice over a matter involving Goladuin's lamps. Abigail tried to join in the conversation, but Uncle instantly waved her aside. I will not take up your time, Abigail. I know you will be starting dinner soon enough. Of course, that was true. She would be starting dinner. She would also be cleaning up dinner, then seeing to the lamps, then extinguishing the lamps, then... She shook her head, her frustrated thoughts continuing as the evening progressed. How could Uncle be so cruel? How could he knowingly shut her out of a conversation that involved the lamps of Goladuin and include Captain Kendricks instead? Surely her opinion should be taken into account more than the captain's. What did he know about the lamps anyway? With such thoughts, she could not even stomach seeing the men. She took her dinner in the watchroom, lit the lamps, then went straight for bed, ignoring the fact that Captain Kendricks had annoyingly cleared up dinner. His decision was purely to raise Uncle's estimation of him even more, no doubt. Once in bed, she squeezed her eyes closed, willing sleep to come. But rest eluded her as the gentle hum of Uncle and Captain Kendricks' voices reached her room until well after dark. She folded her arms, staring up at the ceiling. Were they speaking of the lighthouse still? Was Captain Kendricks telling Uncle that Abigail could no longer manage the lighthouse on her own? Uncle would no doubt agree. Perhaps this is what he had been planning all along, to replace her with the better-suited captain, so that Uncle Ellis might retire and she would be forced to assume more ladylike pursuits. She knew her thoughts were outlandish, clearly illogical, and yet her blood boiled. Only after the first refilling of the lamps did Abigail finally fall asleep. She dreamt that Captain Kendricks had married Miss Steadman. After they both moved into the lighthouse, there was no room left for her, so Uncle Ellis sent Abigail to live in the stables where she shoveled manure for the rest of her days. She awoke with a groggy mind, feeling even worse than before. After retrieving the oil, she padded up the stairs for the second refilling. She knew her musings were silly, and her dreams even more so, but her lack of sleep, and Uncle Ellis's doting attention on Captain Kendricks, only magnified her insecurities. With a heavy heart, she entered the watchroom. But she froze when the familiar clang of an empty pail came from the trapdoor above. Guilt lurched in her chest. She had been utterly thoughtless that evening. Uncle Ellis must have finally seen her struggling and wished to ease her burden. The pain he must have felt climbing the steps with that oil. How could he have done such a thing for her? And how could she have been so silly as to think he hadn't noticed her all this time? Footsteps moved to the stairs, descending from the lamp room, and she smiled, intent on greeting Uncle with as much gratitude as possible. Only, they were not Uncle's worn brown boots that appeared. They were black and polished, and belonged to someone else entirely. Her mouth went dry when Captain Kendrick's face came into view. His mouth parted as he reached the bottom step, and he stared at her in silence. Captain Kendricks, her heart constricted. What are you doing? Her eyes travelled down the length of his loose, untucked shirt and rolled up sleeves, before focusing on the empty pail in his hands, the sides still glistening with residual oil. Her tone dropped. What are you doing? She asked again. Captain Kendricks took a step toward her, holding up his free hand as if to tame a wild animal. Her frustration grew. I was only trying to help, Miss Moore, your... Help! Her words came out in a squeak. Logic blurred as rage rose. 
Everything from the few days before crashed down upon her. Exhaustion from her lack of sleep, anger from her interaction with the Steadmans, diffidence from the captain's flowering relationship with her uncle. She couldn't handle it any longer. She couldn't handle any of it. How are you helping, Captain? Her nostrils flared and her lips thinned as she spoke. I have tried greatly to keep quiet about your incessant need to cast your aid about while you are here. But tonight, you have gone too far, sir. If you will only allow me to explain, I... No! She placed her pail of oil on the ground, unable to trust her trembling hands to keep their grip. You do not have the right to be here. The keeping of this lighthouse is not a game in which anyone can play the part of keeper, no matter how well-intentioned. There are lives at stake. You of all people should know that. His brow lowered. I do not consider the safety of this lighthouse, nor my fellow comrades in the Royal Navy, a game to be played. Your cavalier behaviour would suggest otherwise, she returned. After all, you are not trained to refill the lamps. You are not qualified. I am well aware. However, your uncle... My uncle would be appalled to find you up here. He took a step toward her. No, we... What? She interrupted. You what? Dark thoughts surfaced, worries from before escalating until she could no longer keep herself from revealing the fears she had buried deep within her heart. So, this was your plan all along. Is this why you took such interest in the lighthouse? Is this why you've sought a friendship with Uncle Ellis? Confusion creased his brow. What do you mean? As if you do not know. She scoffed. Was she speaking aloud? She couldn't be certain as panic took hold of her senses and she continued. Your behaviour, your interest in Goloduan, all of this was to show him how much better you are than me. All of this was to take my place here. He drew back with a look of disbelief. That is not what. Yes, it is. You intend to find purpose in running my lighthouse, to push me out so you might fill the days of your naval retirement with something more satisfying than living at sea. What other reason have you to be up here other than to prove to my uncle that you are more capable than his own niece in looking after Goloduan? He stared at her, aghast. I cannot believe you are serious. Blood rushed in her ears. She could hardly hear him. She could hardly think. I am, and I want you to leave Gulladuin, Captain. His brow lowered, as if he finally accepted the fact that she was in earnest. You are truly requesting for me to leave? She raised her chin, ignoring her thoughts that told her to keep her mouth shut. The only way to secure her own future at Gulladuin was to send this man home. So that is exactly what she would do. Yes, I want you gone by the morning, and I do not ever wish to see you here again. You have forfeited your right to be here and to befriend my uncle any longer with your overbearing behaviour. He took an abrupt step toward her. She nearly faltered in her footing, but she continued to face him squarely. Their eyes met, the light from the lamp room casting a low glow around them. She eyed the dark shadows across his face anger flashing in his eyes. I have done nothing but help you, Miss Moore, he said. His deep voice was so penetrating that she finally heard every word. And now you command me to leave? His eyes darted back and forth between hers, flickering to her lips, and her breath caught in her throat. You shall have your wish. You will not see me again. He thrust the pail into her hands, the handle clanking loudly against the side. The sound reverberated through the room as he shook his head and strode past her. Abigail listened to his angry footsteps stomping down the stairs. When the noise disappeared, she was alone with the metal gears working below, the light rotating above, and Captain Kendrick's words swirling within her soul. And all at once, Abigail was overcome with a sense of grief. She could not understand. 
Chapter 13 But why must you leave so soon, Captain? A few matters have come up that I cannot ignore any longer. Abigail listened to the conversation with bated breath. She had come down from the lamp straight away that morning, intent on ensuring Captain Kendricks had left as he had promised. But when she had heard his voice, along with her uncle's, drifting up the spiral staircase from the front door, she had paused on the steps, higher up, to listen unobserved. Is it something I have done? she heard her uncle ask. Guilt turned her stomach. After a restless night spent in the watch room, Abigail had come to her senses regarding her uncle, and she scolded her lack of confidence in him. Of course he would not replace her. He would never do anything to harm her in such a way. But the captain? She hardly knew him, did she? No, you haven't, sir. Captain Kendrick said. The, the trial I must attend has been moved to next week. And I think it would be better if I stayed near Penzance, that is all. Abigail knew why he lied. If Uncle Ellis had been the one to discover Captain Kendricks last night, her uncle would have turned him out, just as she had done. Never mind that the captain had trimmed the wicks to perfection and had not spilled a single drop of oil in his endeavours, something that irked Abigail endlessly. The man had risked the safety of those men at sea, and that was something Uncle Ellis would not take lightly. Can you not at least wait for my niece to come down? You two have become friends, after all. Abigail took a single step down, hoping to better hear the captain's response. I, I think it will be better for us all if I leave now, he said. Very well, Uncle Ellis finally conceded. I'm sorry to see the last of you, though. Is there any way I may convince you to join us for one last dinner this evening? Dinner? Abigail did not want to make dinner for the man. Perhaps we may dine at the Golden Arms, Captain Kendricks suggested. You know my niece's cooking far surpasses anything you will eat there. No, you must come here. She heard the captain sigh. Very well. I will return for dinner this evening but I would greatly appreciate it if you would inform Miss Moore that I will depart immediately afterward. Of course, she will be delighted to see you before you leave. Captain Kendricks didn't respond. Abigail heard the front door open. Footsteps shuffled forward. Mr. Moore, the captain said, I must thank you for inviting me to stay with you. I've enjoyed every moment. The tales you've shared of my father the conversations I've had with you and your... your niece. I will miss you both. Abigail rested her hand on the railing to keep her steady, regret pressing hard against her conscience. But she should not feel regret. She should feel nothing but relief that the man was leaving. You are a good man, Captain, Uncle Ellis said, just like your father. Silence passed for a brief moment before the captain's voice faded as he stepped outside. I will arrange for my trunk to be retrieved and sent to the inn. And please, do remember to tell your niece that I will depart directly, after the meal tonight. Abigail remained on the steps until she heard the door close. The captain's departure had not given her the satisfaction for which she had hoped. So she sought out her uncle. His support for her decision to remove the man would help her to feel better. She was almost sure of it. She reached the bottom of the spiral stairs just as she caught sight of Uncle Ellis entering the sitting room. She followed him, pausing in the doorway as he sat down on a seat with a groan. Abigail, he greeted when he saw her. You've just missed Captain Kendricks. He has decided to leave us today. She swallowed hard. Yes, uncle, I... She faltered when she caught sight of the tears shining in his eyes. Uncle Ellis? Forgive me, my dear. He used his palms to swipe at his eyes. It is silly, but his departure has upset me more than I thought it would. I cannot help but fear that my own actions have caused him to leave. Perhaps my conversation was too dull. Abigail's hands wrung together. I'm certain that is not why he left, uncle. 
then what else could it be? She hesitated, though she knew not why. After all, the captain had been in the wrong, not she. No, she could not allow her uncle to hurt further. He deserved to know the truth. Uncle, I must tell you what occurred last night, she said. You see, I woke up to refill the lamps, only to discover that the captain had already done so himself. She waited a moment, allowing her words to sink in. But Uncle Ellis looked more cheerful than anything. You caught him in the very act, then, he said. Oh, I was hoping for it to be a surprise. An uneasy feeling crept up within her. A surprise? What do you mean? Well, I thought his helping would ease your burden. Her thoughts moved rapidly. She held a hand against the doorframe. Uncle, I do not understand. Did you... Did you ask the captain to refill the lamps? Indeed. Though that was not my original intention. I'd planned to do so myself, but I only made it a few steps before my knees gave way. Thankfully, I had managed to set the oil aside before it could spill down the steps. Uncle Ellis, why did you not call for help? I did, he said. You must have slept through the noise, but it was just as well. Captain Kendrick soon came and helped me back to my room. Abigail's cheeks burned. And then he offered to look after the lamps in your stead. Oh, heavens, no. His looking after the lamps was my own suggestion. One I near begged him to do, before he even considered agreeing. He did not wish to interfere, but I assured him you would be more than happy for his help. Abigail felt as if she were drowning. Uncle, was it wise to have an untrained man take on such a responsibility? He stared at her, taken aback. I imagine you were rather thorough with your explanations to him. Besides, any man who can manoeuvre a ship through a storm and keep so many of his men alive can certainly fill lamps with oil. She looked away. How could she have been so stupid? That was what Captain Kendricks had been trying to tell her that her uncle had asked him to help. And how could he have said no? He had no choice but to do as Uncle Ellis requested. You are not pleased? He asked. Abigail, I did not think asking him was so very wrong. After all, I knew you would be up there soon to refill them yourself. I merely thought that you might have been able to rest longer afterwards. I'm sorry if this has upset you. No, uncle, I am simply astonished. Thank you for your kindness. Oh, you mustn't thank me. Captain Kendricks was the one who helped. He will be here for dinner tonight. Panic gripped her throat. She had forgotten about dinner. She glanced to Uncle Ellis. He deserved the truth of what had occurred last night, but the weary look in his eyes the slight slumping forth of his body on the settee made her pause. How could she admit to removing the only person to have made her uncle happy in months? Perhaps she could beg for the captain's forgiveness, ask him to return for her uncle's sake. At the thought, dread settled on her soul. But she pushed her selfishness aside. She had behaved foolishly, thinking they wished to end her days of running the lighthouse when instead they were merely trying to help. Both men deserved an explanation, and both men deserved an apology. I will have dinner prepared for this evening, uncle, she said. Thank you, Abigail. He shifted his legs with a wince. His fall on the stairs must have hurt him again. Have you seen Mr. Craig as of late? she asked. Perhaps I could write for him today, to request a tincture for your pain. No, I will make the journey myself on foot. Abigail hesitated. Are you certain you should walk that far? Walking is the one thing I can do, he responded. His tone was bitter, but a sudden thought made her dart from the room, returning a moment later with a package in her hand. If you insist on going yourself, then you must wear these. He lifted the lid from the box to reveal a pair of new boots. 
Abigail, how did you? I said I would do without a new pair, to afford the captain staying with us. Yes, I know, but I had a little extra saved. She would not tell him that she had been saving up for a pair of boots for herself. After all, her knees were fine, and she could look past the occasional pebbles that slipped through the holes in the sides of her own boots. Try them on. I had them made from the measurements of your older ones. See if they suit. He replaced his worn boots with the shining dark brown pair. He made no response. Her spirits fell. Are they not to your liking? No, they are perfect. His gaze flitted away, but not before she caught a flash of guilt within his eyes. You are too good to me, my dear. No, she wasn't. She was selfish and insecure, and doubted her uncle when she shouldn't have. She sat down beside him, taking his hand in hers. Uncle, I must apologise. For a great number of things, I'm afraid. But first, for my poor disposition these past few days. I'm glad you have had the captain here to entertain you, whilst I have behaved in such a poor manner. You mustn't apologise, Abigail. He still didn't meet her eyes. I've spent so long reading books and staying in town with... with Mr. Craig, that I hardly notice you of late. It has taken the example of Captain Kendrick's helping you in order for me to see the duties you have taken upon yourself. All while, I have merely complained about the sorry state of my legs. I'm sorry to have been a disappointment to you. She reached for his other hand. Uncle, you know I have always considered you to be more my father than anything else. I will be forever grateful that you took me away from the troubled life I led to bring me to a better one here. A pained expression crossed his face before he stood with the help of his cane. The shadow she had become so used to seeing covered his eyes as he walked from the room. I will leave you now to be back for dinner. Very well, she said. She waited for him to turn around to send him a departing wave, but he never did, vanishing from the house without a single glance back. Chapter 14 Hours later, Abigail peered from the dining room window, straining her neck to see farther up the path that led to the lighthouse. It was still empty. She released an exasperated sigh. She should have expected as much. Uncle Ellis's visits with Mr. Craig always ran late. He would often return while Abigail was tending to the lamps. Still, her uncle knew Captain Kendricks was coming and he would not risk offending the captain. What could be keeping him? Smell from the roasting pheasant, the last of that which she had purchased for Captain Kendrick's stay, wafted through the room. She could not enjoy the savoury scent, however, as she saw the captain riding around the ridge toward the lighthouse. Her throat tightened. Perhaps it was better with her uncle not there. Now she could apologise without an audience. She busied herself setting the table for three, but as a knock sounded, her stomach dropped. It was time. She could no longer avoid the confrontation. Slowly, she approached the front entryway. Her hand lingered on the handle as she drew an unsteady breath. The captain's stoic face met hers as she finally opened the door. Miss Moore, I trust your uncle has informed you that he has insisted upon me joining him for dinner this evening. His tone was frost on her soul. Yes, he told me. Her cheeks burned as she took in his rigid stance, hands clasped behind his back. Please, come in. He entered but remained formally in the entryway as she closed the door behind him. Would you like to wait in the sitting room? She offered. He moved down the corridor in silence. Abigail followed him. She practised her apology once more in her mind. She only needed to say it aloud now. My uncle is due to return from St. Just soon. Did you happen to see him on your way here? I did not. Well, I am certain he will be here any moment. She bit her lip. Her pride begged her to remain silent, but her conscience finally won over. Captain, 
Sir, I would like to apologise for last night. The accusations I made and my unkindness towards you were both uncalled for, and I beg your pardon. She was not surprised when he turned toward her, with his lips still in a firm line. Your uncle told you then. If her blush burned any hotter, she was sure flames would burst forth straight from her cheekbones. He did. So you are aware that I was merely helping him, that I had no intention to cause any harm to you or anyone. She tucked a stray lock of hair behind her ear. Yes, sir. I know you would not have touched the lamps had not my uncle greatly appealed to your mercy. He hesitated only a moment before speaking. I accept your apology, Miss Moore, and offer my own for overstepping last night. No, please, she said. You did nothing wrong. They stood in silence, and Abigail, though happy to have the man's forgiveness, felt no relief. After all, the words she had said to him last night could not be so easily reversed. You said Mr. Moore was in St. Just, he asked next. She wondered if the captain was as anxious as she was to change the subject. Yes, visiting the apothecary. He really should have returned by now. He does not like to walk far in the rain. She crossed the room, eyeing the darkening clouds from the window. She had already lit the lamps in preparation for that evening's storm. Perhaps I ought to ride out, Captain Kendrick said. See if I can find him before he is caught in the storm alone. She cursed her behaviour again, her wrongful assumption that the gentleman was anything other than sheer goodness and generosity. She hardly deserved his offer of help, but she accepted with gratitude, for her uncle's sake. The captain departed straight away, and Abigail watched him ride across the cliffside, astride his dark horse, until he was out of her sight. Her uncle must have simply lost track of the hour. Captain Kendricks would return soon with Uncle Ellis beside him, she was certain. And yet, the uneasiness within her only increased as time passed. She covered the food to keep the meal warm, then proceeded to pace through the house. Still, there was no sign of either of them. She began to wonder if Uncle Ellis had taken the longer route home, that edged close to the sea. It would certainly take him longer. But would the captain think to go that way? I will only go out for a moment, she told herself, just to be sure Uncle isn't missed. She wrapped her shawl around her and ventured forth into the rain that was just beginning to fall. She looked back at the light shining through the storm as she hastened across the cliffside. She should not be leaving the lighthouse at all, but the thought of her uncle being caught in the storm with his knees in such a state spurred her forward. The wind blew hard against her, tearing the hair from her pins and whipping strands across her brow. The mist from the storm blocked most of her view of the ocean. Only the dark grey water near the sand was visible. She raised a hand to her brow, blocking the wind and rain from her eyes as she strained to see farther south. Still, no sign of her uncle. She stared at the peninsula pushing out into the ocean, her eyes inevitably falling to the bottom of the cliffs she could see, just as a precaution, of course. As her search along the bottom of each cliffside came up empty, any relief she may have felt was short-lived, for she looked to the next ridge, and the next. Would her uncle be at the foot of any of those cliffs? She glanced over her shoulder. Goladuin's light still shone, despite the clouds hovering around the tower. She could not have strayed so far. Turning on her heel, she made straight for home. Perhaps the captain and Uncle Ellis were both at Mr. Craig's waiting out the storm. And then Captain Kendricks would see her uncle safely home. She repeated the hollow words in her mind, willing herself to believe them. But when she came upon another cliff, forcing herself to look down, to search for what she did not wish to find, her breathing stopped. No. No, it is not him. She ran along the peninsula in a daze, racing to the mainland. Her eyes focused on the dark form crumpled in the sand below until the cliffside prevented her view. Uncle? 
The powerful waves below drowned out her cries as she ran down the curved pathway leading to the beach. She wiped the moisture from her eyes, tearing across the wet sand. The lifeless form took shape as she neared it. Uncle's cane lay a few paces away, and his new boots were scuffed and covered with sand. Uncle Ellis, please. He did not stir. The sand was thick, her skirts heavy with rain. She tripped, falling as she approached him and scrambling the rest of the way on her hands and knees until she rounded his body to face him. Sand speckled his pallid face. Dark circles framed his eyes. He did not move. She focused on his chest, and when the slightest movement occurred, she gasped. Uncle Ellis? He winced. Abigail. Yes, she said through her tears. I am here. You will be all right now. I must find Mr. Reynolds. She moved to stand, but her uncle's words stopped her, and she leaned in closer to hear him. No. Abigail. It's too late. Too late. He released a wheezy breath, and she pulled back. She held her hand at the bottom of her nose. The smell of alcohol lingered in her nostrils. She knew he would occasionally drink with Mr. Craig during their visits, but never had she smelled it so strongly. Uncle, what happened? She asked. I tripped, he mumbled, his eyes barely open. I was pushed. I tripped. Fell and tripped. Each word blended into the other. Uncle, you are not speaking sensibly. Lay quietly. I will find help. She rested a hand upon his chest and scanned the empty beach. No one would be out in such weather. No one but the captain. Her eyes flew to the clifftops, but there was no sign of him. Would he think to look down? Abigail, you must forgive me, Uncle whispered. Forgive you? For what? He drew in a pained breath, his eyes closing again. She held her breath to avoid inhaling the scent of the hard drink, still piercing her senses. I wanted to be better, he grimaced, the creases in his forehead deepening. I wanted to change for you. She tried to make sense of his words, wondering if the fall or the alcohol caused them to slur. It is too late, Abigail. For her. His eyes opened, and he stared into the clouds, flinching as the rain splashed on his face. Do not lose her, Abigail. Please. Who, uncle? Galua. Galua. The lighthouse, she said, finally understanding. I won't, uncle. I will take care of Goluduan. A tear fell from his eye, sliding down his temple into his sandy hair. Promise me. Her voice caught in her throat. I promise, uncle. A low thunder rumbled, and Abigail looked to the sky. The rain fell in droves around them. If only she could get him home, to the lighthouse, she was certain she could save him. But when she looked back at him, the pain had departed from his blue eyes. He stared up at her, his expression soft. He reached up, stroking her cheek with the back of his fingers. Abigail. There he was. The man she had not seen since before his fall. The man who had saved her from her past. The man who had brought her with him to the lighthouse. To teach her. To guide her. To love her. The only member of her family who ever had. She held on to his hand, keeping it against her face. But his fingers did not return her grasp. And his eyes slowly closed. Please. Uncle, stay. Her words ended in a sob, for she knew he was already gone. Please. You promised me you would not leave me. You promised. Chapter 15 
Gavin's search for Mr. Moore at the apothecary's had turned up empty. And when Mr. Craig had said that the lighthouse keeper had not been to see him in months, an uneasiness crept its way into Gavin's heart. Anxious for any sighting of the man, Gavin sought out Lieutenant Harris at the inn. I saw him at the tavern, but he left over an hour ago, the lieutenant said. The tavern? Why was Mr. Moore at the tavern when he said he'd be with Mr. Craig? I can keep an eye out, though, Harris offered. Help him home if I see him. Thank you, Harris, Gavin said with an appreciative nod. He left the inn behind, riding through St. Just with searching eyes, before making straight for the cliffs. He told himself that he did not need to search there, that he was worrying over nothing. And yet he could not deny his instincts, nor shake the trepidations that hung over him. When there was no sight of the man in either direction atop the cliffs, Gavin knew that Mr. Moore had either reached Goladuan or had fallen to the one place Gavin had prayed he would not have to search. With a hesitant gaze, he peered down at base after base of each cliff he moved toward. But without any sighting of the man, he neared Goladuan with a hope sparking in his chest. Perhaps Mr. Moore was already home, warming by the hearth with a hot cup of tea. Miss Moore would no doubt be fussing over him, tending to the fire and pulling off his boots. Then Gavin would arrive and be welcomed inside with a warm meal. Perhaps Miss Moore would be so pleased with her uncle's return that the tension between her and Gavin would dissipate. The disaster from the night before would be forgotten, and they would spend the evening together in comfortable conversation and camaraderie. Lost in his hope-filled vision, Gavin hardly registered the sight at the bottom of the next cliff, until he narrowed his eyes and a terrible ache sliced through his heart. The two bodies upon the beach were indisputable. He pulled his jacket tighter around him as rain slipped down his neck and he urged his horse forward. He reached the beach in a matter of moments. The wind whistled past his ears. The cold seeped through his clothing and into his very soul as he watched Miss Moore crying over her uncle's lifeless form. He blinked hard, fighting away the moisture that filled his own eyes. Memories of his own parents' passing flashed through his mind. Reminders of the constant ache he'd felt for years as he longed for the kind embrace of his mother and the encouraging nod from his father. And now Miss Moore was to suffer in the same manner, and he could hardly bear the thought. With leaded limbs he lumbered forward. Her red eyes lifted, cheeks blotted from tears. He's gone, she whispered. I'm so sorry, Miss Moore, he responded. He needed to help her. He had to help her. But how? He looked out to the ocean that had nearly disappeared in the waning light. The clouds thickened. The rain fell harder. They needed to return to Goladuan, but he could not simply pull Miss Moore away in the midst of her grief. He moved to her side. She stood up next to him, wiping a hand across her face that was wet from rain and tears. Will you help me bring him home? Her voice trembled. Of course, he said softly. Gavin hoisted Mr. Moore's body onto the back of his horse the wound on his left arm throbbing in protest. The scent of alcohol wafted toward him. So, Lieutenant Harris was right. Mr. Moore had been at the tavern. He pushed aside the upsetting information and focused on the task at hand. How had it come to this? How could his father's friend, Gavin's friend, and Miss Moore's only living relative be gone? He glanced toward the woman as they walked side by side toward Goladuin. She carried Mr. Moore's cane in her hands, her chin quivering with restrained cries, and Gavin's empathy rose. Neither of them spoke as they reached the lighthouse. Miss Moore showed him to the study, placing the cane on the trunk in the corner of the room, before Gavin settled the body on the bed. He turned to face Miss Moore, but was met instead with an empty doorway. He hesitated following after her. Did she wish to be alone, or had she simply been unable to remain in the room with her uncle's body? Slowly he moved through the house, 
first peering within the dining room. Three settings and trays of covered food spread out across the table. He winced. If only he had refused Mr. Moore and had not refilled the lamps the night before. Then Miss Moore would never have pushed him, rightly so, from the house, and they would have already eaten the meal she had clearly taken great care to create. With swirling regret, he made for the sitting room. He found Miss Moore standing near an open window at the back of the room, her arms crossed over her stomach. Words failed him. After all, anything he might have said would be trite and inconsequential in such a situation. The rain poured outside, and the ocean roared beneath them. The only sounds heard until Miss Moore spoke. He was drunk, she said softly. Gavin took a step toward her. I know. He was not at the apothecary's this evening, was he? She asked. He hesitated. He had to tell her the truth, though he wished he could have waited until she was of a sounder mind. No, he was not. I was told that Mr. Craig had not seen him in months. She didn't respond, merely closed her eyes. He moved forward again. Did you happen to speak with him before? She flicked a tear sliding down her cheek. Only for a moment. He did not speak coherently. First, telling me he was pushed. Then saying he had tripped. With the amount he must have had to drink this evening, I am more likely to believe the latter. The wooden floor beneath her had darkened from the water, still dripping from her skirts. Her hair hung halfway out of its pins in wet droves. She had to be freezing. He looked around for her shawl, but it hung near the fire, as wet as her dress. If he had still been staying at Goladuin, he would have retrieved a blanket from his room to wrap around her shoulders. But now, now he was not sure if he was welcome to move about like before. In truth, he wondered if his presence was even wanted. He longed to pull her into his embrace, to hold her as she cried to comfort her, for the darkness falling over the lighthouse. The fact that they were unaccompanied at Goluduin weighed on his mind. He would never choose to leave Miss Moore. Not if he didn't have to, and especially not right then. As far as he was concerned, society could be hanged. But he could not risk her reputation. Miss Moore, I wish to help you, but I... I cannot stay. She nodded in silence. I know you will need to wait out the storm in the watch room, he began, knowing better than to offer his own help looking after the lamps. But is there anyone you might consider asking to spend the night here, so you do not have to be alone? He knew she liked to keep to herself, to do things on her own, so he was taken aback when she nodded. Yes, she said. The Corsies. Gavin nodded. Mr. Corsey would remain with her uncle's body, and Mrs. Corsey could join Miss Moore in the watch room. That would more than suffice until Gavin could come up with a better way to help. Quickly, he excused himself, knowing the sooner he left, the sooner he could return to her side. He rode across the dark, wet countryside in the direction of Leighton House, the Corsey's estate. Fortunately, he had followed the couple back to their home after their carriage had been stuck in the mud. Otherwise, he would not have had a hope of finding it in the darkening storm. After reaching the house, Gavin explained the turn of events to Mr. and Mrs. Corsey, who agreed to follow him back to the lighthouse at once. Before long, the three of them arrived at Goladuin. Gavin tapped three times before slowly opening the door and stepping over the threshold. Miss Moore? He called out. He stepped aside to allow the causes within the home as Miss Moore appeared with swollen eyes in the entryway. Mrs. Causey made for her with open arms. Oh, I am so sorry, Miss Moore. Thank you. Miss Moore's voice faltered. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, no, dear, Mrs. Causey said, leading her into the sitting room. No. I am here for you. I will make us tea in a moment. For now you need not say another word unless you wish to. Gavin turned to Mr. Corsey, 
who came up to stand beside him in the doorway of the sitting room. We will be sure to stay for as long as Miss Moore needs, he whispered. Thank you, Mr. Causey. Gavin remained where he stood, silently watching from the doorway as the man entered the room. Mrs. Causey had her arm around Miss Moore's shoulders, the women huddling together on the settee. He longed to stay, to ensure that Miss Moore would be tended to and taken care of the whole of the night. But with the Causey's presence and their kind attention already focused on Miss Moore, the time had come for him to take his leave. He took a step back, but Miss Moore's stare in his direction made him pause. Thank you, she mouthed out. Gavin could hardly breathe, so crushing was the weight on his chest. He had done next to nothing for the woman, and she was expressing her gratitude for him? He gave a gentle nod in response, staring into her blue eyes, before he turned away and left the lighthouse behind. Though he had not known the woman for long, he had grown to care for her, and the thought of her being in pain, a pain he understood all too well, made his heart ache. He would do anything to help ease her burden, to help her feel at peace with her uncle's passing. Truly, anything at all. He did not know how else he could help her, but he knew he had to try. Chapter 16 Abigail numbed to the pain and loneliness of her new life. She stayed busy to keep herself and the lighthouse from falling apart, but after her uncle had been laid to rest, she was struck again that he was indeed gone. The sun was bright the day after his burial, shining down on her as she stood at her uncle's final resting place, the cliffside above Goladuin. She had purchased a coffin with the remainder of the lighthouse's monthly funds and had chosen to tie a black ribbon around her wrist. She simply could not afford the cost of a morning gown. She eyed the mound of dirt before her, tucking a stray lock behind her ear as the wind tugged at her skirts. I made a promise to you, uncle, she whispered. Her eyes trailed ahead to where the lamp room of the lighthouse was nearly eye level. And I will keep that promise. I will not lose Goladuin. Time stood still atop the cliff. Abigail closed her eyes and breathed in the sea air, willing the wind to blow away her troubles, just as it had when she was younger. But things were different now. They could not be so easily resolved. She turned away from the grave and made her way down the pathway that curved back to the lighthouse. As she neared the level ground, she caught sight of Captain Kendricks standing nearby, his back to her as he faced the sea. Her heart took a small leap in her chest. Good morning, Captain, she greeted. He turned toward her with a smile that did not reach his eyes. Miss Moore, I saw you at the grave, but thought it better to wait for your return here. I hope I am not intruding. No, of course not, she responded. May I see you back to the lighthouse? If you wish. They walked beside each other in silence. Since her uncle's death, the captain had called upon her each day. His visits were often short, occurred out of doors and nearly always involved Lieutenant Harris, whom Captain Kendricks had been rooming with at the inn in St. Just. Abigail knew the captain called in such a way to maintain propriety, and she was grateful for his kindness in visiting her. The tension between them from before her uncle's death had disappeared, and she could not deny how she missed his constant presence and companionship in the lighthouse. How have you been faring? he asked, just as he always did. Well enough, she responded. You do know, he began, if you need any help, you simply... Must ask you, she interrupted, with a shadow of a smile on her lips. I know. In the past few days, Captain Kendrick's offers of help had only increased, despite the fact that he could do little else but visit with her. She appreciated his calls and his willingness to give his aid, but she could not grow used to them, not again, because soon his visits would end, just as her uncle's life had ended, 
and she would be left alone to pick up the pieces of her new reality. For now, however, she would accept the small distraction he provided her with, so she might briefly forget her lonely future that stretched out endlessly before her. Your visits have already helped me greatly, sir, she said with a glance in his direction, and I am grateful for them. He peered down at her before he looked ahead of them. Are you expecting company? She sent him a questioning look before following his eyes to the lighthouse. A carriage waited at the front, and a gentleman stood at the door, knocking. Mr. Whittam? she questioned aloud, too far for the man to hear. You know him? Captain Kendricks asked. He is our banker from St. Ives. She raised her voice. Good morning, Mr. Whittam. He turned. Ah, there you are, Miss Moore. She moved uneasily toward him. The man hardly looked pleased. What can I do for you, sir? She asked, after the polite bow and curtsy had been exchanged. Forgive my unannounced visit, but I have come to discuss a delicate matter with you. He clasped a bulky bag in front of him with both hands as he glanced sidelong at the captain. Abigail was certain he disapproved of the two of them alone together. She introduced the both of them before Captain Kendricks faced her. Excuse me, Miss Moore, I will take my leave of you now. Wait, she said without a thought. She sent a wary glance to Mr. Whittam. Her uncle had always insisted on meeting with the banker alone. She had no notion of how the gentleman would behave or what he might say, but she had a suspicion that he would treat her with greater fairness if Captain Kendricks, a respectable man, remained present and at her side. She leaned slightly toward the captain. Might you be able to stay? He stared at her with a blank expression, clearly surprised, before he nodded. Of course. She gave him a grateful look before turning to Mr. Whittam. Would you care to come inside, sir? He gave a curt nod, and together the three of them moved into the sitting room. Captain Kendrick stood near the hearth, his hands clasped behind his back. Abigail took a seat on the settee, Mr. Whittam across from her. Do begin, sir, Abigail said. The banker straightened. Firstly, I must express my deepest condolences to you for your loss. Abigail hardly felt warmed by the rehearsed words, but she dipped her head with appreciation nonetheless. As you well know, he continued, rifling through his bag with one hand. Mr. Moore had no living relatives apart from you. As the property was not entailed and in accordance with Mr. Moore's will, the land and lighthouse have now been left in your possession. The news came as no surprise. Her uncle had told her often how one day the lighthouse would be hers to have and maintain for as long as she wished. She cringed at what she had thought before of Uncle Ellis replacing her with Captain Kendricks. How wrong she had been. Mr. Whittam pulled out a stack of papers and closed the bag, setting it on the floor to rest against his leg. It is my unfortunate duty now, however, to inform you that Goladuin may not be yours for very long. Excuse me? She glanced to the captain, who stared across the room out the window. He clearly strived to appear as if he had not been listening, no doubt to allow her privacy, but with his creased brow she knew he had heard. She shifted uncomfortably in her seat. Perhaps she'd made a mistake in asking him to linger. What do you mean, Mr. Whittam? As you were aware, the man continued, your uncle accrued a great number of debts these last few years. I regret to say that before his death, he had fallen dreadfully behind on his payments. Payments? She shook her head. You must be mistaken, sir. My uncle funded the building of Goladuin with his own living. No loan was used. Mr. Whittam paused. No, I refer to the loans he had taken out to fund his gaming debts. But my uncle does not game. Did not game, she corrected. Mr. Whittam fiddled with the papers in his hand. 
his formality having disappeared. Forgive me, Miss Moore. I thought you knew. Abigail fought the desire to cover her ears. He wasn't speaking truthfully. He couldn't be. The loans have come and gone at various times the last few years, Mr. Whittam said, his voice lowered. But last September, I understand he lost a substantial amount of money. The loan he signed for to pay the debt was very large indeed. Unfortunately, it remains unpaid to this day, and the interest continues to accumulate. September? When Uncle Ellis had suffered his injury? Had he been using what little money they had for gaming, instead of paying someone to help her with the lighthouse? She did not wish to believe it. And yet, deep within her heart, she somehow knew the truth already. Mr. Whittam extended a few papers toward her. These are evidence of his deferring the loans. Abigail scanned the pages. Her uncle's signature was scrawled at the bottom of each one, but she still did not understand when he could have found the time to game. He was at the lighthouse every night, apart from when he visited Mr. Craig. The truth rushed over her in waves of realisation. He had not been visiting with the apothecary for help with his wounds. He had been gaming, drinking, lying. He had taken their funds and wasted them away. He must have been the talk of the town. But of course she would not have heard it. She had been too busy taking care of the lighthouse, doing her work, and her uncle's. Images flashed through her mind. The times he'd wobbled to bed, stinking of smoke and drink the late nights he'd had, the alcohol on his breath the night of his death. Had he been gaming then, too? She glanced at Captain Kendricks. Concern clouded his dark eyes as he watched her in silence. Why did she ask him to stay? Now her humiliation could not be hidden. Miss Moore, Mr. Whittam said gingerly. With these loans, in an attempt to avoid debtors' prison, Mr. Moore mortgaged Goladuin, despite our best efforts to convince him to do otherwise, and the surrounding property. The brutal sting of betrayal hit Abigail, as powerfully as if she had been struck across her face. After everything she'd done, her work, her sacrifices, her countless sleepless nights, Uncle Ellis had simply agreed to give the lighthouse away? What is the extent of the loan, sir? she asked. What must I pay to keep Golladuin? The banker kept his gaze level, though his shoulders tensed, as if to prepare himself for a strike. Over three thousand pounds. Her breath rushed from her lungs. Abigail closed her eyes, swaying on the edge of the settee. And when must it be paid? The agreement states... She heard him rifling through his papers that the mortgage must be paid in full within one year, this October. If left unsatisfied, the property will be seized. She opened her eyes to stare once more at her uncle's name on the papers in her hands. Could you not extend, sir? She hated the tremor in her voice. As I was unaware of his actions until this moment? Forgive me, Miss Moore, Mr. Whittam said his voice finally filling with sincere compassion. But such a thing is not possible. Of course. She longed to lash out, to scream at the banker for being cruel and unfair. But she knew he was only the bearer of distressing, disturbing news. News her uncle should have told her. How could he have made her promise to keep Goladuin when he already knew it was lost? No. The banker did not deserve her anger. Her uncle did. Thank you, Mr. Whittam, for coming here in person to inform me of such. I will be in contact with you shortly when I decide what is to be done. What was to be done? Anything at all? I am truly sorry, Miss Moore, Mr. Whittam said, standing. With the tip of his hat, he left the room. As the front door closed behind him, Abigail looked at the papers he had left with her. Miss Moore? Captain Kendricks? 
She couldn't look up at him. She couldn't bear to see the empathy that had most assuredly filled his dark eyes. Forgive me, Captain, but I... I must... Excuse me. Words failed her. Tears spilled down her cheeks and she ran to her room. She closed the door firmly behind her, relieved when she heard the front door open and close again, signalling the captain's departure. She felt alone, helpless, but she could not face him. She could not face anyone. She leaned against the door, no longer able to support herself. The thought of losing Goladuan, her home, pressed down heavily upon her heart. She crinkled the loan documents within her fisted hand, gritting her teeth together before throwing the sheets across her room. Paper flew in every direction as she sank to the floor. Uncle, how could you? Chapter 17 Gavin rode his horse along the seaside, rolling his head back to ease the tension in his neck. Tension that had been there for nearly a week. He felt restless, hopeless, lost. After Mr. Moore's funeral and the discovery of the gentleman's debts, Gavin had racked his mind for a solution to Miss Moore's situation. He had longed to see what her thoughts were on the matter. But after that day, Gavin's time had been entirely taken up with Sanders' trial, which had finally occurred a few days after the service. The guilty verdict had been expected, as well as the punishment of death by hanging. Even still, Sanders' younger brother had shouted expletives as the sentence had been read, threatening revenge on Gavin before being dragged from the room. Gavin still regarded the boy with sorrow, but after Miss Moore's prior words, his feelings of fault in the matter had substantially subsided. Now, if only he could help Miss Moore, as she had helped him as she had saved him. With a sigh, he looked out at sea. A tall ship floated by on the bright water, far from the cliff sides, sails full as the wind drove it south. It seemed a lifetime ago since he had commanded such a vessel. He did miss his life at sea. But now he missed Goladuin. Staying with the Moors had given him a strange sense of belonging, as if he had finally found a home. So being away from them had brought back his uncertainty for what his future held. His distance had also made him realise that as much as he missed his time at Goladuin, he missed the woman behind the lighthouse even more. His desire to be near Miss Moore did not surprise him. The week he had stayed at Goladuin and the brief visits he'd been able to manage with Miss Moore since had not been enough to satisfy his longing to get to know the woman further. Yes. Their relationship had been somewhat strained with her lack of trust in seemingly everyone. She seemed hesitant to share anything about her life, beyond her knowledge and love of the lighthouse. But what reason had she to trust Gavin when her uncle, her caretaker, had treated her in such a way, before and after his death? He shook the thoughts from his mind. He had struggled initially with his anger when he'd first heard of Mr. Moore leaving his debts to his niece, but berating the man's poor choices would hardly help matters. The only thing that would help would be securing Miss Moore's future at the lighthouse. Though how that was supposed to happen, Gavin wasn't entirely sure. He had visited Mr. Whittam in St. Ives after the trial had ended, asking if there was anything he could do to help Miss Moore keep her lighthouse. Sure to pay the whole of Mr. Moore's debts, Mr. Whittam had said. I fear there is nothing else to be done, sir. Gavin had left the banker with very little hope. He had no qualms about paying off the loans and mortgage, but he respected the woman too greatly to go about doing so behind her back. And if he asked her forthright if he could pay the debts, well, he hardly believed she would accept such an offer. Even if she did, there was the small matter of Trinity House. He knew they would not accept an unmarried young woman as headkeeper with no assistant. And if she did find an assistant, they would hardly approve of her working alongside a gentleman who was not next of kin. And finding another woman as strong as Miss Moore, 
was willing to give up her life in the service, was nearly impossible. The matter was complicated, to say the least. Still, even with his reasons to remain in Cornwall disappearing one by one, the ship's wreckage cleaned, Mr. Moore's death and the court-martial completed, he found himself unable, unwilling to leave. At least, not until he had attempted to help Miss Moore in every way possible. He was indebted to her. After all, she had saved his life at great peril to her own. The least he could do was attempt to do the same for her. Only a coward would leave the woman now in her time of need, not a man of honour, so he would offer to pay off her uncle's debts, and if she refused, which he had no doubt that she would, then he would make his next offer, an offer that would allow her to keep Goluduin. An offer that involved far more than a simple single payment, an offer he was more than ready to make. Abigail tugged at another weed until it broke loose from the dirt. She threw it over her shoulder, not bothering to see if it reached the pile of others. Kneeling down in the middle of her garden, moisture seeped in through her apron and skirts, but she didn't care. Her dress was already filthy. What did one more stain matter? She was a penniless lighthouse keeper. She may as well look the part. With an exhausted sigh, she swiped the hair blowing across her cheek before digging her fingers back into the dirt. Since the banker's visit days before, she had worked tirelessly to prevent herself from dwelling on her uncle's sordid actions and her own hopeless state. She had gone through what little possession she had in the house, writing down everything that would fetch a profit. She had not needed to add the figures to know she was nowhere near the sum required, even if she sold everything she owned. She had begun to wonder if she ought to accept her fate, to live out the next few months, saving every spare coin she could, and maybe a miracle would occur. Either that, or she would enjoy the last of her freedom in her lighthouse before she was forced to relocate. However, a letter from Trinity House arrived that very morning, informing her that if she wished to keep their contract, with a monthly income sent for her work at the lighthouse, a different head keeper would need to be appointed. Abigail knew they did not wish to find a scandal waiting to happen, an unmarried keeper with a male assistant, but without their help, the light would remain lit only as long as her current supply of oil lasted, mere weeks at best. How she regretted having no plan in place. When her uncle had fallen last autumn, she had become all too aware that he would one day die, but any plans would not have mattered either way they would have fallen apart with the mess her uncle had left her. With a rumbling stomach, Abigail straightened, arching her back to work out the stiffness accrued from hours of work. She would not be weeding the pitiful patch of soil at all if she did not rely on the small number of vegetables her garden yielded, the only food she could afford. Perhaps she ought to enjoy the time she had left at Goladuin, take a walk on the beach, enjoy the sunsets. Anything would be more pleasant than working for nothing. But then, she had never worked at the lighthouse for nothing. Her purpose had always been, would have always been, to keep safe the lives at sea. She looked out to the deep blue water, but her eyes were drawn instead to Captain Kendricks on his black horse approaching her. Her stomach lurched. She had not expected to see him that day. She knew the trial had already taken place, so his departure from Cornwall would be soon. He had nothing left to keep him there. Was he visiting to bid her an official farewell? Good morning, Captain Kendricks, she greeted, painfully aware of the weary tone to her voice. I thought you would have left for your brothers already. I will be soon. He dismounted his horse and turned to face her, running the reins through his hands. I could not leave yet, not before I knew you were... Well, of course he was there asking after her. That was just the sort of man he was. He was not like her uncle or her father. He was a true gentleman, and his continual helping hand caused a knot of emotion within her throat. Thank you, Captain. 
she swallowed, standing from her kneeling position. I assure you, I'm well. Her voice breaking in the middle of her words did not further her cause. Captain Kendricks tied his horse to the garden fence and took a step toward her. Miss Moore, I know you may misconstrue my offer of help, but I cannot continue in this regard, wondering what you are to do. I must ask, will you allow me to pay off your uncle's debts? Abigail had anticipated the words long ago. Her uncle had told her of the captain's wealth, from his substantial living and his naval career. Still, the selfless generosity Captain Kendricks extended toward her caused her physical pain. I thank you, sir, but I cannot accept such an offer. He did not seem surprised. Had he expected her refusal? May I ask why? For a number of reasons, she replied. Because it is your fortune, and they are my uncle's debts. Because I could never repay such a sum, and because Trinity House will not allow me to run the lighthouse on my own. He was silent, seemingly contemplating her words. Then you are going to leave. You are going to leave Gulladuan. She looked at him with an expression she was sure perfectly reflected her miserable state. What else am I to do? A fresh wave of humiliation overcame her. She was ashamed for having such an uncle, for having no money, for having no one else to help her. Her life was bleak, her future even more so, and there was nothing she could do to help it. You have, I believe, one more option. Forgive me, sir, but I do not think that I do. You do, he insisted. Miss Moore, there is another way for you to keep the lighthouse. She tilted her head, wondering at his persistence. And what way is that, Captain? His eyes did not waver. You can marry me. Chapter 18 A dizziness overcame Abigail. Sir? Captain Kendricks took a step toward her. You can marry me, he repeated. You cannot be serious. I am. The man had clearly taken leave of his senses, and yet as he walked toward her, taking her hand in his, she could not deny the look of determination on his face. Her heart fluttered, preventing her from drawing in a deep breath. Marry me, Miss Moore, he said softly, so we may work together to keep Goladuin lit. Her thoughts spun rapidly, adding to her light-headedness. What was he saying? That he would give up everything to remain at the lighthouse with her? She could not allow him to do such a thing. Captain, forgive me, but I cannot accept your offer. Yes, you can, he said. His dark eyes were clear, focused, as if he knew exactly what he offered, and was content to do so. I will not force you into accepting but I have considered what options you may have, and I truly believe this is the only way in which you may receive everything you wish. Her mouth parted. He was in earnest. She could hardly wrap her mind around what had just occurred. Captain Kendricks had offered his hand in marriage. To her. Heat rose up her neck, settling on her cheeks. No, she had to be reasonable about this. He had clearly not made the offer out of love. It was more of a kind gesture, even a business proposition, so she would treat it as such. A marriage between them certainly would sort out the issue with Trinity House and provide her with the help she needed to run the lighthouse. Indeed, her troubles would be over financially. But then, what about the captain? But, sir she began, her voice small as his thumb caressed the top of her hand. What of your own life? The sacrifices you would have to make if we... if we went through with this? The only thing I would truly be giving up is a life of uncertainty. I told you before, I did not know what I would do after leaving the Navy. Short of returning to my brother's estate, and I assure you, 
I would gladly give up a life surrounded by land, finery and elevated circumstances to live here. His eyes swept across the grounds, the lighthouse, the sea. Abigail could see the clear admiration in his expression, for it matched her own. He had fallen in love with Goloduan. How had it taken her so long to see it? Too easily could she picture her life with him. When she was a young girl, she had longed to find a handsome man she could marry. Together, they would live out the rest of their days in the lighthouse. As she grew older, however, she knew her imaginings were silly. Yet there she was, being offered the chance to live out her childhood dreams with a gentleman. A captain. And more importantly, a friend. She looked down at her hand, still in the captain's. How naturally they fit together. How her heart, her very soul, thrilled at his touch. But when she noted the dirt beneath her fingernails, the truth of who she really was severed her hopes and her dreams. Yes, Captain Kendricks was a gentleman, and she could not allow him to spend the rest of his days doing manual labour. Nor could she allow him to marry a woman with such a complicated and sordid past. She took a step away from him, pulling her fingers from his grasp, and a coldness enveloped her, rushing through her body with an irrepressible wave. I cannot, Captain. Why can you not, Miss Moore? He asked. If you have reservations because you assume that... that I will expect what normally takes place within a marriage, please don't. Our relationship can be purely platonic. I would expect nothing but friendship. A blush flamed her cheeks, her hands still tingling from his touch. She must not have had the same effect on him if he could make such a promise without hesitation. Yet when she stared into his eyes, the small flicker of uncertainty in their brown depths made her heart quicken. So, Miss Moore, he said, clearing his throat, what is your answer? His deep voice nearly penetrated the defences she had strived to build since the man had crashed upon her shores. But she could not think about that day, nor the time they had spent together since. She could not dwell on her attraction to him any longer. She could not imagine how wonderful her life would be married to such a man. Because he deserved a far better wife than a poor, deceased lighthouse keeper's niece. She turned away from him dropping down to her knees in the dirt. I am sorry, Captain. I cannot marry you. His eyes seared through her flesh, but she could not face him again. She could not allow him to see the tears falling from her eyes, sprinkling the weeds below. She dug through the dirt, where Captain Kendricks did not belong, and pulled at the weeds until she heard him mount his horse and ride away without a word. As he did so, she prayed that she would soon overcome the regret she already felt for rejecting the one man who had ever truly been on her side. Abigail stared at her hands, folded in her lap. She sat across from the banker in a small room in the inn, overlooking the streets of St Just. A breeze blew in through the open window, rippling the sheer curtains and filling the room with fresh air. But Abigail felt nauseated, lifeless, a mere shadow of who she had been before. Thank you for coming to meet me here, Mr. Whittam, she said. Of course, Miss Moore. I requested your presence here to inform you that I do not have the resources to pay off the mortgage, nor will I in October. I am sorry to hear that. She could not swallow the emotion binding her throat. What will become of Gola Duin? We've had several prospective gentlemen interested in purchasing the land, but nothing will be settled until the documents are in order. Of course, the fate of the lighthouse will be in the hands of whoever pays the highest price. She knew having a gentleman purchase Gola Duin was inevitable, but to hear it aloud, that her greatest fears were coming true, caused her chest to constrict. She stood, making her way to the window to push it farther open, the hinges squeaking in protest. 
She closed her eyes as the wind played with the soft curls at her temples. You look ill, Miss Moore, Mr. Whittam said, remaining behind his desk. Allow me to pour you a drink. Abigail heard the trickling of brandy as it fell into the glass behind her, but she did not turn around. This was not supposed to happen. None of this was supposed to have ever happened. She was meant to keep Gulladuin, to grow old there, have her posterity do the same. She could not blame her uncle any longer. He had started it, yes, but she had ended it with a simple, misguided refusal. How she regretted not accepting Captain Kendrick's offer. But it was too late. He was already gone. I know of a few workhouses in search of females, Mr. Whittam continued. You would be required to move farther north, though. If you prefer to remain in Cornwall, however, might I suggest finding employment as a maid of all work, or a scullery maid? Abigail opened her eyes, staring down at the busy street. She remained unnoticed, as if the world was intentionally trying to squeeze her out. People walked past with bright faces as they greeted neighbours and friends, a sea of tall hats and elegant bonnets, fine carriages and wrapped packages, none of them aware, none of them caring about her destitute state. None of them, apart from Captain Gavin Kendricks. The blood pulsed through her veins as she watched him ride up the busy street. He had not left St. Just yet? Her heart jumped. She was not too late. She could have a life outside of a workhouse and away from meaningless labour on an ostentatious estate. She could remain in Cornwall, forevermore at Goladuin, with a man by her side, willing to give up everything. For her to have everything. She caught sight of the full saddlebags behind him, and a panic erupted within her. She had no time to reconsider. She needed to act. Now. She stuck her head through the window, hardly noticing the startled looks from those below. Captain? Captain Kendricks? He looked over his shoulder, scanning the streets for the source of the voice. She waved her hand back and forth. Captain Kendricks, up here! Finally, he found her, a bewildered look on his face. He returned her wave and reined in his horse. She motioned for him to join her downstairs, and he nodded, though he still eyed her with confusion. Swiftly, Abigail pulled her head from the window to see Mr. Whittam watching her as if she were mad. Perhaps she was mad. Mad enough to accept the captain's offer. Mad enough to marry a man she had known for mere weeks. But if being mad meant she could remain in her home, continue to watch over the seas nearby, and take care of Goladuin forever, then mad she would be. Excuse me for a moment, Mr. Whittam, she said in her calmest voice. I will join you directly with... with my intended. You're what? he exclaimed. But she had already fled from the room. She took the stairs two at a time, well aware of how unladylike she appeared. Her dress was spotted with stains that would not rub out, and her hair was a right mess, lopsided and already falling out of its pins. But she did not care. She needed to speak with Captain Kendricks. She reached the door just as he entered the inn, his eyes falling upon her in an instant. Captain, she spoke, breathless. She glanced around them, noting the eyes of more than a few others who focused on them rather than on their forgotten meals. Are you available to speak for a moment? He nodded silently, and they moved to an unoccupied corner of the room. What is it, Miss Moore? Her courage waned like a flame in a storm. Did his offer still stand, or was he set on leaving Cornwall to return to his brother? Before her nerve could fail altogether, she pressed on. Sir, if your offer still stands, I... I should like to accept it. His brow rose, but his voice did not reveal the same surprise. May I ask what has made you change your decision? She drew in a deep breath, before rushing on with a simple, truthful explanation. I realised I would be even more of a fool than my uncle if I chose living in a workhouse over a life with you at Goladuin. 
His gaze flickered between her eyes, as if he attempted to discover her thoughts, so she ducked her head. What have you to say, sir? She raised one shoulder, wincing as she anticipated his denial. I say, let us save Gola doing together. Her eyes flew up to see his softened expression, the corner of his mouth curved up. Relief rushed throughout her, causing an unsteady feeling in her limbs. Thank you, Captain, she sputtered. But before she could fully clasp her hope, a disparaging thought hauled it away from her grasp. Her eyes dropped once more, and she laced her fingers together in front of her so tightly they ached. Before we go any further, sir, there is something you must know. Something about me. About my past. But he waved a soft hand between them. If you desire to tell me something, then you may do so. But I require no confessions or promises to be made before we marry. Her eyebrows drew together. But what if your decision to marry me changes once you hear what I have to say? Does your past make you think any less of yourself? He asked. No, but others think less of me because of it. And that was the truth. She knew she could not be held responsible for the behaviour of her parents, and yet the world always seemed to hold her accountable. If you do not think less of yourself, then you may keep it to yourself, he said, until you are ready to share it. She shifted her feet. Are you certain, sir? Yes, he stated. There is nothing you can say that would change my mind. When she finally looked up to see his stalwart gaze, a small thread of hope managed to slip through the thick uncertainty covering her heart. Very well, Captain. Then let us marry with haste. Chapter 19 With Trinity House's insistence on a male headkeeper to run Goladuin, Captain Kendricks had suggested they look into purchasing a common licence the moment the debts had been paid. They could not risk waiting a few weeks for the bans to be posted before they could marry. Their wedding took place a week after they received the licence. Abigail wore her blue Sunday dress, her only one not riddled with holes. Mr Biddle, the vicar, married them, while his wife and Lieutenant Harris stood as witnesses. Abigail had told Captain Kendricks to invite whomever he pleased, though she was relieved when he'd said he wanted a small ceremony, as much as she did. People would discover their union soon enough. There was certainly no reason to hasten the stares and whispers that would soon bombard them. During the ceremony, Abigail hardly heard the vicar as he read from the Book of Common Prayer. She was too distracted with the fact that she was, indeed, marrying the handsome captain who stood beside her. After the vows, scriptures and prayers had been said, the vicar finished and Abigail signed the parish registry in a daze. She thanked the Biddles and the lieutenant for their attendance, then followed her new husband out of the church. Their journey back to Goladuin was spent in silence. An odd sort of tension arose between them, a tension not based on anger but on uncertainty concerning their new relationship. After all, she could think of no other marriage that had begun with a husband paying off his wife's uncle's debts and ended with an agreement to run a lighthouse together, all with them only knowing each other for mere weeks. But then perhaps only she felt the discomfort and Captain Kendricks was fine. He certainly appeared well enough, what with his pleasant expression as he peered out over the sea as they walked together. She pursed her lips. She would be fine soon, she was sure of it. She merely needed time to adjust. But when they reached the lighthouse, matters worsened. Her new life glared right before her eyes as she and Captain Kendrick stood alone in the corridor of Goladuin. She fidgeted, looking anywhere else but at him as he regarded her curiously. She did not know what to say, what to do. It was as if she had lost all ability to behave as a normal person, simply because they were now married. I... she began, crossing her arm in front of her stomach. I think I will go change now. And she darted down the corridor before the captain even had a chance to respond. She closed her bedroom door swiftly behind her, 
leaning against it with a deep sigh. She was behaving ridiculously. She and the captain had been friends before all of this. Why did she feel the need to flee, to escape his presence? Nothing had changed between them. Then again, everything had changed between them. Captain Kendricks was no longer her uncle's guest in her home. He was her husband, in their home. He had paid off her uncle's debts. He had sacrificed everything for her to remain at Goladuin. So how could they continue, just as before? His footsteps thumped against the floor outside of her door as he entered his own room next to hers. She ought to finish dressing swiftly, before he even had the chance to leave his own room. That way, she could continue with her chores to avoid another awkward encounter. After all, work would certainly distract her, it always did. With renewed hope, Abigail threw off her Sunday best and pulled on her brown working dress. Within a matter of moments, she had changed and moved to open her door. As she did so, the captain's door opened simultaneously and they both took a step forward, stopping just before they would have bumped into each other. Oh, she gasped, pulling back. So much for her plan. Forgive me, he said. I did not mean to startle you. She shook her head, resting her hand to her chest. It is quite all right. Have you already forgotten that I live here? He asked. She looked up at him, his brown eyes dancing, and she flushed. No, I... You merely surprised me, that is all. She motioned for her to precede him down the corridor, and she moved forward with a nod of thanks. But when his boots sounded directly behind her, and she sensed his eyes upon her, she suddenly forgot how to walk. Her right foot collided with the left and she tumbled forward. If tripping in front of Captain Kendricks had not been mortifying enough, having his hands wrap around her waist to catch her from behind certainly did the trick. Are you all right? He asked, his deep voice filled with concern. She nodded, her sides burning pleasantly where his fingers held her. Yes. She straightened groaning inwardly at her inability to walk. Was she a toddler on unstable ground? A newborn foal upon the hay? No, she was a woman who was unsettled with her husband's alluring eyes upon her. Taking a careful step forward, she pulled away from Captain Kendricks, despite her strange desire to linger within his hold. She turned, intent on thanking him as she faced him in the corridor. That was another mistake. Now her legs turned to preserves at the sight of his firmly set jaw and masculine lips. She had meant to distract herself with something. What had it been? Oh, yes, work. Work away from the captain. You must be hungry, sir, she said. Why do you not take a moment to rest in the sitting room while I make up a plate for you? He gave her an incredulous look. We did not form this union for me to rest while you toil away. I enjoy working, as you well know. So please, tell me what needs to be done and I will see to the tasks straight away. She hesitated. She had hoped some of her guilt over the captain's sacrifices might have been alleviated had she worked while he rested. But if there was one thing she knew about him, it was his insatiable desire to help others. Of course, there were worse traits for a husband to have. Very well, she said. The stable doors have come off again, so you may fix them if you wish. I'm certain the horses would appreciate proper shelter for once. Excellent, he said, rubbing his hands together. I will see to them directly. He walked away with quick, excited steps, and Abigail stared after him until the door closed behind him. Instantly, silence encompassed her, deafening her ears. Her plan had worked too well. She had only suggested that he fix the stables so he might work out of doors, away from herself. She had hoped the distance would have cleared her mind, distracted her from her discomfort. But now, all she wished for was to be near the captain once again, to be rid of the silence that had been her closest companion for far too long. Her conflicting feelings only worsened as she walked from room to room, 
moved from chore to chore, unable to focus on anything other than Captain Kendricks, who she observed working away at the stables from each window she happened by. She fancied her lack of focus was simply due to her innocuous desire to work out of doors. After all, it was a beautiful day. She ought to enjoy the sunshine while it lasted. Never mind the captain's presence out there. She could overlook him. She would simply work better with fresh air in her lungs. With a broom in hand, she exited the house, casting a furtive glance toward the stables as she did so. Captain Kendricks looked up at her and raised a hand in greeting. Was she imagining things, or did he look pleased to see her? She sent him a quick smile in response, then took to sweeping the landing. She had managed two swipes of her broom before she glanced up again. Captain Kendricks hammered with his right hand, his left holding the door steady. His grasp was strong now. His wound must have healed nicely. With his sleeves rolled up, she could see his lower arm flexing as he hammered, and an involuntary sigh escaped her lips. He certainly was robust, and she certainly was distracted. A flash of colour nearby pulled her attention away from the captain, and she looked ahead with narrowed eyes. A shrill tweet pierced the air before something small and blue swooped directly over her head. She ducked down with a scream, and instantly Captain Kendricks jogged toward her. What happened? Are you all right? She straightened. Yes, only I... I think a bird just flew into the house. She peered within the open doorway, and he stood by her side. Yes, you see there? She pointed to the corridor that led to the circular room. Perched on the window ledge was a small blue swallow. We need to capture him! before he has the chance to... But the bird kicked off the ledge and soared toward the spiral stairs, instantly disappearing up the tower. The creature was no doubt halfway to the watch room by now. They would never... Oh, no! She breathed. What? Captain Kendricks questioned, but she was already racing for the stairs. The hatch door! She explained over her shoulder. I don't remember closing it this morning. If the bird flies into the lamp room, who knows what'll scratch to pieces? The windows, the lamps, perhaps even the refractors. We need to capture him, now. Captain Kendricks did not respond, but his footsteps sounded in time with hers on the iron stairs. With her hand on the railing to keep her balance, Abigail craned her neck to see the chirping birds circling above them, moving higher and higher up the tower. How could she not have remembered to close the door? Or had she? Her memories refused to cooperate. She had received very little sleep over the past week due to the continual stormy weather, as well as the added stress of her impending nuptials. Any hope of a confident answer was futile. She looked up again, willing the creature to stop its ascent. But when it disappeared into the watch room, she gritted her teeth. All will be well. Captain Kendricks said behind her, we will capture it before any damage is done. His voice was sure, but she wasn't. Finally, they reached the last step and Abigail stopped, breathing heavily as she held her aching side. She glanced to the captain behind her and pressed a finger to her lips. He nodded his understanding. As soon as her breathing evened out, she crept forward on the tips of her toes. The last thing she wanted to do was startle the bird into the lamp room, if he wasn't already there. As slowly as she could manage, she peered through the doorway. Before seeking out the bird, she looked to the ceiling, and relief pulsed through her veins to see the latch door securely shut. She pulled back with a sigh, closing her eyes. It's all right, it's closed. What a relief! Captain Kendrick said between breaths. However, next time would you mind very much attempting to remember before we have raced up 117 steps? She looked to his eyes, alight with teasing, and a strange thrill coasted through her chest. I will try, so long as you help me to capture him now. He walked past her to stare within the room. How do you suggest we do that? 
She leaned through the doorway as well. The bird stood on the railing of the smaller set of stairs, so she perused the rest of the room for anything that might aid in their venture. The windows were sealed closed to prevent draughts in the lamp room, so simply letting the swallow free was not an option. They would have to catch him with something. But what? Her eyes fell upon the tattered blanket draped across the cot. I suppose we can use that, she suggested, pointing to the grey cover. Captain Kendricks nodded in agreement. He took a step within the room, and Abigail followed behind him a safe distance, using his body as a shield. Close the door behind you, he said softly. As she did so, the bird took flight, and Abigail ducked with a scream that sounded remarkably similar to the swallow shrieking overhead. She backed up against the closed door. Captain Kendrick snatched the blanket and a pillow from the cot before moving to her side. The bird is mad, she spat out. Here, he said, extending the pillow to her with a look of amusement. Use this to keep him to one side of the room. I'll see if I cannot capture him with the blanket. Slowly, they approached the bird, flapping frantically against the wall. Captain Kendricks held the blanket in his hand, level with his chest, while Abigail raised the pillow to just below her eyes. Steady now, the captain murmured. Abigail wondered if he spoke to the bird or himself as he moved forward, one small step at a time. When the swallow dove toward them, she screamed again, covering her mouth as the captain dropped to the floor. You are right, he said, scrambling back to stand near the wall. He is mad. Their eyes met, and suddenly the humour of the situation struck her. She began to laugh, and the captain joined in with chuckles of his own. All right, he said after a moment. Let us attempt this once more. But his efforts continued over and over as he tossed the blanket forth, only to have the swallow continually dodge out of its way. Abigail did very little to help the situation. She could not contain her laughter, hiding behind the pillow as the birds circled the room. Keep him over this way, the captain instructed through his laughs. I can't, she cried out, using the pillow as protection, rather than to guide the bird to one side of the room. He will attack me again. You, he questioned. He's been attacking me. Another toss of the blanket, another scream from Abigail, and more laughter erupted, until finally the captain's blanket landed on the sprightly creature. He did it, she exclaimed, tossing the pillow aside and clapping her hands together. His eyes were bright as he looked at her. In a single swoop, he gathered the blanket and the chirping bird carefully in his hands. Quickly now, he said, before he hurts himself. They moved down the stairs and through the house with the bird flapping uncontrollably within the blanket. When they finally reached outside, Abigail closed the door securely behind them and joined Captain Kendricks in front of the house. He settled the blanket on the grass, gently moving two folds of the fabric before taking a step back. The bird moved from one end to the other before bursting forth from the blanket into the sky with joyful chirps. He sailed easily toward the lighthouse, circling around the building with happy swoops. Abigail released a slow breath through her pursed lips. I did not think you would live through that. I did not think we would live through that, he countered with a wink. Her cheeks warmed. The swallow's song reached her ears again as she watched the animal's lively flight across the sea. Thank you, Captain. I could not have captured him myself. It was my pleasure. He turned to face her. You do not have to call me that any longer, though. It's Gavin, if you please. Her heart thumped against her chest. She nodded. And Abigail to you, then? As their eyes met, the discomfort she had felt before dissipated. They were friends, after all. Of course, their situation would take some getting used to but she would grow accustomed to it soon, she was sure. How could she not, with someone so accommodating and helpful as her husband? Perhaps it was time for her to be more accommodating as well. 
Well, she cleared her throat. I will leave you to see to the stable doors. Excuse me. She made it only a few steps forward before she turned to face him again. Would you like to join me this evening, as I refill the lamps? His eyebrows raised, though his gaze softened. I would love to, Abigail. She had never liked the sound of her name as much as she did in that moment. She nodded toward him with the tip of her head, before turning toward the house with a lightened step and a lasting grin on her lips. Chapter 20 Abigail awoke the next morning feeling more refreshed than she could ever remember. She had not received any more sleep than usual, but with the captain, with Gavin by her side the previous night in the watch room, she had begun to feel hopeful. Her days of exhaustion and loneliness were finally coming to an end. They had spent their wedding night climbing stairs, refilling oil and tending to the lamps, comfortably conversing before departing for their individual rooms. She had certainly not expected anything else to occur. After all, they had vowed to maintain a platonic relationship before they had even obtained their license to wed. Their decision was certainly not traditional, but then... Neither was their marriage. They began another day of work together, but Abigail struggled with her shame as Gavin helped her tidy up the lighthouse that had been neglected for weeks. Yet, with his cheerful attitude and willingness to help, her embarrassment faded away. Instead of avoiding him as she had done before, Abigail worked alongside him as they tended to the garden for the first few hours of the morning. Afterward, when she attempted to join him in the stables, however, he held up his hand to stop her. You are welcome to see to the horses still, of course, he said, but I must ask you to leave the mucking out to my care. I cannot bear the thought of you cleaning up after the animals any longer. Abigail was surprised to discover she felt more protected and valued than restricted. As such, she readily agreed with his request. After the stores were cleaned, Gavin tacked up his horse and led him outside. You are certain you do not wish to join me? he asked. No, she replied. I've more chores to see here. Her words were true, but that was not the real reason she did not wish to accompany him to St. Just. After all, she should be with him to make the necessary purchases of food and supplies that Goladuin had been severely lacking for all too long but she could not stomach the thought of happening upon anyone who might have heard about their marriage. At least not yet. The obligatory pleasantries, thinly veiled questions and inquiring eyes would be too much for Abigail to handle while she was growing used to her own marriage herself. She waved goodbye to Gavin, returning indoors only when he disappeared around the ridge. Wandering aimlessly about the house, she pushed aside the strange notion that she missed him. After all, she had spent all morning and the previous day with him. She could not possibly miss him after that. Could she? To distract herself from her confusion, Abigail set about straightening the sitting room. She opened the windows first thing, then knelt on the floor as she organised the worn books on the small shelf at the side of the room. She had only just begun to tuck in the torn spines and loose pages when a knock sounded at the door. Who on earth could that be? She stood, taking only a single step before two women's voices from the window reached her ear. Her breathing shallowed. The Steadmans had not come to Goladuin in years, ever since Uncle Ellis had rejected Mrs. Steadman but Abigail could certainly guess as to why the women appeared at her door then. Avoiding speaking with others about her marriage would be more difficult than she had expected. The voices continued, and she crept closer to the window. All she could see were the tips of their pink and lavender gowns, gently flowing in the breeze. Why did we come here, Mamma? Miss Steadman whined in a whisper. Miss Moore despises us. She will not answer the door. She despises everyone, my dear, Miss Steadman returned softly. Her words pierced through the wall Abigail had built around her heart. They were not true. 
Just because she preferred staying in the comfort and safety of Goladuin rather than out in society did not mean she disliked everyone. Although Miss Stedman's assumption had been correct, she did despise the two of them. We mustn't allow her primitive nature to intimidate us into ending our acquaintance with Captain Kendricks, Miss Stedman continued. He is a gentleman. He should not have to pay for the sins of his purported wife. Sins? What do you mean, Mama? Abigail's brow furrowed, a sickness rising in her throat. Did Mrs. Stedman know of Abigail's past? If she did, she would not hesitate to tell her daughter. The woman was undoubtedly trying to make Abigail sound worse than she was. Typical. Never you mind, Mrs. Stedman replied. Her knock sounded at the door again. We must simply help the captain realise his mistake in marrying the woman. It should not prove difficult, as their marriage is founded entirely upon charity. Abigail pulled back. Gavin had assured her that others need not know the reasoning behind their marriage. For all intents and purposes, they had done so out of love. But she would be daft indeed if she did not think the rumours would eventually surface. She had no doubt that Mrs. Stedman had started them herself. The woman continued. You must simply show how amiable you are, my dear, she told her daughter. And if we remain by the captain's side long enough, he shall turn to you for comfort when he yearns for the happiness he cannot find within the confines of Goladuin. A blow landed to Abigail's stomach. The woman could not be serious. But mother, came Miss Stedman's surprised words. I know you wished for me to form an attachment with him before, as did I, but he is married now. Does this not change? Hush, Constance, Mrs. Stedman scolded in a vehement whisper. An unhappy union can hardly be considered a marriage. But will my reputation not be tarnished for pursuing a man who is already attached? Miss Stedman asked. Not if we do so inconspicuously, her mother replied. And if Captain Kendricks does accept me, will he not be frowned upon for leaving his wife? Mrs. Stedman's short, cold laugh slid down Abigail's back in a shiver. No one would blame him if he did leave her. There was a pause before her daughter spoke again. I don't understand why I cannot find another gentleman more suited to me. Why must I still pursue the captain? Because, my dear, it is becoming less and less likely that you will find a man willing to marry you. Abigail cringed. What a lovely mother the woman was. The captain had taken a marked interest in you before Miss Moore deceived him, Mrs. Stedman continued. At any rate, it is our duty, as respectable ladies, to ensure he is happily settled. Abigail didn't believe the words for a single moment. She knew why the woman pressed her daughter toward Gavin. It was the same reasoning behind everything. She despised Abigail and wished for her unhappiness. It was as simple as that. This hardly seems proper, mother, Miss Stedman mumbled. Proper? Mrs. Stedman scoffed. What is proper is purely dictated by... Their voices muffled, and Abigail was no longer able to make out their words. She backed away from the window. Mrs. Stedman had never liked her. The things she had said about Abigail behind Uncle Ellis's back, complaints against her gaudy red hair and her ugly, freckled complexion, had scarred Abigail's childhood. But she was no longer a child. Those memories were, indeed, etched permanently within her mind, but she did not have to add any more of their writing onto her soul. As they knocked again, Abigail moved through the house with a determined step. She would open that door for one reason, to expel the women from her property and demand they never return. Miss Moore, Mrs. Stedman greeted as they came face to face. Good morning. Abigail stared with a hardened expression. My name is Mrs. Kendricks. The mother and daughter exchanged glances. So it is, Mrs. Stedman said. You must forgive my mistake. After all, we've only just learned of your marriage. Indeed, 
We were surprised to hear of it. And pleased, of course. Abigail ignored the woman's feigned sweetness. You will be disappointed to discover that you have made the journey here for nothing, as my husband is away at the moment. Mrs. Steadman hid her discontent well, as her daughter merely picked at the red ribbon of her reticule. Oh, we have not come to call upon the captain alone, have we, Constance? Mrs. Steadman said. No, mother. Then allow me to disappoint you further, Abigail said, folding her arms. I am unavailable as well to accept your call. Mrs. Steadman's brows arched. Indeed? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Perhaps we may come at a more convenient time. Abigail's insides burned at the thought of them calling when Gavin would actually be present. That would certainly put Mrs. Steadman's plans into action. Unless, of course, Abigail could end the woman's tactics before they even began. We will be far too busy to take social calls for the foreseeable future, she said bluntly. I hope you understand. Miss Steadman shifted uncomfortably upon the landing. Mrs. Steadman's eyes flashed before her thin lips stretched into a smile. I see. Well, do give our best to the captain. Abigail made no response. She would have slammed the door directly in their faces had she not wished to ensure they left her property. The Steadmans curtsied and made their way down the short steps. But Mrs. Steadman turned back to her. Oh, I nearly forgot. She opened her reticule and produced a small note. An invitation to our dinner party taking place in a fortnight. I understand you are beholden to your little lighthouse. But do remember, both of you need not come. She extended the invitation with an innocent smile. Abigail considered taking the note and bopping it atop the woman's pompous head, but she merely snatched it from her fingers and withdrew inside. Abigail closed the door behind her and headed straight for the sitting room, where she flung the invitation into the embers without hesitation. The edges curled against the smouldering logs until a single orange flame blossomed on the front of the paper. Abigail had never been to a dinner party before and she would certainly not have the Steadmans be her first. They will not step foot in this house again, she said, as the writing on the invitation, Gavin's last name, her last name, was swallowed in the flame. Nor I in theirs. At the sound of an approaching horse, Abigail made for the door, wondering if Gavin had seen the Steadmans' departing carriage. But she stepped outside to find not the captain, but a postman. He reined in his snorting horse, pawing at the ground, and extended a letter toward her. She walked down the steps and retrieved it with a grateful nod. The postman rode away in a gallop as Abigail eyed the letter with curiosity. The postage had been prepaid, and the letter was addressed to both herself and Gavin. She turned the correspondence over to where the crest of Trinity House was pressed into the wax. The establishment must have received her letter, informing them that she and Gavin would be married, and decided to send a congratulatory note. She broke the seal and read the letter. Captain and Mrs Kendricks, we are pleased to hear the news of your recent engagement and look forward to having the captain join our rank of head keepers. We are also pleased to see the strides you have both taken to ensure the success of Goladuin Lighthouse. However, as Mrs. Kendricks will be aware, after years of working alongside us, certain requirements must be met in order for our agreement to continue. Upon our last visit, a few months past, we noted a number of items that had been grossly neglected. For your convenience, we have included a list of those items that must be kept up to our high standards. This list will need to be accomplished in two weeks' time. If it is not, Trinity House will have no choice but to forfeit your contract between us. You may expect a representative to arrive in a fortnight to inspect your work. Until then, we wish you well in your endeavours. Sincerely, Mr Phillips of Trinity House. With a sinking feeling, Abigail pored over the list provided them. Most of the items included the general upkeep of the lighthouse. 
The property required trimmed grass, tidy grounds and gardens, and mended fences. The house itself needed fresh paint and new windows. The list grew more extensive when referring to the inside, covering everything from clean hearths and newly painted walls to fixed floorboards and well-kept furniture. The task was impossible. They would hardly be able to order most of the necessary supplies. Glass for the windows, slate for the roof, new tools, in the time allotted. There was no possible way they could accomplish what was required of them, as well as looking after the lamps every night and through every storm. So what were they to do? With the list in hand, her arm dropped to her side, and she stared up at the lighthouse. Nothing. Nothing could be done. She had known the requirements from the beginning, and she had fallen short of them. She swallowed hard. The lighthouse was supposed to be safe. Her new life with Gavin was supposed to be simple. And yet nothing was. Not while she still suffered with consequences of her uncle's choices. Consequences that spread their invading fingers through her life like a disease. She wondered yet again if she would ever be free of the man she had refused to think about since discovering his debts. The man who had promised so much and had delivered so little. Chapter 21 Gavin rushed home from St Just, anxious to share with Abigail the good news he'd received while in town. After brushing down his horse, he entered the house and called out to her. I'm in the kitchen, she softly responded. He followed the sound of her voice to find her kneading a wad of dough on the kitchen table, her back turned toward him. There you are, he said with a cheerful smile. I have exciting news that I believe you will be pleased to hear. Oh? His smile faltered with her less than enthusiastic response. Are you all right? Of course, she responded. She sounded fine enough, but when she sniffed, he paused. Was she crying? Abigail? He moved to her side, but she ducked her head, a few stray curls falling across her temples. What's the matter? Nothing, I assure you. Her voice broke. He couldn't understand it. What on earth happened while he was away? Did you order what you needed? She asked clearing her throat. He hesitated, changing subjects. After all, he needed to know what was wrong with her in order to help her. Yes, I believe I remembered everything, he replied. And did you finish the chores that needed seeing to? Nearly. She lifted the dough from the table and slapped it back down. The Stedmans called while you were away. Understanding finally dawned. Gavin recalled the conversation he'd had with Abigail long ago, when she'd ridden away from him after seeing the Stedmans in St. Just. It was clear that there was a great animosity between her and the women, though he still could not comprehend why. But if Abigail was in tears, then surely something terrible had happened. How long did they stay? he asked. She pressed her knuckles into the dough. Only a moment. After they left, a letter arrived. From Trinity House. He narrowed his eyes. So the Stedmans had not upset her. Trinity House had? He rubbed his jaw. What did they have to say? She motioned to the spot on the table next to her, though she did not stop her kneading. He noticed for the first time a large leather-bound book and a stack of papers resting nearby. The letter is there, if you care to read it, she said, her voice becoming apathetic. Her tears had dried, though her eyes were still red. I can summarise it for you, if you'd rather I do that. He stood beside her, eyeing her warily, as he picked up the crease paper on top of the others. He quickly scanned the words as she spoke. They said we must complete the list they have enclosed within a fortnight, she began her fingers digging into the mixture. Or we must forfeit our contract with Trinity House. Gavin's eyebrows lowered. How could Trinity House give them an ultimatum 
despite knowing Abigail's previous plight with her uncle and lack of help. He eyed the extensive list provided for them, shaking his head in disbelief. No one could complete so many tasks in that short a time, not even with an entire household to help. I will write to them straight away, he said. We must request more time. But Abigail shook her head, rolling her palms across the dough with vigour. No, they will not extend the deadline. His frustration grew. He had more than enough money to fund the lighthouse for years, even with no extra wages coming in. He had a mind to sever the agreement himself before Trinity House had the chance. But to work with no oil provided and no pay apart from the occasional gratuity from passing sailors, it would be silly. He did not like the thought of working with an establishment who extended impossible demands, but it would be far wiser to remain in good standing with Trinity House. So then, what were they to do? He paused, and Abigail's resolute words finally sank in from earlier. They will not extend the deadline, she had said. He glanced toward her as she worked the dough harder. Her jaw was clenched, her lips pursed. How do you know they will not allow us more time? He asked. She did not look up. Abigail? Still, she worked the dough. Abigail, please, stop. Finally, she paused, her arms straight, hands resting atop the dough. I found documents of my uncle's. An uneasy feeling crept upon him. What documents? She sniffed, removing her hands from the dough and wiping them on her apron before rifling through the papers Gavin had left untouched. These she said. They were in his trunk. I did not have the courage to look through them until today, but now I wish I hadn't. He retrieved the letters she extended toward him. These were from Trinity House last year. They told him that they would end the contract with us if the lighthouse did not begin to show improvements. They gave him months to do it, but in these letters it is made clear that my uncle ceased behaving like the gentleman he claimed to be. She pointed to the middle paragraph of the letter Gavin held in his hands. Read this. Gavin lowered his neck. We understand your frustrations, though we have done our best to help. We have sent you the extra funds you have requested to hire another assistant. Keep us informed, and please know that if you continue in your hostile way with your threats, Trinity House will be forced to take action against you. Gavin stopped reading though his mouth remained open with surprise. He was threatening them? Abigail raised a shoulder, her eyes still focused on the pages in his hands. I had no idea, nor was I aware that they sent wages for another assistant. Uncle always told me Trinity House refused their approval of us hiring another to help. I can only assume that Uncle used the funds for his gaming. A heaviness weighed upon Gavin's heart. When would the lies, the deceit end? How much more damage could the deceased man cause to his niece? He glanced up at her, a shadow of anger, a betrayal dimming her eyes. She had been through so much. How was she to find the courage again to go on? She moved to the large book on the table, flapping the cover back and thumbing through the pages. This is the logbook he kept for years before purchasing the one we use now, she said. He always insisted on completing the daily log himself, saying it was the one thing he could do that I could not. And now I know why. Her finger slid along the line that listed the wages received from Trinity House and the amount of money spent on supplies. I've compared the dates on the letters from Trinity House to these. He falsified the numbers, then made it appear as if we needed more supplies. Again, he must have sold the extra provisions received and used the money to fund even more gaming. Her voice broke and she finally looked up at him, her blue eyes brimming with tears. This went on for years, Gavin. I had no idea we had become destitute merely because of his gaming habits. How could I have been so stupid, so blind as to not see what was happening? 
Gavin watched in silence as her demeanour changed, her brow lowering as she continued. I went without food, she said, slamming the book shut. I went without new clothing for years. We went without an assistant as I worked myself to exhaustion each day for months. To see now how we wasted our money. The money that I earned while he sat by and complained about his injury. I can hardly bear to think on it. Gavin winced at the obvious turmoil taking place within her. He was at a loss for words. He could not understand the man's behaviour either. How could Mr. Moore, Abigail's only family, have done such a thing? He made me promise to keep Gulladuan, she said, tears spilling down her cheeks. How could he, knowing that he was leaving behind his debts, his secrets and his lies? He was a selfish coward, just like his brother. His brother? Did Abigail refer to her own father? She had never mentioned him before. In truth, Gavin had wondered at times if she had even known the man at all before his death. But now was not the time to dwell on things he did not know. That would not ease Abigail's burden. But then, he knew of nothing that would. With a silent prayer heavenward, he asked for guidance to help him ease the woman's pain in any way he could. Abigail? He said softly, waiting until her eyes met his. Your uncle, like all of us, was not perfect. I can only imagine the guilt that must have racked his conscience when he thought of you. It could very well be the reason he kept away from you. Perhaps even the reason he drank. Of course, there is no excuse for his behaviour. But no matter his mistakes, I believe that he loved you. Deeply. Her eyebrows drew together, her chin quivered, and Gavin could no longer keep himself from reaching out to her. He set the papers onto the table and wrapped his arms around her. She returned his embrace, her arms sliding around his waist. I fear his death was no accident. She whispered against his waistcoat. That he chose to... Gavin hushed her softly. Do not dwell on such thoughts he urged. Of course he had feared the very same, but they would never know the truth behind Mr. Moore's death, and thinking on it would only drive them mad. He rested his cheek against the top of her head, holding her securely within his arms. I'm sorry you have married into all of this, she said. If only you would have known beforehand you... My decision would still be the same, he interrupted. She raised her head from his chest and looked up at him with searching eyes, and Gavin's breath caught in his throat. Her auburn hair trailed down her temples in soft waves. Her high cheekbones had reddened slightly with her crying, and her lips, femininely curved, were parted as if she wished to speak. But in the next moment she pulled away from his grasp and faced the papers on the table. Gavin felt her absence keenly, he had enjoyed holding her against him. Too much. Such a thing did not bode well for the relationship they had agreed upon. He never once regretted his offer to maintain a platonic relationship, even now. After all, he would not have Abigail think for one moment that his proposal had been based on anything other than helping her and Goloduin, for that is all it had been. Of course, that did not mean he didn't have hope for the future that one day their friendship might grow into something more, something deep and abiding. But he knew Abigail was not yet at that point. And he was more than happy to wait. After all, they had only been married for two days. They had a lifetime left. Gavin? Abigail stared at him expectantly. He blinked. Yes? I asked what you thought we should do, she responded motioning to the papers on the table. In regard to the list. The list? What could be done with the list? He picked up the paper, focusing on the items once again. Well, I think it's highly unlikely that we will finish all of this in the time allotted. But I suggest we prove to them 
that we are, at the very least, willing to try. He lowered the list and looked up at her, recalling the good news he had been excited to share with her when he'd first arrived home. I spoke with Lieutenant Harris while in St. Just this morning. He was going to Penzance soon to wait for his arm to heal, but I suggested he work for us while he is on leave. She moved toward the wad of dough sticking to the table. Can he help with his injury? Gavin pursed his lips. I'm certain there is something on that list he could do one-handed. His lip curved. I know he would appreciate the extra funds while he awaits reassignment. Well, if you think he will benefit us, then by all means, hire him, Abigail said, sprinkling flour across the dough. Gavin was pleasantly surprised with her agreeing to his offer. He pushed a little more. I also heard word that Mr. Honeyset, do you know the fisherman who lives nearby? She nodded. His mother and sister are looking to increase their income as well. They could work as our cook and serving girl in the mornings, as well as any other tasks that we may need help with before the inspection. She brushed aside a stray curl with her finger and left behind a trail of flour on her cheek. Would you expect them to look after the light? Oh no, of course not, he said, finally understanding her hesitance. Not unless you wish them to. Her shoulders visibly relaxed, and she nodded once more. Very well. I suppose with six more hands our work will seem light. Well, five more hands. He chuckled at her joke. How remarkable she was. Even after discovering more about her uncle's dark past, she was determined to make things work. Yes, she was an amazing woman, strong and beautiful. He reached forward, brushing his thumb across the flower on her cheek and she looked up at him with wide eyes. I'm sorry, Abigail, he said, with another stroke to her skin, though the flower had long since gone. About your uncle, I mean. But I wish you to know I'm here to help you. You need not go through this life alone. Not any more. As she smiled up at him, he could finally say that for once, belief shone in her eyes. And that was progress, indeed. Chapter 22 With Gavin's help, Abigail's mood improved drastically. Though still worried over all the improvements of the lighthouse, she felt comfort in knowing she was no longer alone in her fight to keep Goladuin burning brightly. The very next day, she and Gavin had gone to the Honeyset's fishing cottage. They arranged for Mrs. Honeyset and her 15-year-old daughter Poppy to come to the lighthouse early each morning. They would help with the necessary tasks and prepare the meals for the day, before returning home to look after their own house. After their agreement was settled upon, the Kendrickses made for St. Just in search of Lieutenant Harris. When Gavin stopped short of the inn, however, Abigail eyed him with a look of confusion. What is it? she asked. Did you forget something? No, but I thought of somewhere else we needed to be right now. She waited for him to continue. And where is that? I will see to Harris while you... He motioned to the shop they stood nearby. Go in there. Her eyes followed his, settling eventually on the window in front of them. In bold red paint, she read the words... Follets. Modiste. Milliner gloves. Hosiery. Hats. Parasols. Fans. Gavin held out his hand to her, but she refused to accept it. No, absolutely not. Come along, he urged. Surely you knew I would suggest this sooner or later. How long did you think I would allow you to dress in that drab brown dress? It is not drab, she protested. Though, as she looked down at it, she could not think of a better word to describe the colour and style of the dress she had worn for years. At any rate, why would I need anything finer? It would hardly be wise to work in a silk gown now, would it? You are the wife of a captain, Mrs Kendricks, Gavin said. You had best get used to the idea that you will soon be invited to balls and parties. She looked away. Guilt pricked at her conscience. She still had yet to mention the Stedman's dinner party invitation. 
now lying as ash in the bottom of the hearth. But at the thought of attending a public event in which mother and daughter would be present, she was fine keeping the secret to herself. Besides, she could not go out. She had the lighthouse to tend to. Abigail, are you coming? She paused. Gavin, if this is about what I said yesterday, that uncle did not buy me new dresses, no, not at all. You are merely in desperate need. I would not say desperate, she mumbled. He eyed her dubiously. How often have you mended that dress? She had lost count long ago, but she would never let Gavin know such a thing. Once or twice? He laughed. I can see six or seven separate lines of stitches on just one sleeve. Before Abigail could poke fun at his own exaggeration, the door to the shop opened. The bell rang overhead, and Mrs. Follett exited in a flourish of deep purple skirts. Good morning, Captain Kendricks. Mrs. Kendricks? The shop owner greeted. Abigail pulled her lips to one side of her mouth. So, everyone knew of her marriage to the captain now. She was sure she could put the blame on Mrs. Steadman. She wouldn't be surprised if the woman had also told the town how rudely Abigail had dismissed her. Do forgive me, Mrs. Follett continued, but I could not help but notice the both of you out here whilst I updated the window display. She motioned over her shoulder. We received new fans only this morning. They are the latest fashion. I assure you. Would you care to see them closer? No, thank you, Abigail said. But Gavin placed a hand at the small of her back and gently pushed her forward. She would not have moved had his touch not made her lose all sense. You have read our minds, Mrs. Follett, Gavin said. My lovely wife was just about to inquire within for a great many items. The shopkeeper's dark eyes widened with glee. How wonderful! Do come in, my dear. I will be more than happy to look after you. Go on, Mrs. Kendricks, Gavin said, pushing Abigail forward once more. I will return soon. Oh, Mrs. Follett, my dear wife will protest anything you suggest, so I really must rely upon you to see that she acquires everything a lady needs, or simply desires. Mrs. Follett looked as if she had just been entrusted with the crown jewels herself. Of course, Captain. I will devote my attention to her entirely until we are finished. Now run along, so we may be about our business. She laced her arm through Abigail's and pulled her toward the door. Abigail followed along with a helpless glance in Gavin's direction, but he merely gave her an encouraging nod before she disappeared into the shop. Abigail had never been poked and prodded so much in all her life as she was for the next two hours. When she had first come to Cornwall, her uncle had taken her to be fitted for several fine dresses. But as she had grown, their money had faded. Or rather, her uncle had wasted it away. But not even the unpleasant thought of his actions could diminish the strange delight now billowing within her chest. Being fussed over certainly was a change a change she did not mind in the least. Of course she protested each new dress, undergarment, outerwear and accessory that was thrust toward her. But Mrs. Follett proved even more stubborn than Abigail, who was measured and who chose fabric for four new gowns and two new work dresses. By the end of it, Abigail could not fathom how much all of it had cost. She reminded herself that it was Gavin's choice if he wanted to entrust his fortune to a frivolous shop owner, then so be it. At the thought of her husband, a warmth radiated within her soul. Would she ever grow used to his kindness, his thoughtfulness? He had seen yet another one of her needs and had immediately sought to fix it. She knew she was silly to become sentimental over simple gowns, but it was so much more than that. She felt respected as if Gavin believed her to be of some great value and wished her to dress as such. Having his good opinion meant the world to her. After being assured that the items and the bill would be sent to Goladuin when ready, Abigail left the shop and breathed in the fresh air outside.
She could almost see herself wearing one of the fine gowns, her hair piled high in curls and a ribbon tied fashionably beneath her bust, finally matching Gavin with his own tailored clothing. She knew attending a dinner party or ball was impossible, as they couldn't leave the lighthouse unattended. But she could not deny, despite her reservations about being out in society, the appeal of spending an evening out, completely at her leisure, on the arm of her handsome, caring husband. Gavin moved up the road with a happy sigh. Harris had accepted his offer. With three new people to help at Goladuan, Gavin was certain he could find more time to spend with his wife, and not while working. His lips curved as he imagined Abigail dressed in something other than brown. Perhaps in a gown that accentuated her figure, highlighted her auburn hair, and brought out the blue of her eyes. His heart tremored at the thought. Yes, he was more than ready to see her as the lady he knew her to be. With an easy gait, Gavin made for Mrs. Follett's. His mind was so preoccupied with thoughts of Abigail that when he rounded the corner of a shop and came face to face with Miles Sanders, he came to an abrupt halt. Miles, he said in surprise. The young sailor's face immediately contorted with anger. He spat at Gavin and turned in the other direction. Wait, Gavin called out, running to block his path. Miles, you must understand. Get out my way, Miles shouted. He pushed with all his force, but Gavin held his ground. What happened with you and your brother? I am sorry for how things unfolded, but I did not mean for... Miles cursed, attempting to spit at Gavin again. You wanted him dead. You planned it all. Your brother chose to assault me. I did not. You be the reason he's dead. Miles launched toward him, fury in his jaded eyes, but Gavin pushed him aside with ease. Calm down, Miles. The boy's chest heaved with anger. He clearly intended on charging again, but when his eyes flickered above Gavin's shoulder, he backed away and ran in the opposite direction. Confused, Gavin looked behind him to discover Abigail watching with wide eyes. Blast, she must have seen the whole ordeal. Are you all right? she asked. Gavin scanned the crowds, ignoring the looks from others. There was no sign of the boy. He turned back to Abigail, lowering his voice. His brother's execution has finally been carried out. Abigail offered him her handkerchief, motioning to the spittle on his jacket lapel. You ought to leave him be. You may only provoke him further. Yes, he said, accepting the handkerchief with a nod and cleaning himself off. Yes, you are right. Chapter 23 with the Honeysets and Lieutenant Harris helping around the lighthouse, Abigail and Gavin pushed forward with a list of improvements to Goladuan. Abigail found enjoyment working alongside Mrs. Honeyset and Poppy, their quiet, kind nature fitting in with Abigail's own reserved personality, while Gavin and Lieutenant Harris laughed as they worked, speaking about their days together at sea. The work was difficult. Each night, Abigail was sorer and more fatigued than the day before. But her soul was no longer weary, and that was a welcome change. One evening, after the others had left, Abigail and Gavin stood outside, washing the windows after dinner. A breeze blew the tall grass against her legs and the side of the house, and the smell of the ocean, fresh and inviting, sailed under her nose. She slopped her wet rag against the glass, scrubbing at a stubborn bird dropping before glancing to Gavin. He had paused in his washing, his eyes focused on the sea. She followed his line of sight to where a ship floated slowly on the gleaming water. Do you miss it? she asked, being aboard a ship. His eyes remained on the vessel. At times. But I've always been more than content on land, especially when I have a view with the sea. He seemed to speak truthfully enough, but still she hesitated. So you do not regret your decision, then, to request retirement? She had been wanting to ask the question for some time. 
He seemed to have made the decision to take his leave from the Navy rather suddenly. Could it not have been an impulsive mistake? His warm eyes focused on her. I do not regret my choice at all. I am exactly where I wish to be. Hope lifted her heart and she returned her attention to the window. After a moment, Gavin spoke again. Abigail, I have been thinking. He dipped his rag into the bucket of water between them. Do you think, perhaps, I might be ready to look after the light myself this evening? Her hand froze against the window. Oh, was all she could manage to say. She shouldn't have been surprised. After all, Gavin had been helping her with the lamps for over a week now. He was more than capable of looking after them himself. But was she capable of relinquishing her control? If you wish me to wait, I will, he said, using a dry rag to wipe down the glass before him. Had the man no faults? His patience pained her. She had to allow him to see to the light. He had more than proven himself, and, dare she admit it, she trusted him. No, she said with a firm nod. You are more than ready. You may see to them this evening if you wish to. His eyes brightened. I will be down shortly. He dropped the rag into the grass and darted to the top of the landing in a single leap, disappearing within the house. She paused, staring at the open door. Gavin? He ran straight back out of the house without a glance in her direction. Oh yes, the oil. And he ran around the side of the house to the oil hutch. She shook her head in amusement. The humour of the situation was soon lost to her, however, as night fell and she lay awake in her bed, staring wide-eyed at the ceiling. After years, her body had simply grown used to waking up at the routine times each night. She knew Gavin's had quickly adjusted as well, as she had no longer needed to wake him for each refilling. But as a precaution, she had given him the clockwork device that her uncle had purchased for her when she had first begun waking up for shifts. It worked much like the rotating mechanism of the lighthouse. She turned a small wheel and a weight at the end slowly pulled down until it reached the bottom, ringing a bell at the top. However, the device would prove unnecessary, for as the secondary filling lurked, thunder rumbled outside and lightning flashed through her curtains. She groaned. Of course a storm would occur that evening. Now Gavin would have to remain awake the entire night. He knew that, did he not? Perhaps she ought to remind him, just as a precaution. She grasped onto her blankets. No, she would remain in her room the entire night. Gavin knew what was required of him. He would stay awake. He would notify her if a shipwreck occurred and she trusted him. With the words repeating over and over in her mind, she eventually fell into a restless sleep, broken masts and raging fires filling what little dreams she had. When the first ray of light finally crept across her closed eyelids, she jolted awake. Relief flooded her mind. Daylight had broken through the clouds, and the lighthouse still stood. She fell back onto her pillow with a contented sigh. She had done it. No, Gavin had done it, and with such a comforting thought, she drifted back to sleep. Hours later, she awoke with a groggy yawn, stretching widely as she rolled out of bed. She could not remember the last time she had slept so late. Rubbing the sleep from her eyes, she dressed, greeted the honey sets who worked away in the kitchen, and then made for outside. She winced at the bright sunlight. Ah, look who's finally risen to help us this morning. She looked toward the stables to see Gavin's teasing eyes in her direction. He and Lieutenant Harris propped up a long piece of wood against the side of the stable, working to expand the paddock. I told Lieutenant Harris that we should not expect you until much later today, Gavin continued, as I'm fairly certain you did not receive a moment of sleep last night. He cocked a knowing brow but she looked on and feigned innocence. I managed to sleep just fine, thank you. He gave a disbelieving shake of his head. 
Well, as you must be well aware, Goladuin still stands. Did you agree to pay Lieutenant Harris to stay up late in the watch room while you slept? She teased. Lieutenant Harris chuckled. Before Gavin could respond, their attention was drawn to an approaching carriage. Who is this then? He asked. The horses stopped and he came to stand beside her. They waited as a round man stepped down from the carriage. Do you know him? Gavin asked. No, I do not. The gentleman placed his hat on his balding head before approaching them. His white cravat was tied perfectly beneath his chin. Captain Kendricks, I presume? Yes, sir, Gavin said. He introduced Lieutenant Harris and Abigail before returning his attention to the stranger. And you are? I am Mr. Cull. Trinity House has sent me to inspect the property. Abigail exchanged glances with Gavin. But we were told we had a fortnight. It has only been one week. Due to recent information that has come to light concerning how this lighthouse was once run, my superiors have insisted that I arrive today to complete the inspection. Abigail flushed. Before, Goladuin had shared impeccable trust with the institution. Now there was only a wary relationship. Yet another thing her uncle had damaged. She and Gavin had written to Trinity House days before of her uncle's deceit and theft of their money. Gavin had also offered to pay the difference. Mr. Cull was clearly there because of the correspondence. As you can see, we were unable to finish everything, Mr. Cull, Gavin said. Abigail cast her eyes around her. The grounds were in far better shape than they had been days ago. The grass had been trimmed, no doubt by Gavin that very morning, and fresh flowers were planted near the front of the house. With the fence around the garden mended, the chicken hutch no longer propped up against the cliffside, and the stable doors finally fixed and working beautifully. The lighthouse was beginning to show great improvement. But they were still far from completion. I understand, Captain, Mr. Cull said. However, I must make my full inspection now of Glau... Gol... Glauden Lighthouse. Goladuin, Abigail and Gavin corrected at the same time. Their eyes met and her heart felt lighter, despite Mr. Cull's presence. Gavin was there for her and the lighthouse. She was not alone any longer. However, as Mr. Cull began his inspection, her nerves returned. She tapped her fingers against her folded arms as the man walked around the oil hutch, making a mark on his paper. Abigail? Gavin spoke with arched brows as he continued his work on the paddock. Perhaps you ought to find something else to do to occupy your mind? She looked back to Mr. Cull as he stared at the length of the lighthouse and made more markings. What is he writing, do you think? She asked, ignoring Gavin's suggestion. Surely he did not expect the lighthouse to be flawless. He will see the honest effort we have made. Try not to worry too much about it. She began to pace across the grass. Should she go inside, tidy up a bit before he had the chance to go in himself? A sudden thought struck her, and her heart felt as if it dropped into her stomach. Gavin, I did not see to the lamp room this morning. Oh, it must be in such a state. How could I have forgotten? She made for the house, but Gavin stopped her, grasping her hand and pulling her back. I saw to the light, remember? I assure you, I left the room very orderly. Of course. She wrung her hands together as Mr. Cull appeared at the other side of the lighthouse, having rounded the building. Gavin returned to the paddock with Lieutenant Harris. Did you check the refractors? She asked. They needed polishing. Yes, I did. But I never showed you how to polish them. You did, on several occasions. He glanced to Lieutenant Harris with a veiled smile. But did I ever... Yes, you did. She pursed her lips. You did not know what I was about to say. You were very thorough, Abigail. I'm certain you did not forget to teach me a single thing. She sighed. Very well. Only assure me that you trimmed the wicks, and then I shall leave you be. 
His face fell, his eyes widening. Oh, no. That is what I forgot. She gasped, fingers covering her mouth. That will be just the thing Mr. Cull will criticise us for. How? Her words faded as Gavin's lips twitched. She dropped her hand, propping it on her waist. That was hardly amusing, Captain Kendricks. He chuckled to himself, lifting the beam of wood to the other end of the paddock. Was he this insufferable at sea? She asked Lieutenant Harris. Yes, ma'am, even more so when we both served as lieutenants. I learned my bad behaviour from you, Harris, Gavin said to his mate. Abigail could imagine the both of them teasing the others aboard the ships they manned. She would have liked to see Gavin as a lieutenant. Or perhaps as a regular seaman, rigging up the ship, his shirt removed to deal with the heat from the glaring sun above, his muscles working as he laughed with his shipmates. The front door opened, and Abigail blinked away the image to see Mr. Cull disappear inside. Now she could no longer see him. What if he made even more notes about the inside of their home? She groaned. I'd say you were in need of a distraction. Gavin dropped his tools to the ground and walked toward her. Harris, I'm sorry, but I think we ought to end our work for the day. If I do not see to my wife, she will drive herself mad. Lieutenant Harris, ever cheerful, agreed to return on the morrow. Gavin went inside next to tell the Honeysets the same thing, and they soon left as well. When they were alone, Abigail blew out an annoyed huff. We do not need to stop working. After all, it is the best sort of distraction. Gavin offered her his arm. No more working for you. You need to discover other, more relaxing ways to distract you. Hesitantly, she took his arm. Her fingers warmed against his flesh. His sleeves rolled to his upper arms. Well then, what do you suggest? A nice, leisurely stroll along the beach. Chapter 24 Abigail's lips pulled into a frown. A stroll? On the beach? She could not remember when she had last spent leisure time on the sand. She and Gavin walked down the winding slope and reached Goladuin Beach in a matter of moments. They moved to just out of the water's reach as Gavin sat down in the sand motioning for her to sit next to him. She tilted her head. I thought you said you wanted to walk. Yes, but now I wish to sit. He leaned back, his legs crossed at his ankles as he patted the sand next to him. Come, sit. She wrinkled her nose. I do not know how you can rest comfortably with that. She waved her hand in the air with a flourish toward the lighthouse and the man within looming above us. Because there is nothing more we can do. His brown eyes looked out to the sea. Please, sit down with me. With a sigh, Abigail relented, plopping down next to him. She tucked her legs beneath her as she rested one hand in the sand. There, I have sat down. Now what do you wish me to do? Now I wish for you to relax. Breathe. He motioned to the sea. When was the last time you simply enjoyed the scenery around you? She raised her chin. I do so nearly every day. That is entirely untrue, Abigail Kendricks, and you know it. Her innocent expression did not last long when he raised his eyebrows toward her with a knowing look. Abigail had never seen that shade of brown before in a pair of eyes. In the sunlight, they shone nearly copper. Very well, she said, facing forward, if only to stop herself from gazing further into his captivating eyes. I concede. Perhaps I do not enjoy the scenery nearly as much as I used to. I suppose I have been distracted. Understandably, he said. Much has occurred in your life these past few weeks. However, it is good to slow down at times, to appreciate this beauty. Not everyone is as fortunate as we are to live here. That was true enough. Before her uncle's death, even with the amount of work she had seen to, she had still taken the time to enjoy the sunset, to feel the wind caressing her face, to hear the gulls crying above the sea. Perhaps Gavin was right. Perhaps she did need to relax, 
to appreciate the beauty around her, as she once did. With a calming breath, she looked to the water. The waves changed colours as they curved toward the land. Silver in the sun's light as they peaked. Black beneath the waves' crests. Sapphire blue where the water stretched out endlessly before them. The sand beneath her hands warmed her skin, and the salty sea breeze stroked her face. The sea had always proved to soothe her nerves. Why had she stayed away for so long? May I ask you a question, Abigail? Her eyes squinted in the bright sunshine. Of course. Why do you never speak about your past? I mean, before you came to go Luduan. She struggled to grasp onto the peace she had felt before, though it slipped through her fingers like sand. I do, on occasion. She leaned forward, circling her finger around in the sand. She'd known he would ask to know more about her eventually. Perhaps if she offered to answer his questions now, he would be satisfied enough to lay his curiosity to rest, to not dig so deeply into what she wished to remain covered. What would you like to know? He seemed somewhat surprised at her willingness, but continued anyway. You mentioned you were at boarding school before Mr. Moore brought you here. Where was the school located? That was an easy enough answer. In a small town in Cheshire. Had you ever been to Cornwall before you came here? On a visit, perhaps? No. Another easy answer. Did you return to Cheshire after your uncle brought you here? No. Nor do I ever intend to. His eyes studied her. Your uncle mentioned that his family home was in Staffordshire. Were you born there as well before being sent to school? She smoothed the sand next to her with her palm, focusing on the crumbling texture as she stared at the water sliding up the beach. No, my mother bore me elsewhere. She knew he expected more from her, but what else could she say? Were you close to her? He asked next. As the waves receded, bubbles clung to the sand in front of her before popping silently into the air. Not particularly. She died shortly before I was sent to school, so I don't remember much about her. So your father chose to send you then? No. My... my grandmother did. She could see the surprise in his eyes, could already hear the next comment on his tongue. I did not know you knew your grandmother, he would say. Were you close to her or your father, he would ask. But she could not respond without sharing more than she wished to. She'd answered enough of his questions now. She glanced up at the lighthouse. Do you think Mr. Cull will be finished now? I do wonder why he's taking so long. Gavin did not respond. He was either wondering about the family she never spoke of, or how he had been correct in his assumption that she did not like to speak about her past. Either way, she was going to allow the conversation to lie dormant at least for the time being. She needed to tell him the truth, and one day she would. But he had said himself that she need not speak of it until she was ready. And she certainly was not ready, nor did she believe he was. She focused on the cliffside where the waves splashed onto the rocks, water spilling down over the uneven sides. The shipwreck had long since been cleaned up, but she could almost see the valour still on its side, sails flapping in the wind, wood splintered into pieces. She narrowed her eyes. Splintered wood? How could that be? It was not from the shipwreck, was it? What is that? She stood, taking a few steps forward. Her heart sank in her chest, as slowly as her boots in the sand. Gavin, that is our boat! He came up to her side. Are you certain? Yes, look! She pointed before moving across the sand, Gavin following closely behind. When they neared the rocks, they could not deny what they saw. The small vessel lay in irreparably broken pieces upon the rocky shoreline. How did it become loose? She questioned. I'm certain I tied it last I used it. She looked to the top of the beach. 
The rope was missing from the stake her uncle had driven deep into the sand years before. Did you use the boat last? she asked him. I've never used it before, Gavin replied. But you must have heard the storm last night. Perhaps the waves reached it and tore it away. She struggled to swallow, the anxiety constricting her throat. What if it storms again tonight? What are we to do if a shipwreck occurs and we have no boat to help them? An unsettling image of sailors crying out for help amidst the rocks flashed before her mind. Gavin, what are we to do? He rested a hand on her shoulder. Worry not. When Mr. Cullis finished, I'll ride to Trevick Honeyset to see if we may borrow one of his boats until we can commission another for us. Of course, that was the sensible thing to do. The tension in her neck eased, though only slightly. She still could not understand how the boat had become loose. Come along. She looked to Gavin, who offered his arm to her, a disappointed look on his face. Let us return to the lighthouse, he said. I can see you still need a bit of practice when it comes to enjoying time away from work. Abigail followed him back to Goladuin, and before long Mr. Cull emerged from the house, his face red as he swiped a handkerchief over his brow. Abigail glanced sidelong at Gavin. That is how you appeared when you first climbed to the lamp room, she whispered. His mouth dropped open in mock offence. I did not. Mr. Cull cleared his throat, breaking through their shared smile. I trust you found Goladuin in a much better state than expected, Gavin said. I did, Mr. Cull responded. The lighthouse is nowhere near perfect, I assure you but the incentive you have shown in merely a week is promising indeed. Abigail could hardly believe her ears. The man was pleased with what he saw. He continued, As such, Trinity House will be happy to continue our arrangement with Gollo... Gollo... With your lighthouse. Abigail and Gavin exchanged quick glances, and her excitement doubled to see his brown eyes alight with joy. Thank you, sir. Abigail said. I'm also to inform you, he continued, that as you seem more willing to work honestly with us, we will not require you to pay back the sum your uncle mismanaged. You may expect a letter soon to officially extend the contract. As for now, I must excuse myself to return my report. Good day to you both. They watched him hoist himself into the carriage, but the moment the door shut and the horses pulled away, Abigail and Gavin turned toward each other. We did it, he said. I can't believe it, she replied. And she couldn't. They had proven themselves worthy, and Goladuin would remain lit. His chest swelled. She could no longer help herself. With giddy laughter, she sailed toward Gavin and wrapped her arms around his neck. Thank you. It could not have been done without you. Chapter 25 Gavin hesitated only a moment before returning Abigail's embrace. Her laughter lilted in his ear, overpowering his self-control. He closed his eyes and breathed in the scent of her hair as he leaned in closer to her. She smelled of the sea. Time stood still as he allowed his hands to spread out across her back, holding her closer, tighter. Their embrace before, after the letter from Trinity House, had been one more of comfort. But this one, this one overwhelmed his senses. This one caused his mind to spin. This one stirred the feelings in his heart. Feelings that had been simmering since the very day he'd met the woman. And he wanted nothing more than to explore those feelings further. Her arms relaxed around his neck and she pulled back enough for their gazes to meet. But he did not release his hold of her. He peered into her eyes that were as blue as the sea. What secrets were behind them? Bright one moment, dark the next, as she moved from staring at the sea to speaking of her past. One day he would help her overcome her trepidations. But now, now he was going to relish the feel of the woman in his arms and no matter what, he would not become distracted by her smooth lips 
that beckoned him forward as she raised her chin. Lips that he could nearly feel on his own. Lips that parted as he closed the distance between them. Then Abigail dropped her gaze and pulled away from his hold. His hands fell to his sides, his heart sinking faster than an anchor plummeting into the sea. I suppose we still have work to do, Abigail said, scratching the back of her neck and looking toward the house. Even if we have passed the inspection. Gavin stifled a sigh, still attempting to restrain his disappointment. Yes, you are right. We mustn't celebrate prematurely. Her eyes flickered toward him before she ducked her head and scurried toward the house. Gavin watched her skirt sway back and forth as she departed, and reality slowly returned. He could not say he was glad the kiss had not occurred, but their relationship was probably better for it, what with their agreement still intact. And yet, he took heart. He had seen the look of desire in her eyes, and the way she had leaned in closer to him. Yes, his wife had seemed to want to kiss him as greatly as he had wished to kiss her. And that, more than anything, encouraged him to maintain his patience. He could hold off as long as he needed to, so long as the prize was winning Abigail's affection. An hour later, Abigail was still inside, hiding away. Gavin had ridden and returned from the honey sets, requesting the use of their boat, and after, he'd brought Lieutenant Harris back from St Just, now that the inspection was complete. She could see them working away at the paddock as she measured the curtains against the sitting room windows. The task was a fine enough excuse to avoid her husband after what had occurred, or rather, hadn't occurred, between them. She had been so silly to embrace him, and her eyes lingering on his mouth. Why, that was simply foolish. Of course she would wish to kiss him after that. The subtle masculine curves of his lips had nearly pulled her in on their own. Fortunately, she had recalled their agreement before anything might have actually happened. Not that kissing him would have been terrible. In truth, she had an inkling that sharing such a moment with Gavin would be very nice. But that was the opposite of what they both wanted, was it not? The door opened, footsteps sounding and her heart jumped. Abigail? Gavin appeared around the corner, his arms filled with stacks of brown-wrapped packages. These have just come for you, your new clothing, and this one is from me. She stared at the pile as he laid them on the settee. He had purchased her a gift. Her eyes lingered on the small rectangular package on the top. She itched to open the gowns, to feel the fine fabric once again between her fingertips. But she had an even greater desire to see what he had purchased for her. However, with Gavin still standing in the room, she needed to see first how he fared after their near kiss. To her disappointment, he seemed rather cheerful. Did you see the honey certs? she asked. Yes, Trevick is more than willing to lend us his boat. Harris and I will retrieve it just as soon as the paddock is completed. Thank you. He nodded, lingering behind the settee. Before I forget, there is something I wish to ask you. Her shoulders tensed. She braced for another question related to her past. Yes. What would you say to having Lieutenant Harris look after the lamps? She blinked attempting to keep up with the jump in topics. Oh, do we need him to? He shrugged, picking at the wood at the back of the settee. Well, as Lieutenant Harris and I were leaving town today, Mrs. Stedman approached me with an invitation to her dinner party, to be held in a week's time. I thought we could instruct Harris so he could look after the lights for a few hours while we attend the party together. At the mention of the Stedmans, Abigail's heart hardened. Did Mrs. Stedman not tell you I had already declined her invitation? No, she didn't. But then, why did you not tell me you knew of the invitation before now? I suppose it slipped my memory. She muttered, too angry to say anything else. Mrs. Stedman extending the invitation to Gavin, after already knowing of Abigail's refusal, 
was nothing more than the woman's attempt to draw closer to Gavin. The woman was a snake. Well, Gavin began, apparently unaware of the anger raging in her soul. Now that Goladuin has passed the inspection, might you reconsider your answer? Lieutenant Harris will be more than capable. We could leave and return before the first refilling. And if it storms, of course we could remain here. Abigail could not understand his desire to go. Did he not recall the fact that Mrs. Steadman had spread rumours about the moors? She toyed with the idea of telling Gavin Mrs. Steadman's current plan, to have her daughter destroy his marriage. But she suppressed the idea at once. To say such a thing aloud would be humiliating. So would you like to attend? Gavin asked. Thank you, but I would rather not. He paused. Because it is a dinner party? Because the Steadmans are hosting, she clarified. If you knew what they... She shook her head. She could say nothing further. She was too afraid. Afraid of leaving the lighthouse when the lamps needed looking after. Afraid of confronting the Steadmans. Afraid of being made a fool in front of them. Again. And Gavin. She was afraid of disappointing Gavin. She was well aware of who she was, where she had come from, and how she could not compare to the fine women in society. But what would happen when Gavin discovered the same? Would he realise his mistake and long for a grander life and a finer wife? She knew he would not leave her. He was too honourable for that. But could she bear to be with him if she knew he regretted his decision to marry her? I'm afraid I don't understand, Abigail, Gavin said, breaking up her thoughts. Mrs. Steadman seems to have moved past what occurred between your two families. She may not have behaved perfectly long ago, but perhaps she is wishing to make amends. Perhaps she has changed. Can you not? A flame ignited in her soul. She took a step toward him, her brow low. In regard to the Steadmans, no, I cannot change. I will not change. You may attend if you so wish, but I will not step foot in Privley House again. Again? She ground her teeth together. She would not explain herself, not after the last time Gavin had simply brushed aside her words about the Steadmans. She turned away from him and focused instead on the curtain in her hands, refusing to say another word. After a moment, his retreating footsteps reached her ears, as well as his sigh. And when he left the house, closing the door behind him, her shoulders slumped forward. She looked to the empty doorway with a sigh of her own, before her eyes fell upon the packages still resting on the settee. She chewed at her bottom lip, eyeing the top package once again. Should she not wait to open it, for when she was in a better mood? Or perhaps the item within would be just the thing to put her in a better mood. Dropping the curtain on the side chair, she reached for the package and unwrapped it. At the sight of the gift, she winced. A brand new book. A collection of poetry, bound in red leather with thick, cream-coloured pages. She recalled the first time she had shown Gavin around the lamp room. He must have recalled her wish to receive something new to read. She clutched the book to her chest and marched through the house, swinging open the front door with a great sigh. Her eyes immediately focused on Gavin as he hammered at the paddock fence. Lieutenant Harris propped the wood up with one arm and his waist. Very well, she called out. Both men looked up to her in surprise. I will go with you to Privley House. Gavin's eyes dropped to the book she held. Are you certain? She pulled her lips close together and nodded. Gavin's eyes wrinkled at the sides as he exchanged a glance with Lieutenant Harris. But before Gavin could say a word in response, she turned around and vanished back into the house. She was going to regret changing her mind. She just knew it. Chapter 26 It certainly is nice to see you in a different gown, Abigail. You look lovely. Abigail could hear the sincerity in Gavin's tone, 
but she brushed his compliments aside. After all, he would hardly think she looked lovely when they arrived at Privley House, and he was reminded what a true lady looked like. They walked across the countryside, heading in the direction of the Steadman's home. Gavin had offered to rent a carriage. They were still waiting on the one he had commissioned when they were first married, but Abigail had insisted on walking, hoping it would calm her nerves. It didn't. She looked down at her soft yellow gown. Embroidered golden flowers trimmed the bottom of her skirts and around her sleeves, and a dark yellow ribbon was tied beneath her bodice. It was in no way excessive, nor was it very fine, but Gavin had assured her the gown was perfect for a dinner party. She only prayed she would not draw too much attention to herself, as she had the first time she'd worn finery, the first time she'd been to Privley House. When she was a young girl, she had attended a party to celebrate Miss Steadman's birthday. They accused her of dressing above her station, of attempting to be someone she would never be. Of course, such a thing would not happen again. Now Abigail was a grown woman. She would not allow it. In an attempt to distract herself from the leaded feeling in her feet, she focused on the scenery in the evening's golden light. Swallows flew from tree to tree, and puddles lined the drying pathway they walked on, evidence of the storm they'd had the day before. If only the rain would have lasted through tonight, then she could have stayed home. Are you worried about leaving Gola Duan? Gavin asked. Abigail had been so wrapped up in her thoughts, she'd nearly forgotten she walked beside him. Not terribly. In truth, that was the one thing she was not overly concerned about. They had already lit the lamps and would return before they needed refilling, and Abigail was certain she and Gavin had been thorough enough with their instructions to Lieutenant Harris. I trust the Lieutenant, she said, and I don't imagine anything will happen to the lighthouse in a few simple hours. You are handling it far better than I expected, I must admit. So, if leaving the lighthouse does not trouble you, what causes the look of discomfort upon your brow? She removed the creases from her forehead and forced a smile. Nothing, I assure you. He regarded her curiously, but she ignored him, looking ahead as Privley House finally came into view. The mere sight of it made her insides harden, as if she prepared for a direct strike to her stomach. She had not been inside since she was a child, and she had truly hoped to never return. Three stories tall, Privley House rested neatly on the highest section of a small hill. Red brick, spread out across the structure in between countless windows, stretched tall and thin. The grounds matched the house with immaculate care, the grass neatly trimmed and curved hedges, making for a lovely image in the garden. A large pond filled the area to the left of the house, and a decorative statue stood in the centre, a goddess in flowing robes. Mrs. Steadman had clearly enjoyed spending the money she had been left with after her husband's death. As they finally reached the daunting house, Abigail's nerves weakened her limbs. She clung to Gavin's jacket sleeve, praying to glean some of his own strength to use for herself. When she was younger, she had attended local gatherings on Tregorwen Beach, a white sandy shore located south of Goladuin, at her uncle's insistence. She had always remained close to his side, hardly speaking to anyone, until she finally managed to escape back home. Would Gavin mind terribly if she did the same with him? Remained at his side the entire evening? Perhaps he wouldn't, if she tried to remain until the rest of the party dispersed. She reminded herself not to cower, that she was attending for the sake of her husband, who had already done so much for her. But as the footman answered the door and led them through the familiar house, bringing them to the drawing room, her courage vanished. She stepped over the threshold and willed herself to remain unintimidated by the grand room though her eyes roved over the decor. It had been redecorated since she was last there. Cream panelling lined the walls. The long floral curtains were tied open to allow the glowing light from outside to soften the room. Paintings of family members in their gilded frames covered nearly the entire east wall. Abigail clutched her hands together in front of her. 
Though she felt out of place, she raised her chin. No matter the eyes around the room darting away from her, unwilling to make eye contact. Just another brand of judgment. She would not cower. She would not shrink. Captain! Mrs. Kendricks, welcome to our humble home. They turned to face Miss Steadman, who walked toward them with open arms. I was so pleased to receive your note, saying you would join us after all. Do come in. Abigail struggled not to stare. If she did not know any better, she would have thought the woman had changed. Mrs. Steadman's sincere smile reached out to both Gavin and Abigail, and her eyes shone brightly. But Abigail knew the truth. Mrs. Steadman had been perfectly clear outside the door of Goladuin, and Abigail would never forget the words she had overheard. What a lovely new gown, Mrs. Kendricks, the woman said. I trust you did the needlework yourself. Abigail stiffened. There she was, the true Mrs. Steadman. Though she spoke so sweetly, Abigail was sure Gavin would not notice the reproach. Just like before. No, I ordered it from Mrs. Follett's. Oh, of course. I forget you would be allowed such delicacies now. Mrs. Steadman glanced to Gavin with a knowing look. Well, I do hope you will not feel too overwhelmed here, Mrs. Kendricks. I understand a young woman's first dinner party can be quite unnerving. You must ask my daughter if you are in need of guidance. After all, she has been attending them for years now. She looked over her shoulder and motioned her daughter closer. Miss Steadman, who had been standing nearby, floated toward them in a delicate puce gown that flowed with every movement she made, her dark hair pinned up in an elegant twist. She curtsied first to Abigail, who struggled to return the gesture willingly, before facing Gavin. Captain Kendricks, you look well this evening. The young woman was no more than 19 years of age, and yet Abigail felt like a child around her poised elegance. She cursed her choice to wear her simple yellow gown. She should have chosen something nicer. By not drawing attention to herself, she was certain to inadvertently drive her husband's attention elsewhere. Thank you, Miss Steadman, Gavin responded, as do you. Miss Steadman's dimples deepened, and a pink blush tinted her otherwise snowy white cheeks. Abigail scratched unwittingly at the freckles dotting her nose. She had hoped the girl would have said no to her mother's scheming, but it was clear that Miss Steadman would vie for Gavin's attention, whether he was married or not. But Gavin would not fall for her charms, would he? Or had he already taken more notice of the beautiful young woman? than his dowdy wife. When Abigail looked up at him, she was surprised to see him staring down at her with an encouraging smile. She was struck again with how handsome he was. His high collar and dark dinner jacket, his confident stance and easy countenance, made clear one thing. Gavin was born for such parties and elegant company. And Abigail was not. We are fewer in numbers today, as you can see, Mrs. Steadman said, breaking into Abigail's thoughts. The madams are not feeling well this evening, and the Rosewalls are in London, I believe. Otherwise, Miss Sophia Rosewall would be in our company as well. We are happy our numbers are not so very few with you in attendance, though. Abigail glanced around the room. The physician, Mr. Reynolds, and his considerably younger wife stood in the corner of the room, speaking with the Biddles, a droll expression on both the vicar's face and his wife's. Nearby was Mr. Burke, a single gentleman who had just taken over his father's estate nearby, and the Summerfields, Mrs. Causey's grandparents. The short, elderly couple had always been kind to Abigail and her uncle, just like their granddaughter. Abigail was certain Uncle Ellis had dined at one point or another with each person in attendance, all before he was injured, all while she had watched over the lighthouse. She had always wondered what it would be like if she and her uncle had switched places, if she had attended the parties and he had seen to the lighthouse. Now she knew. She was far more comfortable in the safety of Goladuin. 
As Abigail observed the others in the room, Mrs. Steadman prattled on about what to expect for the rest of the evening. The food selection we have is divine, as I'm sure you'll agree, Captain Kendricks. And then we shall hear my daughter sing and play the pianoforte. A most remarkable talent. Abigail groaned inwardly before dinner was finally announced. The guests filed into the dining room and sat around the table. Abigail moved to the far end, her eyes upon the spread. Shining silverware, smooth tabletops, grass goblets. It was all rather impressive. But she longed for her humble kitchen, with a modest fire, roasting a pheasant that warmed the house with its aroma. She looked to the other end of the table. Gavin was situated on the opposite side of her, seated right next to Miss Steadman. Abigail cringed. She hardly touched her bowl of soup during the first course. Her eyes continually darted around the table, wondering what judgments were being made about the lighthouse keeper seated in the midst of them. But most of the guests seemed too occupied with the food and conversation to take much notice of her at all. She contemplated sidling out of her chair and creeping from the room. But Gavin would notice. He'd hardly removed his eyes from her the entire meal. Though she had only seen so from the corner of her eye, she couldn't look directly at him, for she would see Miss Steadman as well. And then Abigail would have to acknowledge how well the young woman's finery matched with Gavin's. When the second course began, the conversation finally shifted from Mrs. Steadman's continual doting of her daughter to the lighthouse, and Abigail's eyes darted toward Gavin. Is it true you have hired an assistant keeper, Captain? Mr. Summerfield asked, seated directly across from Abigail. We have, Gavin responded. He was my first lieutenant aboard the Valor. He suits the task very well, does he not, Mrs. Kendricks? All eyes fell on Abigail, and she peered down at the small portions she'd placed upon her plate. Of course Gavin would try to include her, but did he not realise she was just fine being invisible? Yes, he does. That is fine news, Mrs. Summerfield said, seated further down the table on Abigail's side. Her cheerful voice sounded much like Mrs. Corsey's, only older. I do hope this means we will see more of the both of you. Her eyes nearly disappeared as she smiled warmly at Abigail, and Abigail's discomfort eased, if only slightly. Do you enjoy reading much, Captain? Mrs. Steadman asked in a lowered voice. She was clearly attempting to create a more intimate conversation between those at the head of the table. I do, Gavin replied, but my wife is a more voracious reader than I. Abigail nearly groaned at his attempt to include her yet again. Mrs. Steadman clearly had no desire to speak to anyone but Gavin. Oh, my daughter reads more than anyone I've ever known, Mrs. Steadman continued, as if she hadn't heard him acknowledging his wife. She reads often to me. Her tone is most melodious. Her own husband, when the time comes, will be blessed to have such a voice at his disposal to be sure. Gavin responded, with all the politeness of a gentleman. Abigail felt sick. In an effort to avoid returning the contents of her stomach back onto her plate, she focused her attention on the other conversations around her. There is a new shipment of lace at Mrs. Follett's. I am anxious to see if they are as fine as she has suggested. We ought to go together. Did you hear Mr. Rosewall's mine has suffered a cave-in again? Those miners must be desperate if they remain working there. As I mentioned before, my daughter plays very well. Having been at sea, Captain Kendricks, you must not have had the opportunity to listen to the pianoforte for some time. No, I haven't. How had Abigail returned to listening to the conversation centred around Gavin once again? She glanced furtively toward him the muscles in his jaw working as he chewed. Do you miss the sea, Captain? Mr. Reynolds asked. Abigail noted Mrs. Steadman doing her best to hide her displeasure at her conversation being usurped. How could I miss it while living right at its doorstep? Gavin responded. Ah, 
but the life of a sea captain, Mr. Burke piped in between his chews. How much less troublesome to live on water than land. Oh, not for the captain seated before you, Mr. Summerfield said, the wrinkles in his brow increasing as he smiled. Surely you have heard the tale of Captain Kendrick's arrival. Mrs. Reynolds' eyes were wide with excitement. Of course he has. Captain Kendrick's was all the talk of St. Just. Mrs. Summerfield nodded. He still is, despite the terrible occurrence of the shipwreck. Yes, but how did it even occur? Mrs. Steadman finally joined in the conversation. Was Gola doing not shining to warn you of your approach to land? Abigail nearly pulled a face at the woman's insinuation. No, Goladuin's light certainly shined, Gavin responded. In truth, the lighthouse was the very thing that directed us toward the smaller rocks first. That is how we were able to avoid more casualties than we suffered. The storm and broken anchor cables were the true causes of the shipwreck. And the traitorous actions of the Sanders brothers, Mr. Burke added. What happened to the degenerates, Captain? Abigail noted Gavin's weary brow. She knew the Sanderses were difficult for him to speak about. Miss Steadman stared up at Gavin too, her voice lilting as she spoke. If the memory is too painful, Captain, please do not trouble yourself for our sake. Abigail wondered if it would be considered so very impolite to take the silver lid off of the boiled potatoes and throw it across the room at the woman who seemed incapable of removing her eyes from Abigail's husband. No, it is quite all right, Gavin responded. Miss Steadman was clearly disappointed to receive no further response, and Abigail tried not to raise her chin too haughtily. The elder brother has been punished for his mistakes, Gavin answered Mr. Burke, but the younger one was not convicted. Shame that, Dr. Reynolds said. He earned a stern look from Mr. Biddle. Let us look to our manners, gentlemen, the vicar said. We must speak of softer matters while in the presence of these fine women. I fear their constitutions would not appreciate such a conversation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Biddle, Mrs. Steadman said with a breathy sigh. To hear such tales of shipwrecks and mutiny, I can hardly bear it. Then be grateful you do not have to live through such ordeals, ma'am, Gavin said. Abigail thought she caught a hint of impatience in his voice. Oh, I am, Mrs. Steadman said. As is my Constance, are we not, my dear? Yes, mother. And we all ought to be grateful for the brave men who risk their lives for king and country, Mrs. Summerfield said. And women, Gavin added. For it was my wife who rode out to save me and my first lieutenant from watery graves. Abigail's face burned as she became the centre of attention once again. It is true, then, Mrs. Summerfield asked. I thought it was a rumour, said Mrs. Steadman. Abigail hesitated. No, I... I did, but I was merely performing my duties as a lighthouse keeper. Marvellous, Mr. Summerfield said, his eyes shining. What a tale to tell your children one day, that their mother saved their father. Chapter 27 Abigail blanched. Fortunately, the next conversation focused elsewhere, on Mr. Biddle and the sermon he would deliver this Sunday. But Abigail hardly heard. She was too busy dwelling on what Mr. Summerfield had said. Her and Gavin's children but they would not be having children, would they? She risked a quick glance in Gavin's direction. He spoke with Mr. Burke, seemingly unaware of Mr. Summerfield's innocent words. He must not care to have children, then. Her children. Otherwise he would not have agreed to the relationship they had formed. The breath slipped from her lungs. She shouldn't be so upset. After all, she agreed to the relationship as readily as he had. But then... Had she truly considered all the repercussions beforehand? 
She couldn't sit straight any longer, her back curving. How long would this dinner last? How much longer would she have to suffer? She tried to ignore the fact that Miss Steadman and Gavin conversed with each other more than anyone else at the table. Abigail knew Mrs. Steadman was to blame, but she could not help but fear that Gavin was beginning to do just as the woman had predicted. He must now be all too aware of Abigail's lack of accomplishments, of her lack of feminine allure and charm in comparison to Miss Steadman. When the meal ended, Abigail ignored Gavin's encouraging smile in her direction as she followed the women from the room. She did not want to be encouraged. She wanted to go home. Remaining at the back of the group, Abigail moved through the bright corridors, wondering if the journey felt as much like a funeral procession to everyone else as it did to her. As the rest of the women filed through the drawing room, taking seats near the blazing fire, Abigail remained in the doorway. She had tried not to become intimidated by the grand house, the elegant talk and the fine gowns, but she was only fooling herself. She was still that poor, lonely little girl, pretending to be someone she could never be. Mrs. Kendricks. She turned to the group of the ladies, who watched her with wondering eyes. Mrs. Summerfield's sincerity stood out from the rest. Won't you come sit, my dear? She asked, patting the seat next to her on the settee. I have saved a seat here, just for you. Abigail took tentative steps forward, doing her best to ignore the stares from others as she sat gingerly on the red cushioned seat. Will you be comfortable there, Miss Moore? Mrs. Steadman asked, across from her. After all, the heat from our large hearth compared to those in your little lighthouse may be a bit overwhelming for you. Abigail bit back a retort. So, she was Miss Moore again. She wondered what else Mrs. Steadman would say now that Gavin was not there, to be impressed by her words. She stared at the door. Could she plot an escape before the gentleman returned? Would Gavin even notice her absence? Certainly not, with Miss Steadman to distract him. Is this your first night away from Goladuin, Mrs. Kendricks? Mrs. Summerfield asked. Her greying hair was pulled softly back and wrapped in a small roped turban. It is, Abigail responded. She had not dwelt on the lighthouse as much as she thought she would have. Of course, she was preoccupied with other matters. But that made her wonder. If she had been anywhere but Privley House, if she and Gavin were together without the Steadmans hovering over them, would she enjoy the small taste of freedom with him? Does marriage suit you, Mrs. Kendricks? Mrs. Reynolds asked. Her nose pinched together at the end, and her eyebrows were thin and arched. I have been with my Timothy for nearly a year now, so if you need any advice, my experience may prove useful. Abigail forced a grateful smile, but said nothing. After all, Mrs. Reynolds continued, a loving marriage must be strived for daily. Absolutely. Mrs. Steadman agreed. I believed the same when my dear husband was alive. He was very happy with me, I dare say. She paused. And he made me happy as well. I do miss him. A flash of sorrow crossed the woman's face. Abigail had never seen such transparency from the woman. But it was gone as quickly as it came, replaced with the typical bland placidity once more. My daughter has learned the art of love from her parents' example. Have you not, Constance? Miss Steadman had remained silent since the dining room, a faraway look to her eye. She blinked mutely. Yes, mother. Abigail's eyes remained on the young woman. What was she thinking as she sat there in silence, clearly distracted? Abigail wondered if she felt even the slightest remorse for her sordid intentions with Gavin. Yes, Mrs. Steadman repeated. She shall make her husband very happy one day. That is what is most important, is it not? After all, if a wife does not satisfy her husband, then what is the point of a marriage at all? Her lips curled at the ends as she looked in Abigail's direction. Abigail did not miss the woman's insinuation. 
However, as she eyed the other women in the room, another conversation began, and no one else appeared aware of the slight. Did none of them suspect, like Mrs. Stedman, that Abigail's marriage was based upon Gavin's charity and not love? How are you faring, Mrs. Kendricks? Mrs. Summerfield asked in a near whisper. Her hand covered Abigail's. I am well. Abigail glanced to the others. Their attention was entirely focused on Mrs. Reynolds as she delivered the latest gossip she'd heard while listening in on the patients visiting her physician husband. Mrs. Summerfield leaned in closer. Well, you are doing far better than I did at my first dinner party. I was so nervous, I spilt pea soup straight down the front of my gown. Then I dropped my spoon to the floor, and when I bent down to retrieve it, I knocked my head on the arm of the man with whom I was desperately in love. She closed her eyes and shook her head, clearly reliving the moment. Thankfully, he thought my sheer foolishness endearing, and he married me because of it. Abigail felt the tension in her neck slightly ease. Now, Mrs. Summerfield continued, I must ask after Gola Dewan. Your uncle once took us on a tour through the tower. Of course, that was so very long ago, you would not remember. No, I recall the visit well, Abigail said. When Abigail had first come to Gola Dewan, her uncle had offered tours to locals and visitors, though he had stopped the practice years before his fall. The Summerfields had come on more than one occasion and were always kind to both Abigail and her uncle. You came with your granddaughter, if I recall. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Summerfield said. Oh, it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And I'm so glad we did it while we still could. I hardly think I can make the journey up those steps now. My husband, even less likely than me. She let out a little laugh, and Abigail's expression relaxed into a near smile. How is your granddaughter? She had not seen them since the Causeys had come to stay with Abigail the night of Uncle's death. Oh, she and Mr. Corsey are as happy as can be, of course. The woman beamed. They are visiting her mother in town now for the next few weeks, but I expect they will return soon. Because, she lowered her voice, her eyes aglow, Hannah has told me it will not be just the two of them at Leighton House for much longer. Abigail was pleased for the young couple and the forthcoming great-grandparents. They deserved all the happiness in the world, if only for the goodness with which they treated others. Please pass along my good wishes to them, Abigail said. Mrs. Summerfield nodded. I will. I have written to them of your marriage. I'm sure they will be most pleased. Now, tell me, is your new husband sharing in the workload? Just then the door opened and the gentleman joined them. Oh, you cannot answer truthfully now. Mrs. Summerfield continued in a rushed whisper. You had best wait until he is gone for you to tell me how terribly idle he really is. She winked and Abigail's lips stretched into a smile. She glanced to the door, her eyes fixing on Gavin. To her pleasure, he headed straight in her direction. But then Mrs. Stedman stood cutting off his advancement with his daughter swiftly in tow. Oh, Captain, did you enjoy the port? My Constance chose it. She has fine taste, does she not? Abigail's bettering mood vanished instantly, sinking further as the night progressed, for with each giggle from Miss Stedman in response to Gavin's words, each wide-eyed, affectionate stare she bestowed on him, Abigail's insecurities rose. She had always dreamed of having a loving marriage, with children to help cultivate that love to be even greater. But she was foolish to have ever hoped that she and Gavin would have such a marriage. He could never desire a lighthouse keeper over a lady. As the others conversed, she moved soundlessly to the edge of the room. She tried to gain her bearings, to separate the truth from the lies, but her fears blurred the lines. Abigail? She started at Gavin's deep voice behind her. Are you well? he asked. 
She turned to face him, all too aware of Miss Steadman's eyes upon them from across the room. Of course, she responded. He did not look convinced. Have you enjoyed the evening so far? What could she say? That she had despised nearly every moment? That she longed to return home and never see any of these people? Excepting the Summerfields, again? She drew a deep breath. Perhaps she could be honest with him. He would certainly understand. In truth, Gavin, I... Captain! Mrs. Steadman called. I must speak with you. They looked across the room to where the woman watched him expectantly. Gavin turned to Abigail, offering his arm, but she did not take it. You have been summoned, Captain, she said. Not I. She turned away, instantly regretting her refusal. But she could not bear to be near Mrs. Steadman any longer, nor her daughter's ever watchful, ever flirtatious eyes. She listened as Gavin departed from her, and soon Mrs. Steadman spoke up again. Captain Kendricks and I are in agreement, the woman said, her voice ending the other conversations about the room. We desire entertainment. Mrs. Kendricks. Panic gripped Abigail's throat. She turned to face her. Yes? As you are the newest member of our party, I think it only fair that you pleasure us first with the pianoforte. What song will you play? The rubies on Mrs. Steadman's necklace shimmered from the glow of the candles, but her eyes were void of any light. The woman knew Abigail could not play. There was no room for such an instrument in the lighthouse. Mrs. Steadman meant to embarrass her. Abigail was sure of it. Just as before, just like always. Abigail looked to Gavin. Had he been aware that the woman was going to ask her to play? He couldn't be. He would not intentionally embarrass her like that. But when he said nothing to save her from her clear discomfort, simply looked at her expectantly, nausea swelled within her. Clearly she was floundering, and still he said nothing. She thought he'd take her side. She thought she'd finally found an ally. And yet there she was, thrown straight back into Mrs. Steadman's throes. Well, she would not stand for it. She was no longer a child. If Gavin would not stand up for her, she could stand up for herself. I am not musical, ma'am, as you well know, she said in a flat tone. I choose to occupy my time with more useful engagements. Oh, what a tragedy to have never learned, Mrs. Reynolds piped in. She leaned to Mrs. Biddle and whispered, I shall take it upon myself to teach her. If you have nothing musical to offer, Mrs. Steadman said, quirking her head to one side, perhaps you could recite a poem or read a passage from a favourite novel. Abigail shook her head in silence. How she longed to scream out, to tell the whole room of how unjust this woman was. But she knew she would be misunderstood. The unladylike keeper of Goladuan Lighthouse would be made to look hysterical, and Mrs. Steadman would be made the victim. Well, worry not, my honoured guests, Mrs. Steadman said. My Constance will not deny us the pleasure of listening to her play. She turned adoring eyes on her daughter. Come, show us what a blessing it is to play the pianoforte so beautifully. Captain Kendricks. I am certain you in particular will enjoy her talent. My daughter truly has a voice that makes even the angels in heaven envious. Mr. Biddle exchanged a disapproving look with his wife. Then the guests gathered near the pianoforte, sitting in the chairs arranged before the instrument. But Abigail only managed a few steps forward before stopping behind the others. Miss Steadman took her place behind the pianoforte humbly bowing her head. Her fingers rested upon the keys before she began her performance. Abigail glanced to Gavin, who stood a few couples away from her. He motioned to the empty seat near him, the seat he'd obviously saved for her, but she remained where she was. What is the matter? He mouthed out. She ignored him, turning to stare out the darkened window. 
though the room was far too bright to see anything beyond the reflections of the candlelight flickering in the glass. How could she explain to him that everything was the matter, that she was the matter? She should never have come to Privley House. Whispers nearby reached her ears. She pretended not to hear Mrs. Stedman's words to Mrs. Reynolds, but Abigail could no longer avoid listening as her name and bits of the conversation floated toward her. Miss Moore, sorry state of affairs before the captain. Couldn't afford to. Uncle didn't teach. She cannot read. The cruelty of the words penetrated the walls Abigail had built around her heart. She had tried to remain at the party for Gavin, but now... She glanced toward him, his eyes focusing on Miss Steadman as she played. What was the point in remaining at the party now if he could only see Miss Steadman? Abigail had been a fool to think she could ever make a marriage work with such a man, knowing where she came from, the tarnished state of her family. Her thoughts spiralled deeper and deeper. Black spots in her eyes dimmed the light around her, and her palms grew sweaty as the pianoforte's music rang shrilly in her ears. She couldn't bear to remain there another moment. She needed to leave before the tears in her eyes fell down her cheeks, before she collapsed onto the carpet from sheer humiliation. Turning on the spot, she fled from the room as quietly as she could, though she no longer cared if heads turned. She paused in the corridor, looking left and right, wondering which way led to freedom. Finally, recognising the paintings to one side, she picked up her yellow skirts and ran through Privley House, darting past a flustered footman, opening the door herself and running out into the darkness. Her lungs burned, but her breathing was deep for the first time that evening as she left the confines of the house farther and farther behind. Once she reached the countryside, she finally slowed her pace. The moon lit the pathway before her, but she did not need its waning light to know the way home. She only needed to follow the sound of the sea. It called to her, beckoned her forward to a place she could find peace and freedom. That was where she belonged, at Goladuan, beneath its light, near the waves and upon the cliff sides. Not in a world of fine clothing and gossip. No matter how kind Mrs. Summerfield had been, no matter how Gavin had tried to help Abigail fit in, she would never belong. Abigail? Abigail! Chapter 28 Alarm struck Abigail's core at Gavin's voice. He sounded close. Too close. What might he say to her? He most certainly felt embarrassment over her abrupt departure. Perhaps even anger that she'd surely created a scene. Abigail? Please, wait. His voice was soft. Was he not angry then? She certainly would not blame him if he was. I'm sorry, Gavin. I needed to return to Goladuan. The lamps will need refilling soon. Is that why you left? He asked, reaching her side. Because of the lighthouse? She couldn't answer. A fresh wave of sorrow spilled over her conscience at his clear attempt to understand her actions. The darkness hid her tears sliding down her cheeks, but she dared not look up at him. He continued. You should have told me. We could have left together. Even earlier, if you wished. Her temples pounded, regret filling her every nerve. How she longed to tell him the truth. But that would mean admitting to Mrs. Stedman's plan and acknowledging Abigail's humiliation at seeing it come to fruition. She felt something soft against her arm as Gavin extended her shawl, new from Mrs. Follett's. She'd left in such a hurry she'd forgotten it. She accepted the wrap, grasping the folds of fine fabric in her hand and allowing the rest to trail in the air behind her. She needed to talk to him, to be honest. He would understand. He had to understand. I did not leave early because I was worried about the lighthouse. He was silent for a moment. Then why did you? The others were no doubt surprised by your abrupt departure. 
So he was embarrassed by her actions. The knowledge hammered another nail in the barrier surrounding her heart. Did you leave because you no longer wished to be there? He asked. No, I left because I do not belong there. At Privley House? Why would you not? She struggled to find the right words to explain. Of course Gavin could not understand her feelings. How could he, when he belonged everywhere, with everyone? Abigail, he said, a hint of frustration in his tone. I am striving for patience, but I must confess, I cannot understand why you are so unkind to the Steadmans. Her feet stopped, her eyes narrowing as she turned toward him his face barely visible in the shadows. Why am I unkind to them? Well, yes. You spoke very little to either of them. You hardly touched your food. You refused to share a poem, denying their efforts to include you. And now you leave, without a word to anyone, in the middle of Miss Stedman's performance. It is bad form, Abigail. Surely you see this. Abigail couldn't believe what she was hearing. Gavin was truly siding with the Steadmans. Her nostrils flared. You have the audacity to say I have behaved badly and mention nothing of how Mrs. Steadman has treated me. How has she treated you, Abigail? Please, enlighten me, as I have found nothing adverse with her conduct at all. Her defences doubled. Any guilt she had felt before over leaving early, over causing Gavin embarrassment, vanished and was quickly replaced with anger. Of course you did not see it, she said, her tone low and biting. You were far too occupied with Miss Steadman to notice anything else. I beg your pardon? Why do you not return to the party and enjoy Miss Steadman's presence while the night is young? You clearly prefer her well-bred elegance to anything I could ever be. What do you mean? She could not deny his innocent tone, but she still backed away from him. You and I both know Miss Steadman is vastly superior to me in every way. I see that now, and I will never be enough for you. Her words tasted bitter, even to her own tongue, but she could not hold them back. With a final shake of her head, she raised her skirts and sailed across the grass, praying for swift, clean footing across the unstable land. Tears burned her eyes. Her side ached with pain, but she refused to stop. And as Goladuin's light appeared in the distance, she ran toward the safety of her home. Once inside, she climbed the stairs, her pace slowing step by step, until finally she reached the top of the tower. With a deep breath, she opened the door. Lieutenant Harris stood from the cot, his eyebrows drawn high in surprise. Mrs. Kendricks, I did not expect you to... Has something happened, ma'am? She tried to catch her breath. No, sir, I must thank you for your help this evening, but we will no longer need you to watch over the lamps, tonight or in future. Have I done something wrong, Mrs. Kendricks? He asked. His cheery countenance had disappeared. I have only now just checked the lamps, and everything seems to be in proper order. I, uh... No, she said. This is in no way because of you. I will simply be remaining at Goladuin from this point forth. She could feel his hesitation, but could say nothing more. She was too overcome with guilt for dismissing him. Very well, he said after a moment. Good night, ma'am. She ignored his dejected tone. She was right to relieve him of his service. She had every intention of remaining at the lighthouse forevermore at least while the lamps required lighting. This was her home, the only thing she needed to be happy. If Gavin required more to be satisfied, then he was free to attend other parties. But she would no longer go with him. She turned to the watchroom window, dropping her shawl onto the cot and folding her arms as she watched Gola Duin's light shining above the ocean. Soon, loud footsteps echoed up the stairs, interrupting her solitude. Abigail. Her courage nearly vanished, but she squared her shoulders. She had done nothing wrong, and Gavin would soon find that out. He entered the room in the next moment, his eyes narrowed furiously, and his jaw tight. 
Abigail, did you dismiss Lieutenant Harris? Yes, she answered calmly. His voice boomed in the quiet room. Why? Because I will not be attending another dinner party. He took a step toward her, his broad chest heaving. How can you say something so absurd? She whirled around to face him, his words striking a chord of pain within her. Is it absurd to want to keep myself from cruel words and unkind actions? I assume you refer to Mrs. Steadman again. Of course I refer to her, she said. You must have been blind indeed not to have noticed the woman throwing her daughter's accomplishments at your feet throughout the evening. She must be oblivious to have not heard their slights about my appearance and lack of accomplishments. Gavin stared at her, clearly confused, before he held his hands in the air as if to secede. Quarrelling over what was said or done will not help either of us. I merely... Abigail, can you not move past these affronts? Surely it is better in life to forgive and forget. Otherwise, you will make yourself miserable. Miserable? Angry tears sprouted in her eyes. Was he truly blaming herself for her misery? For her hardships? For Mrs. Stedman's cruelty? Surely he did not mean what he said. Surely he spoke out of irritation. But then, even if he did, that did not stop the hurt and pain that spilled forth from her words. You do not know what the state of my life was before Goladuan. A school. I was scolded, shamed, beaten and scarred. Physically and emotionally. Simply because of my parents' choices. She took a step toward him whispering with vehemence, her tears spilling down her cheeks. I am far happier alone at Goladuan than I could ever be, prancing about in front of others, especially the Stedmans. They, just like everyone else, have treated me in a disgusting manner. I refuse to fall prey to it any longer. Gavin was silent for a moment, staring at the floor. But when his eyes raised to meet hers, she could see his own hurt reflected in their dark depths. Do I treat you in the same manner, Abigail? Do you not see how I care for you? She looked away, too afraid to respond with what she prayed was the truth, fearing that it wasn't. If you do not, he continued, then what are we doing in this marriage? She shook her head. I do not know, Captain. She waited, hoping praying he would say something more, something to breach the barricades around her soul. But his footsteps retreated down the stairs, and she was left alone, with an ache in her heart she was sure would never leave. Chapter 29 Abigail awoke the next morning with a dull ache in her temples. She had spent a restless night in the frigid watchroom, waking up disoriented, before memories of the previous night flooded her mind. She extinguished the lamps and trimmed the wicks as light poured in through the windows of the lamp room. The sun warmed her cold, aching limbs, but she hardly felt it as regret consumed her. She knew Gavin would have understood her actions had he simply known the truth, but her fears and humiliation had prevented her from speaking clearly with him. She took the stairs slowly, dreading the mere thought of facing Gavin when she reached the bottom. She would have to apologise for her behaviour. She would have to be honest, even if knowing Mrs. Stebman's words about Abigail caused Gavin to discover his mistake in marrying her. For not only was she unaccomplished and unbecoming, she was also unladylike. She reached the bottom of the stairs and heard a rhythmic hammering coming from the sitting room. She must look a sorry sight. She had not changed last night out of her yellow gown, and her hair had all but fallen out of its pins. She would have changed before approaching Gavin, but she did not want things to remain strained between them any longer. She could not bear his unhappiness, or for him to think she didn't appreciate the things he had done for them. So, she made her way to the sitting room and stood in the doorway, unnoticed as he worked. His jacket lay on the back of a nearby chair, and his waistcoat was unfastened at the top. 
though it still stretched over his broad shoulders. He hammered a new slab of wood into the floor near the back window. The old piece had been long since warped from rainwater that spilled in during storms. She hadn't mentioned it needed fixing, yet he had noticed it still. She cleared her throat. Gavin? He stopped for a moment to look up at her with a blank stare. He hardly seemed aware of her unkempt appearance. She hesitated, unsure of where to start. An apology? A confession? Begging for forgiveness? I... she began. But a knock sounded at the door, interrupting her. Gavin's eyes shifted to the door. Are you expecting someone? she asked him. He shook his head in silence. He stared down the corridor, afraid to move. How could she answer the door looking in such a way? And even worse, what if the Stedmans were behind the door, coming to comfort Gavin after his wife's rude departure? They would surely be there to show him that Miss Stedman, a true lady, would never have behaved in such a way. Her blood boiled at the thought. She'd just about had enough of the Stedmans. Yes, yeah, she would tell Gavin everything. Just as soon as she chased the women off of her property. Images of her brandishing a broom overhead flashed in her mind just before she opened the door. But to her surprise, another woman stood before her. Mrs. Summerfield, she greeted, pulling back in pleasant surprise. Abigail much preferred a visit from this woman. She was not here to steal away her husband. Good morning, Mrs. Kendricks, she greeted. Her weathered cheeks were rosy from the cool morning air. I do hope you forgive my unannounced visit. I simply wish to visit with you for a moment. Abigail nodded, allowing the woman inside. As she led the way to the sitting room, she smoothed down her skirts, self-consciously. Would Mrs. Summerfield lecture Abigail too? Inform her that her behaviour last night was uncouth? Gavin stood as they entered the room. Good morning, he greeted with a bow. To what do we owe the pleasure? Mrs. Summerfield glanced between them. Well, I have come to speak with Mrs. Kendricks, if I may. Abigail swallowed. She caught Gavin's eyes upon her, as if he silently asked if she wished to be left alone. She gave a discreet nod before he gathered his jacket and excused himself. When Gavin had left the house, Abigail motioned for Mrs. Summerfield to take a seat near the crackling fire. But the woman softly shook her head. Thank you, but I will not speak for long. I know you were busy. A curl fell across Abigail's brow, and she quickly smoothed it aside. Mrs. Summerfield, in comparison to Abigail's dishevelled look, appeared very much like a painting. She stood with her hands softly held in front of her, her back straight, her greying hair was smooth, and she had a lively look to her eyes. However, she made no notion that she disapproved of Abigail's appearance at all. Still, Abigail fidgeted with the lace above her shoulder. What did you wish to speak with me about? Well, the woman began. After you left in such a hurry, I wanted to look after you, to assure you were well. Abigail forced a pleasant look. Oh, of course. I merely left to see to the light. Her words were not entirely untrue. I see. Mrs. Summerfield didn't appear to be convinced. I thought you might have left because of Mrs. Stedman's words during her daughter's performance. Abigail's ears burned. She did not know anyone else had heard. I'm sure I can hardly remember what was said. Then you are a better woman than I am, Mrs. Kendricks, Mrs. Summerfield stated, shaking her head. She was cruel. Such things should never be spoken, especially concerning a guest in her own home. I really must apologise for her behaviour. I really must apologise for her behaviour and for not standing up for you the moment it occurred. Abigail's brow rose. Oh, please don't apologise. You were the one person last night who made me forget about my miserable state in that awful home. She blushed at her blunt words, but Mrs. Summerfield's expression softened. I understand. After you left, the party dispersed, and I was very grateful. 
Mrs. Stedman is fine in smaller doses, I have come to discover. Abigail's defence is lowered. So, the woman was not there to chastise her. They stood in silence before Mrs. Summerfield looked to the door. As I said, I did not wish to take too much of your time. She paused, hesitating only a moment before saying, Mrs. Kendricks, if ever you need a friend, know that you have one in me. And my granddaughter as well. Her soft words warmed Abigail's heart, opening up to the woman in an instant. That I do know, she said softly. I will always be grateful for your kindness. I will admit that it has been much needed this morning. At the woman's caring smile, Abigail cleared her throat before any of the tears welling in her eyes could be shed. Then she led Mrs. Summerfield from the lighthouse. Gavin wished he could have stayed in the sitting room to hear the conversation that had taken place between Abigail and Mrs. Summerfield, especially when he saw the two women embracing outside of the house before Mrs. Summerfield rode away in her carriage. He stood at the side of the lighthouse, his progress in painting the door of the oil hutch halting as Abigail waved goodbye to the carriage. She turned back to the house and their eyes met. But Gavin pulled his attention back to the door, sliding the paintbrush up and down in smooth strokes. He waited as she walked up to him in silence. He was still frustrated from the night before, though far less angry than he had been. The nerve she'd had to release Harris from his position. He just couldn't understand it. How was your visit? he asked, with a glance in her direction. She did not look angry nor happy. In fact, she looked surprisingly placid as she leaned against the house with her fingers interlaced before her. Though her hair hung to the side and her ribbon was missing from around her waist, she was still appealing, just as she always was. It was pleasant, Abigail replied. And how is Mrs. Summerfield? he asked. She is well, she said nothing more. Gavin refused to be reeled into the conversation further. If Abigail wished to say something more, then she could do so on her own. He was tired of pressing her for information from one day to the next. Blast his curiosity. He couldn't hold it back any longer. What did she wish to speak with you about? He asked. She wanted to see if I was well after last night. I see. Gavin? He looked away from the oil hutch. Her softened tone threatened to wipe him of all lingering irritations. Yes? I would like to apologise for last night, she began. I did not intend to leave Privley House in such a manner, but things escalated rather quickly, and I'm sorry for it. Her apology instantly humbled him, and his own words spoken in anger promptly came to the forefront of his mind. He dropped his brush into the small tin of paint nearby and wiped his hands on a rag. I am sorry as well, he said, approaching her. I should not have spoken so unkindly. I understand why you did, she said. He hesitated. Yes, but Abigail, I still do not understand why you did. I know, which is why I should like to explain now, if you have a moment. He tossed the rag across his shoulder and folded his arms comfortably across his chest. Of course, I'm happy to listen. Her blue eyes dropped as she brushed her boot back and forth across the tall grass. I fear the dinner party was fated to end in such a way. My defences were on the rise the moment they delivered the invitation. You see, I overheard Mrs. Stedman speaking to her daughter before I answered the door. She said that... A redness slowly crept across her cheeks. She said that you would one day grow tired of me as your wife and that you would seek comfort in the arms of another, namely her daughter. Gavin's arms fell to his sides, his eyebrows low. She said that? Yes, she did. Her words were firm and Gavin knew at once that she spoke the truth. And yet, he could hardly believe it. 
How could the woman dare to speak such things? To even think such things? I... I had no idea. Abigail cast him a dubious look. You mean, you did not take notice of Mrs. Stedman's marked comments about her daughter's accomplishments, simply to outshine my own abilities, or lack thereof? Well, most mothers behave in the same regard, he said, still trying to make sense of her words. I thought she merely spoke in such a way for Mr. Burke to take notice of Miss Stedman. Mr. Burke! She sniffed out a derisive laugh. Did Mrs. Stedman speak to the gentleman once last evening? Did her daughter even spare him a glance? Gavin held a hand to his brow. How could he have been so stupid? Was he utterly blind? Completely oblivious, just as Abigail had suggested? He looked up at her, remorse settling heavily on his heart. Abigail, I am so sorry. Truly, I had no idea of her intentions. But when I think of what I said last night in her defence, knowing that she... He let out a sigh, his words unwilling to formulate. How she could behave in such a way is beyond me. But Abigail did not look surprised. I do not blame you for not noticing. Her remarks are always very subtle. But I told you before that she has been upset ever since my uncle did not accept her advances. She lashed out, though, hurting me instead of my uncle. I would not be surprised if she assumed that I was the real cause of his rejecting her. Her eyes stared out to the sea. I was once invited to attend a gathering at Privley House to celebrate her daughter's birthday. Mostly, it was just a way for them to flaunt their wealth before other families who were not as affluent. I was nervous and did not wish to go, but Uncle said it would help ease the tension between our families. I knew the moment I arrived that was not to be. Mrs. Stedman wished to make an example of me. She allowed the girls to tease me about my new dress, specially made for the occasion. She told me that clothing could not hide my many flaws and that I was an unwanted orphan, using a dress to keep my past a secret. Gavin shook his head in disgust. To have such things be said to Abigail when she was only a little girl made the blood sear in his veins, and suddenly his wife's actions made sense. That was why you wore the dress you did last night, instead of one of your finer gowns. Abigail lowered her head. Yes. And still, the woman mentioned it, hinting that I had sewn it myself because of its simplicity. I really should not allow her words to affect me as they do. But it seemed that each time she spoke last evening, she merely wished to add to my discomfort. Mentioning Golodou in size compared to Privley House, saying I had not been taught to read. Speaking of my destitution and of... She said you could not read? Abigail said nothing, but then she didn't have to. He could see the truth already in her blue eyes. His fists clenched together. He should have noticed. He should have defended Abigail last night, not shouted at her for running away from a home in which she was clearly being mistreated. I am sorry to have ever suggested going there, he said. Shame hardened in his stomach. You may rest assured that we will never attend a dinner party in their home again. Please forgive my foolishness in not seeing her true nature, and for not believing you from the start. Their eyes met, and he prayed she would see the earnestness of his apology. Finally, she nodded. Of course I forgive you, Gavin. And I... I am sorry to have embarrassed you with my unladylike behaviour. He took a step toward her instantly shaking his head. In no way have you embarrassed me, Abigail. You handled her criticism as gracefully as any fine lady. You did not retaliate, and that is something Mrs. Stedman could certainly never do. In truth, you behaved more ladylike than any of the women in attendance last evening. With a softness he had never seen before in her eyes, Abigail stared up at him. Her pretty freckles lit in a blush. 
Thank you for understanding. She seemed to hesitate a moment before closing the distance between them and reaching up to bestow a kiss on his cheek. The affection was fleeting, and she immediately scurried back to the house without another glance in his direction, her hair flopping to one side and bouncing as she moved. Gavin's heart stumbled. The feel of her soft lips on his skin, the flutter of breath on his cheek, lingered long after her kiss had occurred, as did the memory of her strength and goodness. She was a remarkable woman indeed, and he had every intention of sharing the fact with the rest of the world, especially with Mrs. Steadman and her daughter. Chapter 30 After their conversation, Abigail and Gavin reached a new understanding in their relationship, gaining a deeper trust between them. To have Gavin validate her feelings, to have his support and belief, meant everything to Abigail. And though the niggling thought in the back of her mind reminded her that she still had secrets to reveal, she could not deny the peace that had entered into their marriage. The next day, Lieutenant Harris returned to Goladuin with the slate for the roof that had arrived in town that morning. As they unloaded the supplies from the back of a cart they had borrowed, Abigail apologised for dismissing him and asked him to continue looking after the light, should they need his help again. He readily agreed, much to Abigail's relief, and her heart soared when she saw Gavin's pleased look behind him. But when she caught sight of Lieutenant Harris's smile fading away, a wariness draped a shadow over her joy. What is it? she asked, exchanging a glance with Gavin, who faced the lieutenant as well. I did not have the chance to tell you last night the man said. But as darkness fell, I went down the stairs for a brief moment for a cup of tea. I heard the chickens squawking outside, and when I looked into the hen house, I discovered a feral cat. Abigail pulled a face. A cat? That was not so very bad. She thought a ship had nearly wrecked upon the shores, or perhaps the lamps had blown out. A cat was nothing terrible. The lieutenant nodded. I opened the gate and managed to scare the animal away but when I looked to mend the hole it had used to get in, I couldn't find one. It was almost as if the animal had opened and closed the latch itself, or someone else had put it in there altogether. Abigail's stomach did a funny turn. Any relief she had felt before had vanished. She looked over her shoulder to see the chickens happily pecking away at the grain on the ground. Who would do such a thing? she asked. She caught a quick glance shared between Gavin and Lieutenant Harris. What is it? Do you know who did it? Gavin rubbed a hand against his shoulder. I do wonder if Miles Sanders might have something to do with it. Abigail stared. Because he is still upset with you. Would he do such a thing? If Miles was willing to set fire to a ship, Lieutenant Harris said, and tamper with the anchor cables, I would not be surprised if he was behind this as well, ma'am. The corner of her lip pulled in. What a ridiculous thing to do, to harass chickens in such a way. Thank heavens he hadn't harmed the horses or any of their property, or... A sudden thought occurred, a sinking in her chest. Kevin, our boat! He slowly nodded. I considered the very same. The boy had purposefully allowed their boat to become destroyed by the waves, simply because he held a grudge against Gavin. She couldn't believe anyone could be so petty, nor so reckless. She reminded herself that the boy's brother had just died. But still, she found pity difficult to come by when Miles had put others' lives at risk by destroying the boat they used to save others. First our boat, now the chickens? She murmured. What will be next? Hopefully nothing, Gavin said. But as he and Lieutenant Harris exchanged another glance, her agitation grew. Throughout the rest of the day, her thoughts centred entirely on Miles and if he truly was the culprit, though she knew it was very unlikely to be anyone but the begrudging boy. She did not have the chance to speak more about it with Gavin, however, as he had spent most of the day taking off the old slate from the roof while Lieutenant Harris had gathered the broken pieces 
and tossed them in the cart they would use again tomorrow. Abigail had stayed busy by remaining indoors and helping the honey sets in the kitchen. Thankfully, the woman and her pretty daughter helped distract her from the unsettling news of Miles Sanders and his actions. When dinner time arrived, Abigail stood on the landing outside, waiting for Gavin to put his tools away in the shed. She watched Lieutenant Harris and the honey sets depart from Goladuin, catching sight of Poppy's reddened cheeks as the lieutenant peered down at her. His jovial laughter, caused by something Poppy had said, soon drifted on the air toward her, and she watched them curiously before a horse and rider approached, drawing her attention. Captain Kendricks, the man asked, reining in just as Gavin emerged from the shed. He extended a letter to Gavin, who handed the postman a couple of coins from his pocket, before the man set off in a quick dash. Who is it from? Abigail asked, curious as his face brightened. My brother. He's finally accepted our invitation and will be here within a fortnight. Invitation? she asked. Yes, I've been waiting weeks without any word from him. What do you mean? His smile faltered. Did I forget to mention that I invited him to stay with us? Abigail's mouth hung open. Yes, I'm afraid you did. Forgive me, I must have been distracted to have let that slip my mind. I really thought I had mentioned it to you. As the information settled, all thought of Miles vanished, her mind struggling instead with coming to terms with Gavin's news. Of course, he had every right to invite his family to stay there. Gola Duin was his home as well. However... How are we to house them? She asked, forcing a lightness to her tone, though she felt nothing but worry. And provide for them. Well, their two sons will remain with their grandparents in Gloucestershire, so we shall only have to accommodate for Lionel and his wife. My brother will be more than appeasing. Gertrude? He paused with a chuckle. I'm certain she will adjust within a matter of days, with the help of her servants. Servants? Abigail repeated, her voice nearly squeaking. Do we have the room for them, or, or your family? We can manage, he stated. It will only be for a few weeks, at the most. His nonchalant manner chipped at her accommodating behaviour. She was happy Gavin would be able to see his brother after so many years apart. But something bothered her, another fear deep within her soul. Gavin's brother and his wife would be more proper than even Gavin himself. They must have already formed an opinion of her. The poor lighthouse keeper destined for the workhouse, saved by the charity of their foolish brother. She had only just escaped the clutches of the self-doubt the Stedmans had thrust upon her. How was she to manage falling right back into those same feelings again? Suppressing a sigh, Abigail faced Gavin with a smile that she hoped appeared more natural than it felt. Your family is, of course, more than welcome to stay here with us, Gavin. But let us discuss the matter later. Do excuse me. She walked past him but instead of moving toward the house, she headed for the shed. Where are you going? Gavin called after her. She disappeared within the small structure before returning with a fishing rod and a small pail of bait. Fishing, she responded simply. Now? He stared at her, clearly confused. Is dinner not ready? It is, she said, walking past him and motioning to the house with a toss of her head. You may go enjoy the meal while it is warm. I'll return before the lamps must be lit. Can you not fish another time? She set off across the cliffside, but Gavin kept up with her pace. Yes, but I'd rather do so now. He regarded her inquisitively. Are you fishing now so you may avoid speaking with me about how you truly feel concerning my family's visit, as well as hoping that the sea will bring you the peace you desire? Since when had the man become so astute? There really was no point in lying now, not when he'd guessed so accurately. Perhaps. They reached the slope that led to the beach, and Gavin stopped. Then shall I leave you be? 
She stopped a few paces in front of him. Being alone would certainly allow her the opportunity to think more about his family coming, but that was not necessarily a good thing. And truth be told, she would never say no to spending more time with Gavin. She resumed walking down the slope, speaking over her shoulder. I would not mind if you joined me. With how observant he had been before, she was certain he would be able to see how desperately she wished for his company. Sure enough, he quickened his pace and reached her side in a matter of moments, sending a pleased smile in her direction. Before long, they reached the boat they had borrowed from Trevick Honeyset, their new one set to arrive in just a few days. After Abigail tucked the fishing rods securely beneath the seat, they heaved the small vessel toward the sea. Soft waves lapped at her skirts before she jumped into the boat. She expected Gavin to join her, but he motioned for her to move to the seat facing forward. I'll row if you'd like me to, he said. Abigail's mouth parted in surprise. She had only ever been in a boat alone or with her uncle, and even then she had almost always rowed while he did the fishing. Though she should not have been surprised by Gavin's offer. She knew how much he loved to help. She conceded with a nod and switched seats before Gavin jumped in, splashing droplets of water across her knees. He guided them farther into the water, and Abigail tried not to stare at him, though she failed miserably at the task. Gavin's jacket and cravat had been left behind at the house. A few buttons of his waistcoat were unfastened, allowing his shirt to fall open and she struggled to keep her eyes from straying to the top of his sculpted chest. Her thoughts wandered to that night so long ago, when he had stood shirtless in her dining room. She would never have guessed that the wounded captain would one day become her husband. May I ask you what worries you most about my family coming? Abigail blinked. How long had she been staring? She glanced around them. They'd moved past the cliff sides and most of the larger waves and now sailed through lilting waters. A number of things worry me, I suppose, she responded, attempting to gather her wits, her eyes continuing to trail across his chest, shoulders and muscular forearms as he leisurely rolled the oars through the water. That they will be unhappy at Goladuan, that they and their servants will not fit, that they will not like our humble home, or... or me. She expected him to laugh. She would have laughed herself, were she not so sensitive to the issue. But to her surprise, he merely stared at her. Abigail, how could they not love you? His eyes lingered on her. Her breath caught in her throat. Did he mean... was he saying... No. She mentally shook herself. No, they were simply words, nothing more. And yet, suddenly her troubles did not seem so very great anymore. The tension in her body slowly slipped away, and her hands rested comfortably in her lap. She quite enjoyed not rowing, taking in her surroundings without the burning sensation in the muscles of her arms and legs. The sun shimmered against the silvery blue water, light reflecting in a straight line across the sea. Seagulls circled nearby, their calls sounding out against the forgiving waves. She peered down at the calm water, softly lapping at the boat. A few curls of hair refused to stay pinned back any longer, falling forward and tickling her temples. She reached over the side of the boat, allowing her fingers to glide through the cold water as Gavin led them forward. So, you do know how to relax. She looked up, becoming acutely aware of his brown eyes watching her. I have always known how, sir. I simply needed reminding. A small wave splashed up her wrist, the cold exhilarating her senses, before a foreign impish feeling arose within her. Before she could think twice about her actions, she cupped her fingers together, plunging her hand into the sea and launching her arm forward. Gavin gasped ducking far too late as water soaked his chest and face. Dripping wet, he stared at her in silent bewilderment. Abigail was just as surprised herself. She had only meant to tease him, 
But what if he thought her actions were rude? Would he be angry? Perhaps it was rather cruel of her to... Her thoughts vanished as Gavin splashed water across her front in retaliation. She wiped the moisture from her eyes to see him shaking his hand free of the seawater, still dripping from his fingers. I've had my revenge now, he said, his eyes shining brighter than the sun on the sea. We are even. We are not. I am clearly wetter than you are. He flashed a grin. Well, you did start this. It is any fair that I finished it. She made to protest again, but as his hand launched toward the water, hers did the same. They slapped the salty sea onto one another, yelping and grunting in surprise as the cold water covered their faces. Finally, Abigail raised her hands in the air. Stop! she cried out, breathless with laughter and exhilaration. Stop! Gavin immediately ceased, his own deep laughter filling the air until his eyes dropped to the bottom of the boat. We are going to sink with all of this water you have brought aboard, madam. If you recall, sir, I did not do this on my own, she countered. She cast him a knowing look before she caught sight of something floating away in the water, and her eyes rounded. Gavin, the oars! He turned, and together they reached for the paddles. But their combined momentum caused the boat to tip too far, and they both slipped into the cold water. Abigail held her breath, her senses screaming as the frigid sea surrounded her. She swiped her arms through the water, but the movement of the waves pulled her body back and forth, preventing her from knowing the way to the surface. She tucked her legs in close to her chest, wrapping her arms around them, and waited until her body raised. Finally, she thrust her arms out and launched herself up toward the surface of the water. Once she reached the air, she drew in a deep breath, wiping away the hair and moisture from her eyes and looking around her. Gavin emerged a moment later. He gave his head a single shake and his wet hair slanted across his brow. Are you all right? he asked, spitting water from his mouth. She nodded and he motioned to the boat. Stay here. Abigail held on to the side of the boat as Gavin cut through the water with ease to where the oars had floated a few strokes away. He returned with the paddles in hand, tossing them inside before facing her with a raised brow. Now we are equally wet, he said. A smile spread across her wet lips. I am inclined to agree with you, sir. A soft wave roved past them and their legs brushed against each other. Their eyes locked. Abigail's smile faded away, her heart quickening. She could no longer deny the desire she saw in Gavin's focused gaze, not when it so clearly matched her own. He reached out to hold her upper arm, and slowly, gently he pulled her toward him through the water. She swallowed, her mind whirling with nervousness as his eyes dropped to her mouth. Chapter 31 Abigail had longed for this moment, for Gavin's lips to finally be upon hers. Her feelings for the captain had always been of gratitude and admiration, but something else had been simmering in her heart. Something far more powerful. Something in that moment that made her lips part and caused her very soul to tremble with anticipation. His free hand trailed up her arm out of the water and over her shoulder. She blinked, struggling to remain in control of her breathing. His caress moved to cradle the back of her neck with his fingertips. She felt his gentle hand drawing her closer. She needed no further coaxing, but still she waited for him as he moved forward a breath at a time. He tipped his head to one side. Her eyes fluttered to a close, and she waited eagerly, patiently. Finally, his lips brushed against hers in a slow, lingering kiss. Her breathing hitched. The feel of his mouth on hers sent pleasant tingles down the flesh of her back. He pulled away for a single moment, long enough for their eyes to meet, for her heart to cry out in want of his affection, for her mind to spin at the sight of his alluring half-smile. 
before he sailed toward her in a single swift motion. His lips pressed against hers, with a warmth that infused her body. She could no longer feel the cold of the ocean. Only Gavin's kiss remained. Currents of freedom, of peace, curved around her heart as they floated weightless in the water. Gavin's hand moved down her back to encircle her waist. She released her hold of the boat to slide her arms around his neck, and his responding sigh sent a thrill through her chest as their bodies floated as one in the sea. She'd never felt so secure, so protected, as Gavin held her in his embrace. She prayed that the moment might never end, and that Gavin might never let her go. Gavin could think of nothing else but Abigail. Her soft lips on his, her arms around his neck, her feminine frame against his body. His desire for her could not be satisfied. How he had longed for her kiss, for their hearts to beat as one. The words blared in his mind as loud as any cannon. So powerfully, so acutely did he feel them, he could not deny their truth. He loved her. He had fallen for her the moment she had rescued him from the sea, and the feeling had only grown with each moment he spent with her. Each look they shared, each indication of her strength and tenacity, through the adversity she'd faced in her life. It was no wonder he loved her. And yet his feelings could not be shared. Not yet. He knew she felt something for him in return. He was even more certain as she fervently returned his kiss, but he could not risk the delicacy of their developing relationship by sharing something she was not quite ready to return. So, for now, he would simply relish in the knowledge of his love for her, and he would focus on the taste of her sweet lips and the feel of his heart as it swelled for the woman he loved. Yes, he would keep his feelings to himself for as long as she needed him to because Abigail was more than worth the wait. Abigail was breathless. She could taste the salty sea on their lips. The cold ocean began to numb her limbs. Still, she did not pull away. There was something in Gavin's kiss, some emotion behind his affection that prevented her from stopping. She longed to explore it, to discover for herself what he felt. But when a small wave bumped into them, splashing cold water across her brow, she pulled back with a soft gasp. Their eyes met, and a pleasing shiver coursed through her body. Perhaps we ought to dry off, Gavin said, his voice low, raspy. His arm slid down her back, resting on her hip in the water before he released her altogether. She removed her arms from around his neck, ignoring her desire to pull him straight back in for another kiss, and grasped onto the boat. He reached for the boat with his other hand, moving up and down in the water, before pulling himself into the rocking vessel. He extended his hand and helped her in with a swift pull upwards. Once they were situated, Gavin rowed them back to shore. I suppose the fishing will have to wait, he said quirking a brow in her direction. Perhaps for when you were in a less mischievous mood. She did not bother to curb her grin. After they reached the shore and secured the boat, they headed for the lighthouse. She shivered as they reached the top of the cliffs. Though the cold hardly registered in her mind, she was too busy recalling their kiss. However, as they walked toward the shed with the fishing pole in her hand, a strange tapping noise reached her ears, and her brow furrowed. What is that? Gavin glanced toward her. They followed the noise to the oil hutch, and the sinking in her stomach made her legs grow weak. The door stood wide open, swinging on one hinge as it bounced repeatedly against the side of the lighthouse. She ran toward the hutch, standing in the doorway. Oil seeped into the grass outside of the small supply room. The floor glistened from the spillage. The three large vats, once holding the oil that was now spilled across the floor, boasted jagged slashes at the bottom of each metal container. 
None of this is salvageable, she said, as the air fled from her lungs. All of it is gone. Gavin took a step forward, oil pawling around his boots. Was the door locked? She looked around her before retrieving the broken lock from the grass nearby. I know for certain that it was. Gavin could hear the trembling in Abigail's voice. But when she looked up at him, he was surprised to see anger. Not worry, dimming her blue eyes. The boy has gone too far this time, Gavin, she said with flared nostrils. After all we have been through, to now risk losing Goladuin simply because of this child and his selfish actions. I will not stand for it. Miles. Of course she was referring to Miles. Who else would be terrorizing them? He rubbed the back of his neck as she continued. How dare he do this? He must have been watching us, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Does he not understand what he has done? How will we keep the ships away from Dulatha Cliffs without any oil for the lamps? How will any of them stay safe? Despite his own worry for the dismal circumstances, a strange amusement welled within him at her scrunched-up nose and lowered brow. She paced back and forth before him, so he rested a hand on the side of her shoulder to stop her. Let us try to salvage what little oil we can from the bottom of the vats for this evening. Then I will ride to St. Just and request an urgent order for more. Abigail shrugged away from his touch and continued her marching in the grass. No! I will ride to St. Just, so I may seek the boy out. First, I shall make him apologise. Then I shall drag him here by the scruff of his neck if it needs be. And he shall be forced to clear away this mess. And I will next make him clean the hen house. And then I will personally see to his... Abigail? His lip twitched. The scene was too delightful. I know you were upset, but... He will not get away unpunished, she said, staring toward the stables. No, I shall ride for him now. She stormed off, and the humour of the situation vanished as he realised she was in earnest. No, Abigail, you cannot confront him. Yes, I can, and I will. He ran after her as she stomped through the grass, holding her arm and speaking firmly. No, it will not help. You must remember how Miles reacted when I last spoke with him. Gavin certainly did. It had taken days to remove the mess the boy had spat upon his jacket. Abigail blinked, sense returning to her eyes. He's in a fragile state, he said. Dangerous. I fear he may do something worse. Dangerous? Abigail scoffed. I will show him dangerous if he dares step foot near Gola Duin again. Gavin pressed his lips together to avoid another grin. I do not doubt it, and I promise you we will resolve the matter later. For now, however, our priority lies with the oil and the lamps. She nodded, and her shoulders visibly fell. After tipping the vats sideways and managing to fill three pails of oil, Gavin helped Abigail carry them indoors. Then he rode for St. Just, leaving her safely behind the walls of Goladuin and a locked door, all the while praying that Miles would have the sense to stay away. For if Abigail saw him, he knew the boy would sorely pay. Chapter 32 the vandalism of Gola Duin Lighthouse pressed heavily on their minds for days, despite their attempts to resolve the issue. When new vats had been delivered and the oil replenished, they replaced the lock on the hutch and added a large bell that sounded out each time the door opened. Gavin had spoken with Lieutenant Harris about the damage done to their property, and after an unproductive meeting with the local constable, who could not be bothered to do anything further than commiserate, Gavin and Lieutenant Harris had decided to keep watch themselves. However, days later, the lieutenant came by to inform them that Miles had been fired from his work at the local farmers and was spotted at the tavern in Camborne, many miles northeast of St. Just. 
I suppose that will be the last we see of him, then, Gavin said. He has nothing to keep him here any longer. But Abigail and Lieutenant Harris had exchanged unconvinced glances. Still knowing the boy had departed eased Abigail's mind, and her worries gradually shifted to the impending arrival of Gavin's family. She knew Gavin looked forward to his brother's visit, but she struggled with feelings of dread as she prepared for them, purchasing extra candles, dishware and new bedding, and cleaning the lighthouse from top to bottom alongside Poppy and Mrs. Honeyset. When the day finally arrived, Abigail stood in the doorway of Gola Dewan, Gavin at her side. The rain poured in droves across the land that morning, fitting for Abigail's mood, as she moved through the checklist in her mind. She was sure she had forgotten something, or perhaps it was just her apprehension rearing its head. Did you remember to bring your clothing into my room? she asked. Yes, you helped me, and my trunk and other belongings are in there as well. She nodded. That was certainly one thing she would not forget, Gavin sharing her room with her. When Abigail had realised that all the rooms would be spoken for during the visit, Gavin's room for Gertrude and Lionel, the study for the female servants, and the circular room for the men, she had asked Gavin where he was planning to stay. The watch room will suffice, he had said. But Abigail had instantly protested. The room was far too cold and they both knew it. There was nothing else to do but offer her own room. You ought not to be the one to suffer when it is your own home, she had said when he turned his surprised eyes upon her. You can sleep on a cot in my room and be far more comfortable. So Gavin had accepted, and Abigail had tried not to dwell on the intimacy of the situation that lay before them. Thunder rumbled softly over the ocean. Abigail fought the instinct to lean outside and look up to ensure the light remained aglow. She didn't need to, what with Lieutenant Harris watching over the lamps that morning. At least, that was one thing she did not have to worry about. Although she would not have minded taking the lieutenant's place in the watch room, thereby missing the arrival of the Kendrickses. Did I change the linens on their bed? She asked, trying to ignore the swirling in her stomach. Yes, do not fret. You remembered everything, I'm certain, and... He looked down at her. You look lovely. She knew he simply said so to ease her discomfort. She wore the same yellow gown that she had worn to Privley House, still unable to find the courage to wear anything else. I must be honest, though, Gavin continued, his eyes shining. I was hoping you'd wear your cap today. I know how you like to make a strong first impression. She hid her smile that had been produced from his words. Like I made upon you? He stared down at her. I married you, did I not? His eyes flickered to her lips, and butterflies took flight in her stomach. They had not kissed since that first time in the sea, though Abigail had thought of the occurrence daily. She could only guess that Gavin thought about their affection as well. His eyes continually stared at her as they worked around the lighthouse, and he'd taken her hand in his just the other night as they strolled across the beach at sunset. But then she could not understand why he had not kissed her again. She wondered if he regretted the affection, even though she knew he had enjoyed it as greatly as she had. Before she could make sense of his behaviour, her attention was captured by two carriages appearing around the ridge, heading straight for the lighthouse. There they are, Gavin said, excitement ringing in his tone. Abigail stared at the large coaches, each drawn by four white horses. They had arranged to store the coaches in town during the length of their visit, and Abigail was glad that they had. There certainly wasn't room for them on the grounds of Golderduin. Were these the coaches you had as a boy? she asked, eyeing the purple velvet curtains in each of the large windows. Yes, I believe so, Gavin said. She stared at the polished trim and the Kendrick's coat of arms decorating the sides. She knew Gavin was well off, but at the sight of his family's affluence and the knowledge of his own generous living and fortune he'd earned in the Navy, an overwhelming sense of inferiority came upon her, and she longed to hide away in the kitchen with the honey sets. 
The moment the carriages stopped, three servants jumped out of the second coach, popping up umbrellas and holding them with outstretched hands as they lined the pathway toward Gavin and Abigail. A footman opened the door to the front carriage and a gentleman exited. He looked like Gavin, though his nose was rounder and his hair lighter. He pointed toward Gavin with a broad smile. Brother! The man, no doubt Lionel, called out. His curious eyes shifted to Abigail before he turned to extend a hand within the carriage. Dainty gloved fingers reached forth, and an elegant woman in dark blue travelling clothes descended the steps. Her light bonnet framed a feminine face and flawless skin. Abigail watched in silence as Gavin stepped out into the rain, arms outstretched toward his brother. They greeted one another, slapping each other upon their backs with laughter. It has been far too long, Gavin. Though it could have been longer, Gavin quipped. Not fit for the Navy, isn't that what you said about me? Must you bring up words from our past? Well, clearly my husband was wrong. Captain Kendricks, Gertrude said from behind them. That title will not hold for long, though when my retirement becomes official, Gavin said, turning to his brother's wife and bestowing a small kiss on the back of her glove. Gertrude, such a pleasure to see you again. And you, dear brother, she said. How pleased we were that you have finally chosen to retire, and with such a claim. The whole of Gloucestershire is pleased. Just as they were to have heard word of your marriage, Lionel added. All eyes fell upon Abigail then, who still stood in the doorway. Her back was rigid. Lionel, Gertrude, Gavin said, do follow me indoors, so I may finally introduce you to my lovely wife. Abigail backed into the house to allow the others entrance. The hallway was too small for the four of them to stand comfortably, so she and Gavin led the way to the sitting room to make the introductions. We are so pleased to finally meet you, Mrs. Kendricks, Lionel said after his bow. Indeed, Gertrude added. But Gavin's correspondence with us has always been abysmal. As such, we know very little of you. The woman's eyes travelled around the room as she crossed the floor, raising her skirts to a modest level and sitting upon the edge of the settee. Abigail had done her best to improve the lighthouse, especially the sitting room, in the weeks before their arrival. A small vase of flowers rested on the bookshelf. Shells of various sizes and colours were arranged near the hearth, and floral curtains framed the windows. Even with the improvements, however, Abigail knew the sight must have been underwhelming. What a lovely home, Gertrude said, though she warily eyed a crack in the corner of the ceiling and positioned in such a stunning location, Lionel added, more sincerely. Gavin nodded. You must wait until the sun shines. The view is spectacular. My wife is particularly fond of it. Abigail shifted her feet, growing uncomfortable with more curious glances in her direction. She could do with a short break. You must be tired after such dreadful travelling conditions, she said. Would you care for some tea? Please, Gertrude said. Abigail darted across the room as quickly as she could. Her unease did not bode well. If she could not bear a single moment in their presence, how was she to endure weeks with them in her home? Oh, Mrs. Kendricks, Gertrude's words stopped her. Before I forget, would you mind very much directing our help to your servants' entrance and quarters? I should like them to settle us in straight away. Abigail froze, looking to Gavin for aid. We have but one entrance, I'm afraid, he explained. Gertrude's eyes bulged, though she tried to disguise it with a quick succession of blinks. But we will be happy to show them in. Excuse us for one moment. Chapter 33 Abigail left the room turning to Gavin, who followed directly behind her. They must think we are paupers, she whispered when they were out of earshot. Nonsense, Gavin responded softly. 
We're simply unspoiled, that is all. I am unspoiled, she retorted. Gavin chuckled and headed toward the sopping wet servants, still standing out in the rain. Abigail went to the kitchen to find Mrs. Honeyset already laying out a tray of tea. Abigail glanced over her shoulder to see the servants filing past the doors with trunk after trunk, and her eyes widened. "'Tis going to be a tight fit in here, ma'am, Poppy said in her thick accent, with all them trunks and servants. Abigail looked back to the girl, who had paused in scrubbing a spot on the floor. "'Yes, it is,' Abigail said with a sigh. I do not know how we are going to manage. With our help, Mrs. Honeyset said. She extended the tea tray to Abigail, who accepted it with gratitude and left the room. Mamma, Abigail heard Poppy say. Does Lieutenant Harris know they've arrived? Perhaps I ought to tell him. Abigail did not hear Mrs. Honeyset's response, but she could not help but be amused at the girl's obvious excuse to be near the lieutenant. Abigail made for the sitting room, avoiding the stairs of her new family as she placed the newly purchased tray rather noisily on a small table and began to pour the tea. Gavin had returned and was standing with his brother near the fire. Gertrude still sat at the edge of her seat, as if leaning back would soil her gown. In truth, Abigail was not sure that it wouldn't. They had not yet re-upholstered the furnishings of the room. Your husband was just telling us you have only now employed a maid of all work and a cook, Mrs. Kendricks, Gertrude said. Is that true? Abigail ducked her head. Yes, my uncle could not afford to keep much help before. You must find it strange to live here, brother, Lionel said, when compared with Clowey Hall and the number of servants we employ. You forget I have not lived there since I was a boy, Lionel, Gavin responded, and being at sea helps one to realise what is necessary and what is not to live a happy life. Abigail listened to the conversation with growing interest. She knew Gavin had often expressed his happiness with his life at Golodewin, but hearing him say as much to his brother soothed her worries further. She handed a teacup to Gertrude, noting the woman discreetly flaring her nostrils as she sniffed at the tea, then gave one to Lionel and Gavin. Lionel watched Abigail with an inquisitive look, though he smiled with gratitude. The visit progressed, the brothers speaking of their memories from childhood as their wives sat by in silence. Gertrude noisily sipped at her tea and took the smallest bites of a biscuit that Abigail had ever seen. We were quite a pair, were we not? Lionel said with a chuckle. We must have driven our parents mad. Indeed, Gavin agreed. Most children do, I think, Gertrude added, setting her cup to rest on the plate on her lap. Including our boys. How are they faring? Gavin asked. Lionel flashed a smile. Growing into fine strapping men, like their father. Gertrude quirked a brow and becoming as troublesome as their father. At times, I do wish they were still babies. They were far easier to care for than the thirteen and fourteen-year-old boys they have grown to be. She turned to Abigail. I am certain you are grateful that you do not have the added burden of children, Mrs. Kendricks. What with your work at the lighthouse? Gertrude's tone was innocent, but a strange ache twisted Abigail's heart. How wrong the woman was, for Abigail greatly desired children of her own. Still, she did not need to admit as much aloud, not with Gavin watching her so closely. She smiled weakly at Gertrude before averting her gaze. Oh, but that cannot last for long, Lionel eyed his brother. I recall you mentioning the desire to have a large family of your own one day. Had Gavin not told his family the truth of their marriage? A blush burned her cheeks. Gavin stared into his cup of tea. I believe any man would wish to raise a child with the woman he loves. Abigail's heart took flight. Raising a child, a woman he loved. What did his words mean? Had their kiss changed Gavin's expectations in their relationship? Having a child of their own. 
Gavin's child was too wonderful a thought. She needed to distract herself before his words caused her to float in the air with sheer giddiness. Fortunately, Lionel's words brought her back to earth. So, Mrs. Kendricks, he began, I must ask you, as my brother is not inclined to giving up information willingly, how did you meet one another? Abigail's eyes darted to Gavin. You mean, they do not know? No, Gertrude asked, her interest piqued for what Abigail was sure was the first time that morning. Know what? They know only of the shipwreck, Gavin said to Abigail. Nothing further. Of which we heard about first in the papers, Lionel said, with a pointed look in Gavin's direction. I told you eventually, Gavin said. I was merely busy. Lionel scoffed before returning his attention to Abigail. So, please, my dear sister, do tell us how this all came about. Alarm shot through her limbs. If Gavin's family did not know how he met Abigail, then that meant they were also unaware of the true reasoning behind their marriage, just as she had suspected. If Gavin wished to keep it a secret, what was she to say? Her silence continued until, thankfully, Gavin responded, coming to her rescue once again. It's an interesting story, our meeting, he said, his eyes bright. My wife, wearing a cap and jacket, rode her horse to the side of the shipwreck and lit the way to the shore for the men in the boats. Then she rode out to sea herself, past rocks and in a storm, to save me and my lieutenant from drowning. She then proceeded to clean the sizable wound on my arm as well as giving aid to the other injured sailors that evening. He looked in her direction. I was rather taken with her, and have been ever since. Abigail was grateful she was sitting down. That half-smile of his always made her knees quiver. It was fortunate that Gertrude sat as well, for her smooth skin had turned a sickly shade of green. Lionel, however, merely stood by in a stunned stupor. Abigail had hoped to make a good first impression with Gavin's family, but now that was hardly likely. Her unladylike behaviour was certainly shocking to them. Still, she found it difficult to mind much, what with the way Gavin still smiled in her direction. Lionel cleared his throat. Well, I think you may have to go into a little more detail than that, Gavin. I'd be happy to, Gavin replied. Before he could continue, however, Gertrude stood abruptly from her chair. Her voice was faint as she spoke. I'm very glad to see you safe, brother, and that your wife rescued you. However, I feel such tales have caused a weariness to come over me. Mrs. Kendricks, would you be so kind as to show me to my room? Abigail nodded, standing at once to lead Gertrude from the sitting room though she wondered if she ought to stand behind her, just in case she needed to catch the woman mid-swoon. When Gertrude was safely situated in her room with her lady's maid to attend to her, Abigail returned to the sitting room. She listened as Gavin recounted the story of their meeting, Abigail adding bits of information from her side of the experience as Lionel listened, enraptured. But Abigail hardly noticed Lionel's response, for she was far too taken with the look of admiration in her husband's eyes. Admiration that made her heart sore. Gertrude remained in her room the rest of the day. Her lady's maid brought her a tray of food during dinner, while Abigail listened to Gavin and Lionel update one another on the happenings in their lives. The storm gradually faded away, and the sun began to set on the horizon. The Honeysets and Lieutenant Harris had left a few hours before, so Abigail made for the watchroom with a pail of oil in her hands. But Gavin stopped her. Lionel has a desire to see the lamps, so I thought I'd show him. You are welcome to join us, of course. Abigail declined the offer, however, wishing for the brothers to spend some time alone instead. With dinner cleaned, the house near spotless, Gertrude sleeping and the brothers occupied, Abigail found herself strangely with nothing to do. She wondered about the house, knowing she ought to do something productive. But the warm yellow light shining in through the window called to her. 
She donned her shawl and left the house behind. Her boots squished in the moisture on the grass, the bottom of her skirts darkening with water. She stopped at the edge of the cliff, eyeing the sunset before her. Dark clouds hovered low on the horizon, promising more rain that night. But the sun had broken through the cracks in the clouds for a moment and cast bright rays in every direction. The scent of the sea and the fresh air from the storm filled her senses. The rhythmic motion and soothing sound of the waves below lulled her fretful mind into a more peaceful state. Having Lionel and Gertrude stay in her home for two weeks was certainly going to be exhausting, but she could manage. For Gavin, she would manage. She remained there as the sun disappeared into the clouds, a muted grey shading the ocean and countryside. But she was still not ready to leave the serenity she'd found by the sea. I thought you would be out here. She turned to see Gavin approaching. To her relief, he came alone. Seeking respite while you can, I see. He stood close to her, their shoulders grazing. Did your brother reach the lamp room with you? Only just. His extent of exercising is using a horse to do it for him. He chuckled. I told him you have been making the ascent since you were a child, and he was rather impressed. He paused. It is good of you to allow them to stay, and to occupy so much of our home. It certainly is the least I could do after what you have done for me. Their eyes met. How did you find my family? She contemplated her answer. They are very fine. Though I fear I do not have much in common with either one of them. Nor do I, he said. She raised a disbelieving brow. How can that be true? He is your brother. Yes, but we have different priorities. Abigail could not deny the truth in his words. She had noticed the differences as she had listened to them. Lionel was kind, but he spoke a great deal too often about the parties they hosted and the new clothing he'd ordered. She would be forever grateful that she had married the brother she had. A thought occurred, and she stared at Gavin thoughtfully. Do you ever consider how your life might have differed had you married a lady who followed the rules of society? One who is poised and regal, like your brother's wife. He seemed to contemplate her question, and instantly she was overcome with regret. What on earth was she doing, putting such ideas into his head? Well, if he hadn't before, he would certainly desire a finer marriage now. She could not handle hearing him say such a thing. Forgive me, she said. That was a silly question, and one you certainly need not answer. She folded her arms and took a step away from him. Excuse me, I'm feeling a little tired after today. I think I will retire. Good night, Gavin. And she scurried back to the house without awaiting his response. When she reached her room, however, noticing his belongings within, and the small cot situated near the fireplace, her heartbeat thudded hollowly within her ears. She would not be escaping him so easily that evening. Quickly, she changed into her nightdress and hopped into bed, pulling the blankets to her chin and willing herself to fall asleep before Gavin arrived. However, when darkness swallowed the lighthouse and a soft knock occurred at her door, she still lay wide awake. Come in, she answered softly, rolling away from the doorway. The door creaked slowly open and Gavin entered the room. She swallowed. Sorry if I woke you, he said softly to her back. You didn't, she mumbled in her blanket. His footsteps crossed the room and her ears seemed to grow three times larger, and work three times better, as she listened to him remove his boots, waistcoat and shirt. Then on went his nightshirt before he settled into his bed. The cot creaked underneath his stature. Abigail forced her breathing to remain steady. Everything was perfectly fine. Gavin was simply in her room to avoid freezing to death overnight in the watchroom. They would go to sleep and she would not even take a second glance at him as she awoke to see to the lamps that night. She would not think of him again, never mind that she could hear him shifting in his cot, never mind her desire to casually roll over toward him, 
just to catch a glimpse of him before she fell asleep. Abigail? Her heart leapt in her throat. Yes? You did not allow me the chance to respond to your question earlier. If I have ever thought of how my life might be, had I married another? Abigail froze, her back still turned toward him. She did not want to hear his answer. She closed her eyes, wincing as she awaited his words. The truth of the matter is, he said, I do, at times, imagine how my life would have differed. Her heart dropped. She knew it. She knew he regretted marrying her. And each time, he continued, I am relieved that I made the choice I did. I am well aware of my great fortune in having you as my wife. New life beat within her. She kept her eyes closed, afraid that if she looked at him, he'd see her desire to kiss him written plainly across her features as he continued. I am more than happy to be married to a woman who cannot only listen to brave tales, he continued, but take part in them too. A woman who is selfless and courageous. A true lady. Abigail flinched. Her brows drew close together. Gavin had soothed her worries, until those final words. She was no lady, and when he heard the truth, he would not think so either. Chapter 34 Do you see anything you like, my dear? The four Kendrickses walked along the crowded roads of St Just the following day. Stack shops lined the thin streets, and wooden signs with painted letters hung above them. They passed a stall with ribbons draped over the stands, the colourful fabric lifting in the breeze. Gertrude shook her head silently in answer to her husband's question before, placing a hand to her temple. Is it still bothering you? Lionel asked her. I'm afraid so, she responded delicately. Abigail and Gavin exchanged glances behind them, just as Lionel turned to explain. My wife has been suffering with a headache since last evening, he said. We were hoping the fresh air would alleviate the pain. Sleep might have helped as well, Gertrude said, fingering a red ribbon with a wince. Were I able to receive any? I really do not know how the two of you manage living so close to the sea. It is so very loud. I find it difficult to sleep without it now, Gavin said. As do I, Abigail agreed. Gertrude didn't seem to hear them. Well, my lack of sleep caused a delirium of sorts to come about me. I thought I heard footsteps moving about the house all throughout the night. Though, I suppose that could have been the servants. Abigail thought the woman was teasing, but when she saw her serious expression, she looked to Gavin with a quizzical look. Had he not told his family they saw to the lamps all night? Before she or Gavin could explain, Lionel rested a gentle hand on his wife's shoulder. My dear, those footsteps you heard were Gavin and Mrs. Kendrick's, seeing to the lighthouse. Gertrude looked away from a yellow ribbon. No, Mr. Kendrick's, this continued throughout the night, and well into the morning. Her husband nodded, and her brow lowered. She turned to Gavin and Abigail. It was you? Abigail nodded. The lamps need to be refilled throughout the night. But, Gertrude sputtered, looking positively aghast. But when do you ever sleep? We take different shifts, Gavin explained. And now Lieutenant Harris, you remember him from yesterday. He helps us throughout the day when it storms. My goodness, Gertrude turned white. Abigail wondered if the woman was going to be sick. But then, white had to be better than the shade of green her face had taken on the day before. Mittender, greeted an elderly man near the ribbons. He wore a frayed grey cap that did nothing but accentuate the wrinkles covering every bit of his face. Gertrude stared blankly at the cart owner before shaking away her surprise at his foreign tongue and smiling. Do you perhaps have a lovely shade of Pomona? The man reached for a green ribbon hanging behind the others and extended it to Gertrude. Excellent. Thank you, sir. She handed him two coins and led the group forward once more. Oh, 
Look here. She motioned toward the Golden Arms Inn, where a paper was nailed near the front door. The corners of the notice flapped up and down in the breeze. As they approached, Gertrude read the words aloud. A public assembly. How delightfully refreshing would it be to attend a quaint country dance after the grand balls we hold at Clowey Hall. I'm certain the both of you are already planning to attend, though. Her light brown eyes searched the others with excitement, but Gavin shook his head. No, we weren't, actually. Abigail studied the paper as half a plan formulated in her mind. Two days, help with the lamps, public assembly. Gavin would certainly be pleased. Oh, yes. Gertrude's face fell. I'm afraid I've forgotten already. You must watch over the lighthouse. But Abigail hardly heard, still mulling over the idea. She knew Gavin would have no problem paying the subscription, nor attending at all. Of course, she did not know many of the dances. She had no reason to. But it was not unheard of for a wife to sit out an entire assembly. And since dancing with one's spouse was hardly customary, she would not wish to partner with anyone at all anyway. She tried to convince herself that going to an assembly without dancing would be hardly worth the effort. But then, Gavin was worth the effort, and she would like to show him that she had changed, that she could attend a public gathering without leaving in an insecure and furious huff. The memory of what had occurred during Abigail's last social outing nearly prevented her from speaking at all. The Stedmans would most certainly attend the assembly. However, the gathering would be large enough that Abigail might not even cross their paths. Besides, Gavin knew the truth about Mrs. Stedman now, and he would defend Abigail should anything adverse occur. Of that she was sure. What a pity, Gertrude said. I am certain a bit of entertainment and country dancing would have ridden me of this headache for good. Abigail drew a deep breath and finally spoke up. Perhaps, she glanced to Gavin, perhaps we could attend. If the weather holds, Lieutenant Harris could watch over the lighthouse for a few hours. What do you think, Captain? Gavin's eyes brightened, a slow smile spreading across his lips. I think it's a very fine idea. Oh, do you really think so? Gertrude placed a hand to her chest. That would be delightful. I simply adore dancing. She spoke about her abilities with the pastime as she directed their small party farther down the street. Gavin held Abigail back as they walked slowly together. Are you ill? He asked softly. She laughed. Why? Because of what you just agreed to. Have you ever been to an assembly before? No, but I always wish to. She paused. Do you not want to go? No, no, I do, he said. Very much so. Good, then I'm certain we shall enjoy ourselves. He brought her hand up to place a lingering kiss to her fingers. You are full of surprises, Mrs Kendricks. What other secrets have you yet to share with me? His eyes danced, but Abigail nearly tripped as the words jolted sense into her. Her mind scrambled for a response, but Lionel spoke over his shoulder, saving her from needing to reply. A blush blazed across her face. Gavin's words had struck far too close to the truth. Secrets, her life, her past, was inundated with secrets. Secrets that would drive a wedge between herself and Gavin should he ever discover them. She glanced up at him as he laughed at something his brother said. The cheerful sound and his easy smile strengthened her resolve. She could not allow their relationship to weaken, not when they were so happy together, not after everything they had overcome. She would tell him, just as soon as she found the courage to do so. Chapter 35 Two days later, Gavin paced back and forth in the sitting room. He knew he would be ready for the assembly that evening, long before Lionel and Gertrude would end their primping. But as Abigail had yet to emerge from her room as well, 
his anxiousness increased. Mrs. Honeyset and Poppy had already left after helping Abigail to dress. He couldn't imagine what was still keeping her. He'd never known her to spend so much time on anything, especially fussing over her looks. But perhaps it was his own impatience that was the issue. After all, he had been looking forward to the evening for days. He was thrilled when she'd first suggested going, and admittedly a little worried, if only for Abigail's sake. The Stedmans would certainly be there. Even so, he was determined to be vigilant. And if anything was said to his wife, the Stedmans could be sure that Gavin would be there to see the matter resolved. Gavin? He stopped pacing and looked to the doorway, but Abigail did not appear. Yes? Has Lieutenant Harris arrived yet? He left the room and peered down the corridor, seeing her door slightly open. Only the tip of her nose was visible from within the room. Yes, he replied. He is situated in the watch room, and the lamps have already been lit. He knows to inform us should anything out of the ordinary happen, she asked. Even if it is another cat? Yes, he is fully prepared. Gavin struggled to regain his carefree state, setting aside his thoughts of Miles. He refused to dwell on the boy, who, to his relief, had kept away from St. Just. Thank you, Abigail said, and she pulled back within her room. He waited for a moment, staring at the closed door, before returning to the sitting room and resuming his pacing. Gavin? He paused again with amusement. Yes? Would you... Her voice lowered. Would you come here for a moment? Of course. He moved down the corridor and paused just outside of the slightly open door. He knocked. Abigail? Yes, come in. He entered the room. Did you need... Words failed him. His feet rooted to the floor. Does this suit? She asked holding out the folds of her gown and twisting back and forth. She eyed the length, her lips twisted in displeasure. Abigail stood tall and regal, her light green gown modestly accentuating her feminine form with delicate lace and flowing fabric. Cream slippers peeked out from her dress and white gloves reached far up her slender arms. A golden ribbon was tied beneath her bodice and poured down her back. Sitting high upon the crown of her head, her auburn hair was twisted and curled, a few tendrils trailing down from her chignon and gracing her temples. Such a style only heightened the blue in her eyes and the light speckling of freckles across her cheeks and nose. Gavin had always found Abigail attractive, but that evening, that evening she made it difficult for him to breathe. I feel it is too much, she said with a scowl. He closed the door behind him. No, you look perfect. Honestly, Gavin, she said, still eyeing the dress with disdain. I need you to be serious. I fear it is too extravagant for a simple public assembly. The fact that she was unaware of her beauty made her even more attractive. I am speaking honestly, Abigail. You are beautiful. Are you quite certain? she asked. She had yet to look at him. Mrs. Follett assured me it was the latest fashion, but I cannot help but think she said so, only to see more of your fortune fall into her hands. Gavin chuckled. That may be so, but perhaps you think it too fine because you are comparing it to your work dresses. Well, I would be a great deal more comfortable wearing one of those, I assure you, she huffed scratching at the lace on her shoulder. Oh, this colour simply does not suit me, I'm sure of it. No, I ought to change. I cannot arrive. Abigail? Appearing to be someone I am not. My hair must be a sight as well. I told Mrs. Honeyset to not make it so very grand. Oh, I cannot imagine why I've spent so long doing this when... Abigail. It is all for naught. No, I shall not be attending the dance. Please, accept my apologies. I do feel a bit of an ache in my head. Perhaps the ocean is affecting me as it does Mrs. Kendrick's. Yes, 
That is what has happened. I shall not... Gavin reached forth, placing his hands on either side of her face and staring directly into her eyes. She stopped, blinking in stunned silence. Abigail? He repeated, softer. You are stunning. Her blue eyes peered up at him, humility shining in their depths. He caressed her soft cheeks with his thumbs. He had managed to control himself for weeks now, to discover if Abigail's feelings for him had grown to love yet. He had noticed the way her eyes twinkled whenever they spoke, and the way she wistfully sighed as she stared at him. But mostly, he noticed how quickly and substantially his own willpower waned. And now in that moment, in her room, with her eyes framed with dark eyelashes and her neck long and gracefully curved as she looked up at him, he could no longer help himself. He had to kiss those pink and perfectly parted lips once more. He closed the distance between them, their lips a breath apart. But the door next to their room opened, and his brother's voice floated toward them as he travelled down the corridor. With a great sigh and a considerable amount of restraint, Gavin slid his fingers from her face. He allowed them to trail down her shoulders and arms before holding her hands softly in his own. I suppose we shouldn't keep them. His desire to kiss Abigail strengthened as he noted her own disappointment on her face, and so he vowed that before the night was over, he would kiss his wife again, and properly. With every jostle of the carriage, Abigail drew closer to Gavin. Their shoulders touched and his knee pressed against hers. Her heart skipped a beat with each beguiling look he sent in her direction, each furtive glance to her mouth. He looked strapping, as usual, in his jacket and polished shoes. His dark green waistcoat complemented her own gown nicely, and his cravat made his jaw appear even stronger. And his lips. She had been so close to kissing those lips again. But now was certainly not the time to dwell on such things, not with his family seated right across from them. She looked to Gertrude and Lionel, and was surprised to see sombre expressions from both of them. I'm afraid we have some very unpleasant news to share with the both of you, Lionel said. Yes, we do, Gertrude agreed. She waited until all eyes were upon her before continuing. You see, this will be our last night with you at Goloduin. Abigail pulled back in surprise. Their last night? But they were supposed to stay for weeks, weren't they? Did that mean she would have her home and Gavin all to herself again? She tried to squelch her hope. After all, they could be teasing. I'm sure you were both wondering why we have chosen to cut our visit so short, Gertrude continued. Let me first assure you that it was not of your own doing. You both have made us feel so welcome. Indeed, we shall miss your lovely lighthouse. We merely leave because the waves of the sea have become too great for me to bear. So she did not jest. They were in actuality leaving. A rush of excitement overcame Abigail. She could hardly believe her fortune. We truly are sorry to leave you both so soon, Lionel added. He sent an apologetic look in his brother's direction. Suddenly shame washed over Abigail. She was so focused on her own comfort that she had not even considered how Gavin might feel about the news. She glanced up at him, but was surprised to find that his expression had not changed from before. He looked perfectly content and not the least bit surprised. Well, we certainly do not wish you to stay if you are suffering so greatly here, he said. But we will miss you. Will you return to Clowey Hall now, or spend the remainder of your time in London? No, we are to take the waters in Bath, Gertrude said, with a pained look, though Abigail was certain she caught a glimpse of excitement in the woman's eyes. My cousin Mr Quigley has often requested our presence at his own lodging on the Royal Crescent. I sent a letter to him only this morning. I am certain he will be most accommodating. She carried on about the success she had often received by taking the waters, but Abigail listened only intermittently 
as she stared out of the coach window. A flock of birds flew above the trees in the distance, no doubt headed for their homes, and the summer skies quickly darkened to reveal the first twinkling stars of the night. Everything about the peaceful scene should have calmed Abigail's nerves, but instead of sighing with relaxation, she gripped the fern she held in her hands even tighter, trying to make sense of the range of emotions spinning within her. Gavin must be upset at no longer seeing his brother. Despite his outward, placid appearance, she was sure of it. Just as she was sure that she should not be feeling so happy about the same matter that caused him such distress. The conflict within her grew as she considered the assembly next. She was more confident in her relationship with Gavin, but still dreaded facing the Stedmans, and whoever else might think her unfit to be in attendance. However, she herself had chosen to come to the assembly. No one had pressured her into it. And, as Gavin's wife, she had just as much right as anyone to attend. Yet when they reached St. Just, her resolve threatened to dissipate. The eyes of those filing into the inn focused on the Kendricks's impressive carriage as they pulled to a stop. Their stately arrival was certainly not going to help Abigail who had just decided to go about the evening as unnoticed as possible. Gavin and Lionel exited first, before helping their wives from the coach. Abigail ducked her head, avoiding the stairs, though she could still hear the words around them. Such a fine coach! Who are they, Mamma? Why, is that the lighthouse keeper? She grasped onto Gavin's arm as he escorted her toward the line slowly filing into the inn. You must be pleased, he said, leaning in close. She struggled to make sense of his words. How could she be pleased with their ostentatious entrance and the talk that had already begun to sound around them? About my brother leaving, he clarified. Oh, yes. How could she have forgotten? I mean, no. No, I am sorry to see them go, of course, for your sake. Well, you needn't worry about me, he said. She looked up at him with her brows drawn. Why ever not? Before he could explain, their turn had come to enter the inn. They passed through the large doors to the right of the establishment. Abigail looked around her, taking in the sights. The room's dark wooden walls were lit by the shining chandeliers above. Flowers arranged in arches decorated the top of each doorway. Women spun in circles in the single dance set that lined the large hall, their finery and beaming faces flashing for all to take notice and admire. Three musicians sat at the front of the room, playing their music as loudly as possible to be heard over the laughter, conversation and cheering. Chairs and benches lined the edges of the room, filled to their occupancy with mothers gossiping with one another as they watched their dancing daughters. Abigail's stomach became a jumbled mess as she thought of being near the others and all their grandeur. She pulled out her fan and waved it beneath her chin, praying the cool air would calm her nerves. However, when she noticed a few younger women standing nearby, daughters of local farmers and fishermen, enjoying themselves as they laughed and danced with their friends and companions, Abigail took comfort in knowing that she was not entirely out of place after all. They entered a smaller room, adjoined with a simple archway and open double doors. Tables were set up with light refreshments, and the occupants gathered in small groups to speak above the sound of the lively music. The four Kendrickses paused near the entryway. From her vantage point, Abigail could see another room beyond, filled with heavy smoke and dim lighting. The card room. She shuffled her feet to face another direction. She did not wish to see the men inside, with their glassy eyes and worried brows. It reminded her too much of how her uncle might have appeared when he'd lost all of their money. Soon, a small group gathered around them, and Gavin introduced his brother and sister-in-law to Mr. Reynolds, the Summerfields, and the Biddles. Those in the group fairly fawned over Gertrude in all her grace and elegance. Abigail wondered if that was the reason the woman had wanted to attend the assembly in the first place. Abigail could not blame her. 
nor was she unhappy with the attention Gertrude did receive, for any attention that was on Gertrude was attention that was off of Abigail, and that was certainly something to be happy about. As the conversation centred around the Kendricks' home in Gloucestershire, music from the hall drifted toward Abigail's ears. She looked over her shoulder to observe the twirling young women in their fine dresses again, but her eyes instantly fell upon the Stedmans, and her stomach turned as quickly as the dancers. Mrs. Stedman was speaking to Mrs. Reynolds. No doubt the both of them were engaged in some manner of gossip, as evident by their wide eyes and open mouths. Miss Stedman stood behind them, apparently unaware of her mother's tantalising chatter, as she stared, unsurprisingly, in Gavin's direction. Abigail's lips pulled into a deep frown. Had the girl no decency? Yes, Mrs. Stedman encouraged her daughter's behaviour, but that in no way excused Miss Stedman's own shameful actions and Abigail had a mind to do something about it. However, as Miss Stedman, who had yet to become aware of Abigail watching her, continued to stare at Gavin, sadness flitted in her eyes, and a look of sorrow flashed on her brow. Abigail paused. What had the girl to be sad about? The fact that Gavin was already married, or that she knew she erred in wanting to lead him astray? Before Abigail could decipher the young woman's thoughts, her view was broken by the couples dancing down the set. By the time they skipped past, Miss Stedman had disappeared. Gertrude's lilting laughter brought Abigail's attention back to the group. She faced forward to see the woman's lively eyes as she shared one story after another. The group completely captivated. Her headache certainly seems to have dissipated, Gavin said leaning down toward Abigail and whispering in her ear. His breath fluttered the soft curls near her neck, sending chills along her arms. Thank goodness the gloves covered most of them. Yes, she seems much recovered, Abigail returned, if she even had a headache to begin with. Gavin chuckled. The deep, rich sound was music to her ears. Abigail glanced to Lionel, who watched his wife with clear admiration in his eyes. They certainly did love each other. She thought again of their impending departure and recalled Gavin's apathetic words from earlier. Are you truly not upset with their leaving, Gavin? She asked quietly. He leaned toward her again. Of course, I will be sorry to see them go. But I am as ready as you are to have our home to ourselves again. Abigail's spirits soared. She still needed to take care. But knowing Gavin was not utterly distraught eased her guilty conscience. I suddenly took for granted being able to walk through the circular room without stepping on a footman's hand, Gavin continued, or head. Abigail's eyes widened. Did that truly happen? I cannot say for certain, but I did see a strange boot-shaped mark on the footman's brow this morning. They snickered together at the image his words had produced. But in the next moment, a voice from behind them stopped their laughter. Captain? Chapter 36 They turned to the sound of Mr. Reynolds calling. Abigail was surprised to discover that the group around them had dwindled. Gertrude stood off to the side, in conversation with the Summerfields, and all who remained next to Gavin and Abigail were Mr. Reynolds and Lionel. Care to try your luck at a bit of cards? Mr. Reynolds asked. The gentleman looked to the card room. Thank you, Gavin responded, but not this evening. Abigail knew Gavin refused the offer to be considerate of her own feelings. He must remember her uncle's foolishness as much as she did. Though she appreciated the sentiment, she had no right to control his life. If he wished to play, then he should be allowed to. Besides, she knew most men enjoyed gaming, but not all of them became obsessive, as her uncle had. It will be all right if you go, she said softly, motioning to the room. No, I'd rather not. Come now, sir, Mr. Reynolds pressed. Surely you aren't afraid of losing to a physician. Gavin merely smiled in response. I must warn you, sir, 
Lionel said. You waste your time with my brother. He has never been one to play at cards. Mr. Reynolds narrowed his eyes. Is that true, Captain? Gavin shrugged. I never saw the appeal of risking something I'd worked hard for. Lionel and Mr. Reynolds struck up a conversation of their own, but Abigail stared up at Gavin. He had never liked a game? She could hardly believe it. Every gentleman she had ever known, including her own uncle and father, enjoyed gaming. And yet, Gavin did not. Just one more reason to add to her ever-growing list of why she was so grateful he was her husband. A smooth voice spoke up behind her and shrouded her joy in a dark, thick cloud. For one who does not like taking risks, he certainly took one on his wife. Gavin's muscles tensed beneath her hand. Abigail eyed his furrowed brow, the rage sparking in his eyes, and she knew at once that he'd heard Mrs. Stedman's words as clearly as she had. He made to turn, and Abigail knew what he intended. Her heart soared. How many years had she longed to be protected in such a way? To be taken care of, defended. She could only imagine the things he would say. Mrs. Stedman was sure to never bother with them again. And Miss Stedman would finally cease her flirtatious stares. Finally, Abigail had the help she needed. Finally, she would be safe. Yet, as Gavin moved, she reached out her hand to prevent him. He shot her a puzzled look, but she gave a subtle shake of her head and looked over her shoulder herself. The Stedman stood a mere arm's length away. Abigail noticed Miss Stedman first, staring at her mother with a crinkled brow. The young woman sent a fleeting, guilt-ridden glance in Abigail's direction, before leaving her mother's side and disappearing from the room. Mrs. Stedman watched her daughter depart before facing Abigail with innocent eyes. Now was Abigail's chance. Gavin had heard the snake's tongue, but she had prevented him from speaking. Because this was her fight, and knowing she had Gavin's support gave her the courage she needed to go on. She opened her mouth, ready to release years of pent-up frustrations over the woman's behaviour. Abigail would tell her what she truly thought of her how Uncle Ellis would have never married a woman so despicable, and she would finally have the revenge she deserved. She made to release her hold of Gavin's arm, before she realised she was holding Gavin's arm. The world seemed to slow around her as her emotions, reactions and feelings fell into place. What did it matter what Mrs. Stedman said? Abigail knew there was nothing she could say to change the woman's opinion of her. Mrs. Stedman could very well remain bitter until the day she died, merely because Uncle Ellis did not choose her. She paused. Uncle Ellis had not chosen Mrs. Stedman, and it had caused the woman misery for years. And Uncle Ellis? He had not chosen Abigail either. She knew all too well the pain of rejection, of not feeling good enough for someone she loved. But she could not allow her own hurt and betrayal to make her caustic and cruel, like it had Mrs. Stedman. Abigail needed to forgive. She needed to allow herself to heal from Mrs. Stedman's actions and her uncle's, for she had something else, someone else, to live for. She looked up at Gavin, his brown eyes still studying her, and she squared her shoulders. She would no longer be controlled by another's darkness. She would choose light and she would choose Gavin. With a fleeting look in Mrs. Stedman's direction, she turned away. She is not worth any more of my time, she whispered. The heavy burden upon her shoulders began to lighten at the pleased look Gavin shared with her. The rest of the evening passed by swiftly. The Stedmans kept very much away from them both, though Abigail saw Miss Stedman's focus occasionally dart away from her as she danced down the set. Gertrude remained the centre of attention for most of the night. Many gentlemen vied for her hand, but she eventually chose to sit out the dances as well, her headache having returned. Abigail had found herself enjoying the excitement around her, partaking in laughter and good-natured conversation. 
But as midnight arrived, she was quite relieved to wait for their coach as it pulled up in front of the inn. Gavin offered his hand to help her into the carriage, but as she reached for her skirts, she noticed the absence of her fan. I believe I left it near the refreshment table, she said, with an apologetic look. I can retrieve it quickly. No, allow me to fetch it for you, Gavin said, helping her into the coach with a soft squeeze to her fingers. I'll be but a moment. As Abigail peered out of the coach's window, watching Gavin walk away with his broad shoulders and powerful stride, she wondered what she had done to deserve such a man in her life. Gavin eyed the refreshment table, spotting Abigail's fan in an instant. He weaved through the people still drinking and chatting away before retrieving it and turning on his heel, intent on returning to the carriage as quickly as possible. However, as he turned, he came face to face with Mrs. Stedman, who smiled up at him with a look of innocence. He clutched Abigail's fan in his fist. How Mrs. Stedman even dared to look at him was beyond him. He had clearly heard her words about his wife. Did she think, for one moment, he would pretend it did not happen? Captain, she said, so you did not leave after all. Have you returned to dance with my lovely daughter? He cringed to think of how daft he had been before, to have completely missed her true intentions concerning her daughter and himself. Well, he would not be so foolish now. She is a true lady, my daughter, Mrs. Stedman continued. Some women may attempt to match her by changing gowns and hairstyles, but no amount of primping can compare to her natural beauty. It is no wonder you admire her. His eyes snapped to the woman. Anger caused his breath to catch. Abigail may have been noble enough to have turned the other cheek, but he could no longer allow Mrs. Stedman's shameful behaviour to continue. He faced her squarely and spoke in a firm tone. You are mistaken, ma'am, if you think I could ever admire your daughter above my own wife. That is not and never shall be the truth. Mrs. Stedman's eyes rounded, her face aflame as he pressed on. Furthermore, I must clarify that I shall never grow weary of Abigail nor shall I seek companionship with anyone other than her, ever. Her eyes darted around her, as if to ensure no one else heard their words. Of course, sir. I would never dream of suggesting otherwise. I should hope not. He stared at her pointedly. Now, if you will excuse me, my wife is waiting for me. Yes, yes, of course. She was gone before Gavin moved a single step. Satisfaction overcame him to have seen her flustered state. Finally, they were to be rid of the woman. He drew in a deep, calming breath, then moved past smiling couples and stifled yawns, anxious to be once again at his wife's side. When they reached the lighthouse, Gertrude went straight to bed, while Gavin and Lionel convened in the sitting room. Abigail rang the large bell in the circular room, apologising to the servant she'd awoken, and waited for Lieutenant Harris to descend the stairs. Did you have an enjoyable evening, ma'am? He asked, as he reached her side. She thought back to her releasing Mrs. Stedman's hold over her, to Gavin's attentiveness throughout the night, and her cheeks glowed. Very enjoyable, thank you. How fares Gola doing? All is well, ma'am. Everything is in order. No cats in the hen house. No destruction to the lighthouse. She released a sigh. Perhaps the boy has moved on then, she said. I wouldn't doubt it, ma'am. When Lieutenant Harris had left, Abigail brought in a tray of tea for Gavin and Lionel, then excused herself to retire as well. After managing to unfasten the buttons of her gown, and wiggle her way out of the rest of it, Abigail donned her nightdress and slipped into bed. But the moment her head hit the pillow, she recalled the oil hutch. Lieutenant Harris would have remembered to secure the lock after refilling the lamps, she was sure. And yet, the thought refused to pass. 
With a groan, she threw back her covers and left her room. When she heard voices coming from the sitting room, however, she paused, staring down at her nightdress. She could hardly walk by the gentleman wearing so little, no matter how quickly she darted past the doorway. She stifled a sigh and made to return to her room. But when she heard her name, spoken in Gavin's deep voice, she held her breath and leaned close to the doorway to better hear the brother's words. Chapter 37 Truthfully, you lasted longer at Gurluduin than I anticipated, Gavin said, smiling at Lionel as he sat across from him in the sitting room. Though Abigail believed you would remain the full two weeks. Well, at least I have the confidence of your wife, Lionel said with a laugh. I was fully intending on remaining, I assure you. We truly are leaving due to Gertrude's headache but we were taken aback by the size of the lighthouse. Surely not. I explained very clearly what space was available. Lionel waved his hand. Yes, yes, I know. I told Gertrude what to expect, but change is difficult for her. And for you? Gavin quirked a brow and leaned back in his chair, lacing his hands together at his waist. As short as your visit was, though, I am glad you could be here to meet Abigail. At the thought of his wife, Gavin recalled the evening he'd shared with her. He had wanted to kiss her while she wore that dress. He had wanted to express his love to her. But he had quickly realised that doing so in a more intimate location, not a teeming assembly, would be far better for them both. After all, they were already married. Why could they not speak with more privacy? somewhere without interruption. He wished to do so somewhere that he could finally kiss her, reveal his feelings for her, and pray that she might now feel the same. I wish I could have come to your wedding. Lionel's words ended Gavin's thoughts. He looked to his brother's unreadable expression. I wished for you to attend as well. But you understand time did not permit. Lionel opened and closed his mouth before sighing. Gavin, forgive me. You seem very happy with your wife, but I must ask, did you marry her for love? Gavin propped his elbow on the armrest of the chair, resting his head against it with a finger to his temple. He had known the question would come at some point during their visit. He had rehearsed his answer as well, to avoid any judgment his family might cast upon Abigail. But at Lionel's deciphering eyes, Gavin knew he could not get away with a lie. Chewing his lower lip, he shook his head. That is not what spurred the marriage on in the beginning, no. Lionel's shoulders fell, and he tilted his head to the side with disappointment. Then why on earth did you do it, Gavin? You have only now submitted your request to retire. You had your whole life before you, and certainly your choice of women. I mean no disrespect to your lovely wife, of course. She is attractive and amiable, but did you have no desire to marry for love at all? Of course I did, Gavin responded. I long for love in a marriage as much as any man. Then why did you do it? Gavin leaned forward, gathering his thoughts before proceeding. When Abigail's uncle died, he left behind a considerable debt, one that would force her from Goloduin. I offered my hand in marriage so I could pay the debt and allow her to stay at her home. Lionel stared, clearly dumbfounded. You gave up your future? Your prospects? Your home in Gloucestershire? To live out the remainder of your days in a lighthouse with a woman you did not know long enough to even trust? Of course not, Gavin said, scowling. I forfeited a barren life and an uncertain future for a home in a place I love near the sea I love, with a woman more than deserving of a secure and happy life. But what of your own happiness? You have seen for yourself that I am happy here. Lionel looked away. Very well, but will it last? How could you ever be certain when you behave so rashly? Gavin stared into the fire with a shake of his head. I do not behave rashly, Lionel. I rely upon my instinct an instinct that I believe is God-given. I felt it when joining the Navy, 
which I have never once regretted, and it helped me survive countless storms and battles at sea. My decision to retire was made in the same regard. He paused with a sigh. I was lost at sea. Not physically, but mentally. I knew not what my future held, nor what I wished to do with the rest of my life. He looked then to his brother. But when I saw Go Laduin shining above me, when Abigail pulled me from the sea, I felt a pull to her, as if I finally knew where to go. And I am certain you may venture a guess as to what other decision I have made based on my instinct. A small smile curved across Lionel's lips. Marrying Abigail. Marrying Abigail, Gavin repeated. After she rescued me, I could not keep away. I saw her love for Cornwall, for Goloduin. I soon grew to love the same things, and I knew I could not live with myself if I did not help her. And now, I realize that I could not live a happy life without her by my side. Abigail blinked back her tears as she tiptoed back to her room. Lying in her bed, the oil hutch completely forgotten, she stared at the ceiling with a full heart. Being at the assembly that evening had made her feel free. Living near the sea, safely beneath Goloduin's light, made her feel alive. And Gavin, Gavin made her feel loved. With her worrying and wondering set aside, she could finally admit the words to herself. She loved the captain, with a love that ran deep. A love that filled every part of her body and her soul. And how she longed to share it with him. Before long, she heard him coming down the corridor. She closed her eyes as the door opened and shut. His shoes softly slid across the wooden floor as he walked toward his cot. In the dim light of the dying fire, she peered at him through her eyelashes. Her heart fluttered when she saw his eyes upon her. He removed his cravat and jacket, dropping them onto his dresser before turning around to remove his shirt. She eyed the purple scar on his upper left arm. So much had occurred since that fateful shipwreck two months before. She could hardly believe it. He sat on his bed with a sigh, rubbing his hands on his face with a tired look. He eyed the dresser, and Abigail wondered if he contemplated pulling on his nightdress. Eventually, he lay back, stretching out on the cot with hands resting behind his head. She watched him for a moment, just as she had the past few nights they had shared a room. After that first night together, she had been too nervous to do anything but feign sleep. Soon his chest rose and fell with slow breaths, and she observed him for only a moment before her own eyelids drifted to a close. Not a moment later, she woke up to a loud crack of breaking wood. She sat upright, her heart pounding. Miles, she knew it was him, but what had he done this time? She scanned the length of the room before narrowing her eyes toward Gavin, who sat in a pile of bedding, his cot crumpled into pieces beneath him. What happened? She whispered. He ran his fingers through his hair, his voice groggy. The cot gave way. Are you all right? She asked, leaning forward. Gavin grunted as he stood, staring at the mess on the floor. Well, I'm in better shape than my cot. With her previous exhaustion gone, Abigail pulled the blanket up to her mouth to hide her amusement. She bit her lip, but was unable to stop her shoulders from shaking as she laughed silently at the sight. Gavin glanced toward her his eyebrows raised accusatorily. Oh, this is humorous to you, is it? No, came her muffled response as she pressed the fabric against her mouth harder. A giggle escaped her lips. She eyed his tall stature and broad physique and wondered how the cot had not broken until that night. She drew in a deep breath, speaking when she'd regained control. Are you certain you are well? Yes, I believe I'll live. He slid a few of the broken pieces off to the side. Where are the extra cots? Underneath the Kendricks' servants, I'm afraid. Of course they are, he muttered. The floor it shall be then. 
He laid out his blanket upon the hard wood with his pillow on the top. You cannot sleep down there, Gavin, she said. You would be far too uncomfortable, not to mention cold. I shall manage. He sat down upon the blankets and she leaned over the side of her bed to better see him. Why do I not sleep there and you take my bed? Tonight is your shift for the lamps, so it is only fair you sleep soundly for a few hours at least. He glanced at her side long. I think not. He lay down, shifting his weight and settling upon the floor. He repeated the motion two more times before sitting upright with an exasperated sigh. I'm going to sleep in the watchroom. He picked up his blankets and pillow, but Abigail shook her head. Gavin, you know it is too cold to sleep comfortably at all up there. Besides, the cot in the watchroom is less sturdy than the one you have just flattened down here. She bit her lip to keep her laughter at bay. Very well, then I shall sleep on the settee in the sitting room. I have it on good authority, she said, his hand pausing on the door handle, that one of the servants has taken to sleeping on the very same settee while the rest of the household has gone to bed in case you have not noticed him sleeping there before. She paused. Perhaps he has broken his own cot. He scowled at the laughter she could no longer stifle. Well, I'm out of options then. Perhaps I should sleep in the stables. Though I assume you take issue with that suggestion as well. Of course I do. Then what am I to do? She looked down at her own bed. Why do you not sleep here for the night? Chapter 38 I have already said I will not sleep in your bed while you sleep on the... Gavin's brow raised in surprise. Oh, you'll be all right with that? Embarrassment flushed through Abigail. What had she just suggested? Of course it was the only logical solution, and her bed was more than large enough for the both of them. But what would he think, with her being so forward? And how was she to even sleep a moment with Gavin so near her? It will only be for tonight, she said, attempting to appear nonchalant, despite her burning cheeks. And I only offer because I need your help with the lighthouse. Otherwise your freezing overnight would not matter. She wondered if he caught her teasing as he peered over at her with his dark eyes. I would not wish to impose. She shuffled over to the far side of the bed, patting the empty spot next to her. The only imposition would be if you kept me awake any longer with your indecisiveness. Come along. He dropped his blankets on the floor and walked toward her with his pillow. Very well, if you are certain. I am. She lay back on her pillow, tucking her nightdress modestly beneath her as he lifted the blankets. Cold air slid across her body until he settled down. The bed creaked. May I ask a favour of you? she asked. She stared up at the ceiling, though she could see him watching her from his back. Of course, he replied. Please try not to break my bed as well. Silence met her until Gavin's chuckle sounded about the room with her own. I certainly will do my best. When their laughter subsided, the tension between them eased. Thank you, Abigail, Gavin said. I am far more comfortable here than I would have been on the floor. Well, I could not, in good conscience, allow you to sleep anywhere else. Gavin's eyes focused on her. You must be careful, Mrs Kendricks. If you say such things, I may begin to think that you have grown fond of me. She turned to face him, and suddenly her lungs refused to work. She and Gavin were close. Too close. She could see every bit of his face. Despite the dim light, his strong jaw, dark hair, his bare chest partially covered by the blankets. Her blankets. What had she done inviting him into her bed? It was far too intimate and far too tempting. Her eyes drew to his lips. Do not flatter yourself, sir. I haven't grown fond of you. Of course, she only said such a thing to quell her racing heart. Unfortunately, it did not work. Deny it all you like, my darling, Gavin said as he nestled further in his pillow. You have grown fond of me. 
The endearment made her head spin. And when Gavin found her hand next to his above the blanket, he threaded his fingers between hers. Her skin tingled at his touch, her heart flying as high as the gulls over the sea. How she loved this man lying beside her. How she wished to be honest with him, to tell him the truth about her past. Surely he would listen and understand, just as he always did. Of course, now was not the time. Now she was going to enjoy the presence of her husband lying next to her and the feel of his hand holding hers. She returned his grasp and tightened her own, and he stroked his thumb against her skin. Good night, Abigail, he whispered. Good night, Gavin. With his caress on her hand and the sound of his deep, steady breathing beside her, Abigail's eyes drifted to a close, her fingers remaining intertwined with his until long after they had both fallen fast asleep. The next day, the Kendrickses and their servants departed from Goloduin. Gertrude had dabbed at tears that were not present, and Lionel had observed Abigail with curious eyes. They left with the promise to return one day, but as their coaches pulled away from the lighthouse, Gavin had exchanged a dubious look with Abigail. With their house empty once again, Gavin intended on celebrating with his wife, using the excuse of purchasing more feed for the horses and hens he'd left for town, while Abigail remained behind to light the lamps for the approaching storm on the horizon. He rode through St. Just swiftly, hoping to return home before the rain set in, longing to be reunited with Abigail sooner. The night before, he'd had to practice incredible restraint by simply holding Abigail's hand as they lay together. She had been so close, so tempting, with her auburn hair sprawled out across her pillow, her pink lips ever so inviting. He would miss Lionel and Gertrude at Goloduin, but he would miss sharing a bed with his wife more, though he hoped that would not be the same forever. After picking up his orders, he returned to his horse. He opened the small box, peering inside to see the ring, a gold band lined with five stacked turquoise gems that he'd had made for Abigail weeks before. He'd wanted to give her a ring on the day of their wedding, but decided to have something special made when they had more time. He tucked it securely within the box before sliding it into his saddlebag. As he glanced over his horse, his eyes fell upon Mrs. Reynolds, walking down the street in his direction. She was deep in conversation with Mrs. Madden, a middle-aged woman in their parish. By the looks on their faces, they appeared to be sharing some sordid manner of gossip, probably learned from last night's assembly, and Gavin did not wish to become involved. He wanted to return to Abigail. Without another thought, he ducked low, feigning to examine his horse's back leg as the women passed by. We should not be surprised, he heard Mrs. Madden say, what with the behaviour of her uncle. Indeed, Mrs. Reynolds said, but still it is all rather disturbing. I do not know how Mrs. Kendricks can ever leave Goloduin, knowing the truth about her past. A warning flared in Gavin's mind. Everything within him told him to stop listening, to get away from the women's gossip as quickly as possible. But he froze. Are you certain it's even true? Oh, yes. Mrs. Steadman has confirmed it herself, Mrs. Reynolds said. And it is easy enough to believe. Mrs. Abigail Kendricks is, quite assuredly, the daughter of a drunken gentleman and his scullery maid. Shock pulsed through Gavin's body. He could hardly breathe. The women continued down the street, neither of them appearing aware that they had been overheard. But their words spun around in Gavin's mind. He had suspected that Abigail's parents were the source of her reticence regarding her past, but he had never allowed himself to speculate for long. After all, he had thought Abigail would trust him enough to share more by now. So why had she not? He felt like he was walking through a fog, his legs heavy as he heaved himself onto his horse. Captain? He shook his head. He could not speak. He needed to get to Goloduin, to Abigail. 
He needed to speak with her, but the voice called again. Captain Kendricks! Harris. He recognised his voice now. Gavin turned his attention to the approaching lieutenant. What is it? Captain, I needed to... Are you well? Yes, but I need to return to Goloduin. Of course, Harris said, though his eyes were wary. I will not take up much of your time. I simply thought you should know. Miles Sanders was seen here again last evening, in the tavern. Gavin tried to focus. Miles had returned? He groaned. Sir, are you certain you are well? Yes, thank you for telling me. Please keep an eye on him as best you can. I... I need to get back to the lighthouse. Gavin did not wait for a response, merely led his horse forward, riding the quickest way through town, though his movements hardly registered as he thought of Abigail. He recalled the moment long ago when she had finally agreed to their marriage. She had been about to tell him something. This certainly must have been it. He had pressed her not to speak until she was ready to do so, and he still stood by that decision. He did not want to pressure her, to force her to tell him anything out of guilt. He had wanted Abigail to tell him because she wanted to, because she trusted him, because she loved him, and the knowledge that she didn't was what caused the ache in his heart the most. Chapter 39 Abigail hummed a simple tune as she arranged a few wildflowers in a vase. Having gathered them just as the rain began, droplets still clung to the yellow petals. The vibrancy they brought into the room outshone even the dark clouds outside. After lighting the lamps, and with the honey sets having the day off, deciding it only fair after their hard work during the Kendricks' visit, Abigail had taken it upon herself to make a quick meal for her and Gavin to enjoy when he returned. The smell of warm bread wafted through the house as it cooled on the table. She glanced up from the flowers as a movement across the window caught her eye. Gavin was leading his horse into the stables. Quickly, she went about gathering the final touches of the meal. Butter, marmalade and a bowl of fruit. She finished, waiting at the window until she saw him emerge from the stable, his top hat low as he ducked his head in the rain. The door opened and she waited for his familiar greeting as she twisted the vase to look better at a different angle. Silence met her. Gavin, I hope you did not get too wet in the rain. The storm certainly came in quickly. There was a pause. Yes, it did. She left the dining room in search of him. I made bread if you were hungry. She found him in the sitting room, standing at the window with his back turned toward her. His jacket hung over a chair, dripping onto the floor, and the shoulders of his waistcoat were wet. Are you all right? He nodded. But then why did he not turn to face her? And why did he not speak? Did something happen while you were in town? More word of miles, perhaps? Thunder sounded, a low, prolonged rumbling, and Gavin turned toward her. When his eyes fell upon her, her heart sank. Gavin? Her voice was hardly above a whisper. Why, Abigail? She fidgeted with her fingers. What do you mean? Why did you not tell me? Her chin trembled. She could not play the fool, nor could she allow Gavin to feel like one. He knew about her past. But how? I tried to tell you. Before our marriage, I tried to tell you. But you said I did not have to, not until I was ready. I know he said, and I meant it. Before we were married, you would have told me the truth out of obligation. So why, after all our time together, did you not tell me sooner? I was afraid, Gavin, and I only grew more afraid as time passed because... The pain in his eyes pierced her soul, and her breath caught in her throat. I'm sorry, Gavin, she whispered, and she fled from the house. Abigail, wait! But she couldn't. She slammed the door behind her, raising her skirts to her knees and running freely across the grass on the cliffside. Rain and tears streamed down her face. Why had she not told Gavin the truth sooner? 
Why did she not take courage and speak the words the moment he'd offered his hand in marriage, like she'd intended? The truth had become more difficult to say the closer they had drawn to each other. And now, she was too late. She slid down to the beach, her pace slowing as soon as she reached the water. Waves crashed onto the shore in grey and white droves, and the wind sprayed the mist high into the air at each wave's crest. The sound of the water rushing toward her enveloped her senses, but it did not dull the ache in her heart. She tried to convince herself that she was strong and independent, that she could move on from this alone. But the words were feeble attempts to mollify her fears. Would Gavin leave her now that he knew the truth? He certainly had every right to. She was dishonest. She was an illegitimate child. And she was unworthy of being married to a captain of the Navy. To a gentleman as good as Gavin, whose name would now be tarnished because of her. As she caught sight of Goloduin glowing above, a numbness crept over her. The structure stood strong in the storm. Tall grass thrashed back and forth against it, and rain assailed the windows. Yet still its light shone, warning captains of the danger that awaited them should they stray too close to the shore. Why had Gavin not followed the warning? If only he had stayed away. He could have saved himself from the misery and heartache she had caused him. He could have married a woman worthy of his love, not one who had used his wealth and good nature to her advantage. A great wave slammed into the sand before her, water reaching her boots and lifting her skirts to her calves. But she remained where she was. After all, what did it matter if her boots and dress were ruined by the salty sea? What did it matter if her feet numbed from the cold? The lighthouse, her home, her way of life and source of income? None of it mattered without Gavin. None of it mattered but Gavin. She should have put him before all else, instead of focusing so greatly on her own fears, of losing the lighthouse, of Mrs. Stedman's words, and of her past being revealed. She had allowed herself to become careless in her regard of him, and she bitterly regretted her selfishness. Abigail. She started, willing her breathing to remain steady at Gavin's call. He was not supposed to follow her. He was supposed to leave her. She remained motionless, her hands hanging limply at her sides. His boots splashed through the water as he moved toward her. Abigail, what are you doing? She clenched her teeth together to prevent her chin from trembling. He reached out to her, but she stepped away from his grasp, eyeing him sidelong. Don't, Gavin, I do not deserve... Her voice broke. I was deceitful. You were a gentleman. You deserved better. Abigail, if you think this changes our marriage... How can it not? She asked, finally facing him. Rain slid down his face, his clothing already soaked through with water. I am the product of a loveless tryst. My mother, a scullery maid. My father, a philanderer. I do not deserve happiness with you. Ask me, Abigail, if I feel such a way. She turned away, but he stood in front of her, forcing her to look at him. Ask me. I cannot. Why? Why do you fear telling me about your past? She drew in a shaking breath, staring at the sand as it swirled around the water in which they stood. Because I could not bear your disappointment. Nor could I bear the thought of you leaving. Gavin took a step toward her. She ducked her head, but he reached out, cradling her face in his hands and urging her to meet his eyes. Have I not proven my devotion to you, Abigail? he asked, wiping her tears with his thumbs. I could never leave you. I will never leave you. Abigail stared into his deep brown eyes, and finally she believed him. He wrapped his arms around her, and she clung to the back of his shirt, silently crying against his chest. I'm sorry, she whispered, as he held her securely amidst the storm. I'm sorry for everything. Chapter 40 
When her cries softened, Gavin helped Abigail return to the lighthouse. His heart had broken as she revealed her true fears to him, and he was determined even more to prove his dedication to the woman he loved. After changing into dry clothes and ensuring the light still glowed above, they sat down together in the sitting room. The storm still raged outside. The sun hidden behind the clouds caused the room to darken, though the fire cast a warm glow around them. They huddled near one another on the settee, a thick blanket across their laps. Gavin held Abigail's cold hands, feeling them tremble in his grasp as she began her story. In truth, I am surprised my secret has been kept from you for this long, she said, her blue eyes darkened with shame. I am not certain, but I believe there are a few individuals around St. Just who are aware of my past. Most of them have kept the information to themselves, but I'm sure I may safely assume you heard word of it from Mrs. Steadman. In a way, Gavin said. He recounted what he had heard from Mrs. Reynolds, and Abigail's shoulders sunk further. I should like to tell you the full truth now, so this secrecy between us may come to an end. She drew a deep breath. My father was Mr. Norman Moore of Grinston Hall in Staffordshire. When he was 18 years old, his father died, leaving him in control of the estate. As master of the house, he was not discouraged when he took interest in the young, lower maids of the house. He did as he wished with them, and removed those who protested or spoke of his behaviour. He met my mother, a scullery maid for his estate, when she was fifteen, and he pursued her. But when she discovered she was with child, his child, he sent her away. She had nowhere to turn, no family, no friends, so she took refuge and found work in a... the house of ill repute. And it was there I was born. She winced, a crease forming between her eyebrows. Only a few women knew of my existence. I was kept there secretly for five years, until my mother could no longer afford to keep me. That, or she no longer wished to keep me. She woke me early one morning for a promised walk in the sunshine. I was thrilled to be out of doors, even for the hour's long journey we took. She brought me to the servant's entrance of a stately home I had never seen. She handed me a letter addressed to the lady of the house and left me with a kiss to my brow, promising to return when she could better keep me. I watched her walk away for the last time that day as I would discover later. She was killed by a man she... Her eyes dropped, and Gavin nodded his understanding. He struggled to come to terms with her words, imagining all too well the sight of a young Abigail, alone and abandoned. After she left, I was brought into Grinston Hall before the mistress, Mrs. Moore. She called for her son, my father, though I was not aware of who they were at the time. I saw his eyes focus on my hair, the same shade as my mother's, and with an emptiness in his eyes, he left the room without a glance back. In what I suppose was an effort to avoid a scandal, or perhaps as some evidence of guilt, my grandmother, knowing of her son's rampant debauchery, sent me to the boarding school in Cheshire. I was far enough away to have no connection with her, Beyond the monthly payment, she sent for me to continue living there. Her lips slanted down. I preferred my other living to the boarding school. I did my best to be obedient. But I discovered that nothing stopped the scolding and beatings from teachers and students alike. I was there to be punished. Not for my own choices, but for my parents. Understanding and compassion swelled in Gavin's mind. Words Abigail had said to him before, things she had done, all of it made sense now in the revelation of her history. It was no wonder she feared he would leave her. Everyone else in her life had. No one, especially a little girl, especially his Abigail, should have to have suffered in such a way. After four years, she continued, I was told that Mrs. Moore had died. 
My time at the school was to be terminated. I would be sent to the local parish before being assigned to hard labour elsewhere. The day I was set to leave, I sat on a large chair outside of the schoolmaster's office, waiting to meet my new master. The door opened, and I was met instead by a man with blue eyes. When she paused, he spoke. Your uncle? Yes. He dropped to his knees and wrapped his arms around me. He promised to never leave me like everyone else had in my life. I did not trust him, of course, and pushed out of his embrace. But after he berated the schoolmaster for my treatment, and then proceeded to fill me with many pies and pastries, I became less wary of him. A hint of a smile touched her lips. Did he bring you directly to Cornwall? Gavin asked. Yes, and I was allowed for the first time in my life to explore the world around me. Her eyes took on a faraway look. Instead of carriages on cobblestones, I heard the roar of the sea's waves and herring gulls calling overhead. Instead of the black iron fence that confined me at the boarding house, I was surrounded by rugged cliff sides and pink wild flowers. And instead of being forgotten, I had a family. I had a home. I had Gola Duin to always watch over me. Gavin had known all along that the lighthouse meant a great deal to Abigail, but he never truly understood why until that moment. How happy he was that he had been able to help her save this place that meant so much to her. The fire crackled in the silence between them. Abigail seemed peaceful, and Gavin hesitated to interrupt her thoughts, but his questions refused to cease. Why did your uncle not bring you to Cornwall earlier? He asked softly, or at least remove you from the school. He did not know of my existence until then, she replied. Apparently, his mother revealed the truth about me on her deathbed, and he immediately set out to find me. And your father did not. No, I know very little of the man, only that he was very wealthy before he lost it all to gaming. Of course. Gavin pressed a hand to his temple. No wonder Abigail disliked playing cards so greatly. The obsession with gaming ran thickly through her family. Uncle Ellis often spoke of his disapproval of his brother tarnishing the family name with his immoral behaviour, she said. He knew of my father's gaming habits, so he used his living to build Goluduin and left Grinston Hall and his brother's reputation behind. Did he ever see him again? Not after their mother's death. A year after I was brought to Cornwall, we received word that my father ended his own life, but not before losing his entire fortune and estate. She sniffed with derision. My uncle claimed to be different, said he would never fall like his brother had. But I suppose he was wrong. Her eyes hardened before she glanced to Gavin with a sigh. So there you have it. The noble history of the Moors. How pleased you must be to have married into such disgrace. Her shame was apparent. She clearly thought very little of herself and of her past but Gavin could no longer allow it to continue. He sat forward, facing her squarely. Abigail, you are far more than your family's choices. You choose to be strong when you could easily be claimed as a victim of your childhood. You choose altruism in being a lighthouse keeper when you could be selfish. He peered into her eyes, speaking with sincerity he hoped she believed. I hope you will one day realise that no matter your history, no matter who did or did not raise you, no matter where you were brought up, your own selfless decisions reveal just the sort of remarkable woman that you are. A tear dropped from her eye, leaving a path of moisture trailing down her cheek. You must simply believe that you are more, he whispered, because to me, you're everything. Their eyes met. Love swelled in his heart. The words settled at the tip of his tongue. But a loud blast rang through the air, 
and the sound of glass shattering far above then made Gavin pull Abigail down to the floor and shield her body with his own. Chapter 41 Stay low, Gavin commanded, hunching down beside Abigail. Was that a gunshot? She questioned. Yes. I heard glass breaking, she continued. But the windows aren't broken in here. Their eyes met, worry passing between them, before Gavin ran low across the floor, peering up through the window. The light, he said. It is not shining. Together they ran through the room, securing the latch at the front door, before sprinting up the spiral stairs. This is Miles's work, growled Abigail ahead of him. I'm sure of it. Gavin's stomach churned. He feared the boy was the cause as well. I spoke with Lieutenant Harris this morning. He said Miles returned to St. Just last night. You see? It was him. Focus on reaching the lamps, Gavin replied, breathing heavily as they rounded curve after curve. We will deal with him later. They should already be relit, Gavin. We both know better than to leave the watch room during a storm. I know. He could say nothing further to soothe her worries. He had already thought the same. Their pace slowed as they climbed the tower, neither of them saying another word until they reached the watch room. Slowly, Gavin poked his head into the lamp room. The refractors still rotated, but most of the lamps had gone out from the swirling wind in the room. A single window pane was shattered nearby, broken glass on the floor lying beneath it. He relayed the news to Abigail, who stood below in the watch room. Is he still out there? she asked. He peered past the windows to the ground below, and then to where the cliff stood, nearly eye level with the lamps. The sky was darkened due to the storm, but he could still see the land clearly before him. There was no sign of the boy. I cannot see him. He must have left after firing. He heard her groan in frustration, but he could not dwell on miles. He needed to relight the lamps. Have we a replacement for the window? He asked. Her footsteps crossed the floor, objects being shuffled aside before she returned, handing him a small pane of glass and a jar of strong putty. Working quickly, Gavin cleared the remaining shards of glass from the pane before, holding the new glass in place with the putty. Is it secure? Abigail asked, her head sticking up through the latch door. I believe so. I will help you light the lamps then. No, please stay below. He could not risk her getting injured. Look to the sea instead. She hesitated before moving down the steps. Gavin worked swiftly to relight the lamps before he joined her in the watch room. Together they stood at the window, looking out over the storm. No ship sighted? he asked. Thankfully, no. They remained silent for a moment before she continued. Will he fire again, do you think? I don't know. Gavin answered, honestly. But in this storm, it would not be wise to go after him now. Her arms crossed over her chest. He placed an arm around her shoulder, pulling her close to him. We will alert the constable as soon as the storm permits. I'm certain Lieutenant Harris will help us too. But for now, focus on what we can do. The light still shines and the storm will pass. Abigail rested her head against his shoulder her arm reaching around his back. He placed a kiss to the top of her head, and together they stared out at the storm-ridden sea. Within a few hours, the skies had cleared. Abigail and Gavin rode for St Just the moment the sun pierced through the clouds. After posting a letter to Trinity House, alerting them of the destruction that had taken place to their property again, they enlisted Lieutenant Harris and the constable to help keep watch over Golodouin that evening. Knowing they had eyes on the lighthouse helped to ease Abigail's concerns. But how long could they last in such a way? And how long would they be tormented by the boy? Despite her concern over the growing threat, Abigail could not deny the weight and shame that had lifted from her soul after telling Gavin of her past. The fact that he remained with her listened to her every word, and still expressed his feelings for her. 
made her great love for the captain grow in such a measure. She could hardly bear keeping it to herself. At nightfall, with the lighthouse aglow, Gavin agreed to stay in the watchroom while Abigail remained below, listening at the door for any news from Lieutenant Harris or the constable. Even as the night progressed uneventfully, Abigail found it difficult to rest at all. The threat of danger loomed heavily upon her mind. When she heard Gavin come downstairs for the first refilling, she jumped out of bed, anxious for a distraction. She met him at the front door when he returned with his pail of oil. They had both remained dressed to be ready, should anything occur, but Gavin's shirt hung open at the top, his braces holding his breeches and stretching over his broad shoulders. All is well, I assume? she asked, holding out a candle to light their faces as he closed the door behind him. He nodded. Have you been able to sleep at all? I find I am not so tired. A yawn escaped her mouth, betraying her words. In truth, she was exhausted. Are you worrying? Gavin asked, as they made for the circular room, pausing at the bottom of the stairs. A little? Are you not? He set the oil on the first step and peered down at her. A little? He repeated. They stared at one another, the candlelight flickering shadows across Gavin's face. His dark eyes focused on her, and she wondered what he was thinking. No doubt worrying over Miles and the lighthouse, her own mind was filled with the very same. But also something else, something she longed to share with him. She feared expressing her love, but then she could not keep her feelings to herself any longer. Gavin? A muffled noise sounded nearby. She paused, directing her attention to the front door. Did you hear that? What? I thought... The sound occurred again. There! Someone is calling out! Is it the lieutenant? Gavin darted down the corridor. Stay inside. Take care, Gavin! She called after him. He looked over his shoulder. With a lingering stare in her direction, he nodded and left the house. She secured the door behind him and raced to the sitting room. Peering through the window, she saw him just before he vanished into the darkness. Captain! Gavin moved toward the sound of Harris's voice, his fists clenched in preparation for the struggle that was about to ensue. Harris had found Miles, he was sure of it, and the boy would be putting up a fight. He ran through the darkness, focusing on the small light in the distance on the pathway leading to Goluduin. Harris! Gavin called out, running toward him, anxious to give aid to his friend. But as Gavin neared, he saw Harris hunched toward the ground. What has happened? I don't know, sir, Harris replied. I discovered him only moments ago. Confusion settled on Gavin's brow. Discovered who? His footsteps slowed, his eyes honed in on Harris, and only then did Gavin see Miles' body spread out across the ground. He hesitated. Is he? No, but he's badly hurt. The light of Harris's lantern cast low shadows across the boy's bloodied and bruised face. Help me bring him inside, Gavin directed at once. They worked together to lift Miles's unconscious body off the ground, carrying him to the lighthouse. Abigail, Gavin called out. She opened the door to their home moments later, holding a lantern aloft. Ready my room. She left the door open and disappeared inside. Gavin and Harris manoeuvred through the corridors with side steps before placing Miles on Gavin's bed. Abigail had stripped it bare, save a single sheet. She placed extra candles near the bed and lit a fire in the hearth before disappearing from the room. The light revealed a large gash on Miles's brow, blood trickling from his forehead, both nostrils and his right ear. Gavin's stomach clenched. Do we know who could have done this to him? I've no idea, sir. I saw his figure in the darkness stumbling toward Goluduin. I wasn't certain it was him until I approached, and he merely fell to the ground before me. Miles stirred on the bed, a moan coming from his opened mouth. Seek out the constable, Gavin said, and fetch Mr. Reynolds. Yes, sir, the lieutenant said. 
He left as Abigail returned with water and rags. Miles stirred again. Miles? Gavin spoke softly, moving to the boy's side and leaning over him. Can you hear me? The boy grimaced, his head shifting from side to side as Abigail removed his wet boots, revealing bare, wrinkled feet. Gavin flinched at the smell. Can you tell me who has hurt you? He asked, as the boy groaned. Miles's left eye was swollen shut. The blood draining from his body soaked the sheet near his head. Abigail, will you help me with his head wound? He asked, tearing open Miles's shirt. Newly formed bruises speckled his ribs and chest. Abigail slid his hair from his brow and wiped a rag across the blood. The boy tossed again. Miles, Gavin repeated. Finally, one of his eyes opened before he winced and closed it again. Cat, where? You're in the lighthouse, Miles, Gavin explained. You are badly wounded. A physician has been summoned, but... No! The boy suddenly cried out. His eye was wide open and he pushed Abigail away. Anger surged through Gavin's chest and he held the boy's arms down as Abigail backed away. Gavin would not allow any harm to come to his wife, no matter if the boy was injured or not. Calm down, he said firmly. No, not for I... Miles's words slurred together. Sir, I need to speak with you. I need to tell you. He pulled his arm from Gavin's grasp and clawed at his chest, as if wishing to pull his skin aside. His face contorted with agony. What happened, Miles? Gavin asked. Who did this to you? Dealt with the wrong sort of people, sir. Just as I have me whole life. His voice was raspy, his pain evident with each word he spoke. But I deserve the fate that's coming. Gavin felt a soft hand on his arm. He turned to see Abigail, extending a glass of brandy toward him and motioning to Miles. Gavin nodded his thanks before offering it to the boy, but Miles turned away. I don't deserve your help. Not after what I done. His brows turned up, his face crumbling. If Gavin didn't know better, he would never have believed that this was the same boy who contributed to the shipwreck, who had tampered with the anchor cables, destroyed their property at Goloduin, and spat on and cursed Gavin. Miles' demeanour was completely altered. The anger was gone from his eyes. Only pain and anguish remained. Gavin couldn't understand the change, but he also couldn't bear to see the boy suffering, despite all that he had done. Rest now, Miles. Do not. Twas I, he said softly, ignoring Gavin's words. I'd done it all. Gavin exchanged glances with Abigail, who silently watched the exchange near the bedside. I was angry, Miles said. I started the fire on the ship, cut the cables, just to keep me brother from hanging. I never expected you'd save us. That made me only angrier. And after what you did to me brother, you didn't deserve happiness. You deserve suffering. He drew in a wheezing breath. Which is why I... I did what I did here. I thought if enough happened, you'd be miserable, same as I. Another hoarse breath caused a fit of coughing to overtake him. Blood flew from his mouth across his body and the white sheets. Gavin jerked back, but not before being sprayed himself. Stop speaking, Miles, Gavin said. The boy needed to rest, to stop tormenting himself. But I was so angry, Miles continued. I was so angry that I... I killed him. A heavy feeling settled in the pit of Gavin's stomach. Who, Miles? But the boy's eyes were no longer on him. They were focused on Abigail. Chapter 42 Abigail couldn't breathe. Who did you kill, Miles? Came Gavin's repeated question. I'm sorry, the boy said with a muffled sob. He coughed again drawing his arm up. Blood dripped from his skin. I'm sorry. Twas me, ma'am. Twas me who killed your uncle. Her whole frame shook. Her legs weakened. 
She took a step back, shaking her head. No, no, the boy was lying. He couldn't have killed her uncle. Uncle Ellis had slipped off the side of the cliff. He was drunk. Her head whirled as the boy continued. His eyes were closed, his mouth crinkled as he barely restrained his emotion. We sat at the same table in the tavern. We'd had a few drinks before. He told us the captain had taken a liking to his niece. Every game he won, till I had nothing else. I couldn't stand the way he praised the captain and then boasted in his own winning. So I followed him. He shaded his eyes with a shaking hand. By the cliffs. I'd only meant to take his winnings. But he told me he gave him away, all ready to pay off his gaming from another night. I was so angry. I, I pushed him, and he fell on the grass and just, just slid right over the edge. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to. Another cry, another cough. Blood drained from the corner of his mouth. I'd be sorry, ma'am. I couldn't die without, without telling you. I'm sorry. Tears spilled down Abigail's cheeks. She felt as if she was watching her uncle die right before her eyes again. So fresh was the pain in her heart. The stench of alcohol on Miles' breath, like Uncle Ellis's. The boy's eyes were blue, like Uncle Ellis's. Abigail stepped toward him, moving around Gavin and sitting on the bed beside the boy. Miles' shoulders shook as he attempted to restrain his cries and coughs. She raised a rag to his face, wiping the blood spilling down his chin. Thank you for your honesty, Miles, she said, her voice soft as she pressed the cool rag to his brow. Rest now. I forgive you. Miles succumbed to his wounds shortly after his confession. After the lamp had been refilled, and Lieutenant Harris, the constable and Mr. Reynolds left with the body, Abigail had finally broken down. Gavin held her through most of the night, cradling her in his arms until she finally fell into a dreamless sleep. The next day, they received word that a man who Miles had once worked with at the local farmers had been arrested for the boy's death. After being robbed by the boy with a gun, which Miles had stolen from his previous employers, the man had exacted his revenge at night, under the cover of darkness. Miles must have known his death was imminent after the beating, so he stumbled to Goladuin to admit his guilt, before meeting his maker. After learning the news, Gavin had written to St. Just to deliver his testimony in writing about Miles' state before his death. While he was away, Abigail remained at Goladuin, poring over her uncle's old letters and journals. By the time Gavin returned, dinner had come and gone, but there was still light enough for them to take a walk up to Uncle Ellis's grave site on the cliff behind Goloduin. Gulls cried above their heads, and the sea sparkled in the evening light. A few pink flowers dotted the edge of the cliff, the last remaining of the season. Abigail stared at the foot of the grave, grass just beginning to sprout on top of the dirt. I have not been up here since Uncle's funeral she said, taking a deep breath of the fresh air around her. After I learned what he did, I could hardly bear to think of him. But after Miles's confession last night, I was relieved to discover that Uncle had not chosen to leave me after all. In truth, he fought for me until the very end. She raised the small book she had clasped in her hands. His journal. I left it untouched in the bottom of his trunk, unable to read his words until this morning. There are many pages in which he expressed his struggle with drinking and gaming, but he always ended each entry with these words. She turned to a page and read aloud. Remember Abigail. Remember why you brought her to Goloduin. Remember to give her the life that she deserves. She lowered the book and looked to Gavin, whose dark eyes shone with tears of his own. With a smile she turned, taking a step forward and kneeling before her uncle's grave. Her whispers disappeared on the wind as she spoke. I'm sorry you could not overcome your past, Uncle, but I wish you to know I am overcoming mine. She remained there for a moment, drawing in a deep breath as she felt the pain of her past life lifting from her heart, easing with each moment that passed by. 
Yes, she was moving on from her past, all with the help from Gavin. She looked over her shoulder and saw him patiently waiting for her, his eyes filled with understanding and compassion. She stood and returned to his side. My uncle did his best, so that is the memory I will keep of him. They shared a smile, then moved away from the grave, heading down the curved pathway toward the lower cliffside. May I ask you a question, Abigail? Gavin spoke quietly, continuing after she nodded. How are you able to find forgiveness for Miles after what he'd done? She gathered her thoughts for a moment before her eyebrows drew together. How could I begrudge the boy whose life I understood so fully? When I looked at him last night, I saw my uncle reflected in his eyes. And myself. Not who I have become, but who I was before. A lonely child, mistreated by those who should have loved me best. I shudder to think how my life might have mirrored Miles, had Uncle not brought me here, or had you never come to Golodouin. They reached the cliff's edge, the glowing sun shining before them, the ocean's waves rolling softly toward the shore below. She turned to face him which is why I need to ask you if you were truly happy with your life here. He brushed the hair blowing past her brow. Abigail, you know that I am. Yes, but will your happiness last? You have sacrificed everything for me, Gavin, and now I wish to return the favour. So, if you truly do not wish to lead your life here any longer... I will support your decision and we can sell the lighthouse. He leaned forward, disbelief written across his face as he narrowed his eyes. Abigail, do you honestly believe I could even entertain such an idea? After all the work we have put in, the sacrifices we have made, have we not been fighting for Guluduin from the very beginning? Of course we have, and I would continue fighting for it for the rest of my days but you deserve the right to choose your own life, a life not dictated by the lighthouse or my own desires. I have told you, Abigail, I chose you, and I will not leave you. No, I know that now. I meant I would go with you. His brow softened. You would leave the lighthouse? For you, I would. I can only imagine one thing worse than losing Goloduin and that would be losing you. A half-smile tugged at his lips. He broke their eye contact for a single moment as he reached into his jacket pocket and produced a small box. She eyed it curiously as he removed the lid. Then she gasped when he pulled out a gold and turquoise ring. He reached forth, placing the ring on her finger. This is only a small token to remind you of my devotion to you. My hope is that you will look at this ring each day and remember that my happiness with you here will last forever. He took a step toward her, caressing her cheek with his thumb. I love Cornwall and living so near the sea. I love the purpose the lighthouse brings to my life. But more importantly, I love you, the woman behind the light of Goloduin. For you saved a man, not only lost at sea, but in life as well. The admission of his love did not take Abigail by surprise, nor did it send her mind spinning, for deep down she had known all along his feelings for her. Instead, a peace settled deep within her heart, an overwhelming sense of gratitude and love filling her soul. She placed a hand against Gavin's cheek. I love you, Gavin. But then, you already knew that. Their eyes locked. He drew closer to her, and their lips met in a tender kiss. She reached up, sliding her fingers through his hair, and he sighed in response. Gone were the fears of her past. Gone was her concern for her future, for she knew Gavin would be with her every step of the way. Their lips parted. He took her hand in his, and together they walked toward the lighthouse and their bright future ahead. Epilogue Abigail and Gavin walked hand in hand across the cliffside as the sun hung above the ocean. The days were finally growing longer after the many winter months 
allowing them the opportunity to spend more time away from the lamps. The sky glowed a deep orange and red, perfectly reflected in the still sea. They paused at the edge of the cliff, Goloduin shining nearby as they took in the view. Winter had lessened the colours around them, but the promise of spring made its first appearance in the grass, growing greener, and the hint of pink wild flowers near the cliff's edge. Abigail drew in a deep breath, relishing the feel of the wind blowing her hair from her temples. The sunshine above disguised the bitterly cold wind, and Abigail shivered, despite her thick pelisse. You've been quiet this evening, my love, Gavin said. He brought her hand up to kiss the back of it. Simply enjoying the scenery. It's been some time since we've been able to do so, Gavin said. What with how busy you have been attending balls and hosting dinner parties, I hardly recognise the woman you've become. His eyes shone with a teasing light. One, she replied. I have attended one ball, and inviting the Summerfields and Causeys to dine with us hardly constitutes a dinner party. Our list of guests will grow when my brother visits again. That will not be for months yet, Abigail said. They had received a letter from Lionel only weeks before, wherein he expressed his desire to return to Cornwall. However, he and his wife planned to stay instead at a rented manor far enough away from the sea to avoid Gertrude's headaches returning. Abigail had been surprisingly pleased to hear the news of their return. She knew Gavin would enjoy seeing his brother again, and she would not mind their visits in smaller amounts either. Besides, in months when they did finally arrive, Abigail would be far too preoccupied with another matter. She pressed a hand to her stomach with a smile and looked out to the sea. A passing ship sailed nearby, white sails unfurled as it glided across the water. Have you received any word from Lieutenant Harris? she asked. Only that he has settled in with his new captain. I suspect he misses Cornwall, though. I do hope he will return, as he said he would. After his arm had healed, Lieutenant Harris had been reassigned, and Abigail and Gavin had hired another assistant to watch over Goloduin with them. Their new assistant was a hard worker, but Abigail missed the lieutenant's cheerful spirits, and she was sure Gavin did as well. I'm certain he will come back one day. Cornwall has captured him just as it has me. His eyes were warm as he smiled down at her. Well, if he does return, Abigail said, he is more than welcome to stay with us this time, rather than the inn. Though we will need to add another room to our humble home by then. After all, we shall surely have three living under our roof. Three? Gavin questioned. He cocked his head. Yes. You and I and the baby. Gavin turned to face her directly, his eyes narrowing. You mean to say you are with child? She beamed. You're certain? he asked. I am. She could see the delight in his eyes, his shoulders raising as he reached forth to kiss her soundly. With his lips on hers, Abigail's heart soared. How she loved the man. She could not wait to share that happiness, that love with a child of their own. When their kiss ended, she leaned against him with a deep sigh, and Gavin rested his cheek on her brow, wrapping his arms around her. They stood as one on the cliffside, watching the gentle waves glinting beneath the last rays of the departing sun. Nothing could diminish the deep joy they felt, for even Goloduin's glowing beacon was still not as radiant as the love shared between the old lighthouse keeper's niece and the rescued sea captain, who had set aflame the light within her heart. The End This has been Behind the Light of Goloduin, a Cornish romance, book one. Written by Deborah M. Hathaway. Narrated by Vicky Jo Eva. Death Dawn, my friends. This is Deborah Hathaway. 
I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to the audiobook of Behind the Light of Goladuin. If you enjoyed this story, please feel free to like the video, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I've also shared some links below, including how to read more of my books and how to sign up for my newsletter so you never miss an update. Thank you so much again for your support. Do Guinness!